So the very first question comes in our mind is what is Node.js? Node.js is a runtime environment includes everything you need to execute a program within in JavaScript. If this definition seems more complicated, let me put this definition in very simple words. Node.js is a runtime environment for executing JavaScript outside of the browser. Till 2009, JavaScript could only be executed in the browser. The inventor of Node, Randall, introduced a new concept. The concept is very simple. Executing JavaScript programs outside of the browser on any machine. Till the Node was released, JavaScript could only be executed on the browser. Browsers convert the JavaScript code into low-level machine code so the machine can understand it. There are different engines embedded into browser to convert JavaScript code into machine language. For example, Microsoft Edge uses Chakra, Firefox uses SpiderMonkey, and Chrome uses V8 engine. Both your browser and Node run on V8 JavaScript runtime engine. Randall comes with a brilliant idea. He thought it would be great to execute a JavaScript program outside of the browser. So he took Google's V8 engine and embedded it in the C++ program and called that program Node. V8 engine takes your JavaScript code and converts it into faster machine code so you can build easy, fast and scalable network applications. You might ask daily, there are many more tools and frameworks out there to use as backends like SP.NET, Rails, Django and so on. So what's so special about Node? Node.js is an open source cross-platform runtime environment has been written in JavaScript which makes it an exceptional choice for real-time applications. Until Node was released, if you wanted to be a full-stack developer, you had to be a proficient in at least two languages, JavaScript on the front end and something like PHP or Ruby on the back end. With the release of Node.js, you can use what you already know and put it to use on the server. You don't need to learn another language to be a full-stack developer. Another reason to use Node it has a largest ecosystem of the open source libraries. It has more than 3 million open source libraries available to use. Node also can use in prototyping and angel development. Node is used in largest companies like Uber, Netflix, PayPal, eBay, NASA and so on. Node.js uses an event-driven non-blocking model that makes it lightweight, efficient and highly scalable. Perfect for data-intensive real-time applications that run across distributed devices. Next, we're going to look at the Node non-blocking asynchronous behavior. So earlier I mentioned that Node applications are highly scalable. That is because of its asynchronous behavior. So what do I mean by asynchronous? Let's take a look at a very simple example of synchronous blocking architecture. Imagine you and your friend go to the bank. You go to the bank teller 1 and your friend goes to the bank teller 2. Bank teller 1 deals with you and nobody else throughout the entirety of the transaction. The same goes for the bank teller 2 and your friend. This approach works perfectly well as long as you have enough tellers to service the customers. When a bank gets busy and the customers outnumber of tellers, the service starts to slow and the customer have to be wait to be seen. Although Bank don't always worry about this situation too much and seems happy to make you stand in a line. The same isn't true of website. If the website is slow to respond, users are likely to leave and never come back. This setup is like the bank hiring an additional 50 full-time tellers and moving to a bigger building because it gets busy at lunchtime. This is what we call synchronous blocking architecture. Surely there are better way, a way that's a bit more scalable. Here's where the synchronous non-blocking architecture comes in. Returning to the bank teller analogy, there had to be only one teller who deals with all the customers. But rather than taking on and managing all requests end to end, the teller delegates any time consuming tasks to the back office staff and deals with the next request. You and your friend give requests to the same bank teller. But instead of dealing with one of them exclusively before the next, the teller takes the first request and pass it to the best person to deal with it before taking the next request and doing the same thing. So if the Harry wants to withdraw money, he goes to bank teller who is processing the request of John. Teller takes the withdraw request and instead of processing this request, he hands over this request to the cashier. When the teller is told that the requested task is complete, the teller passes the result back to the visitor who made the request. The same process happened with you. 
This approach means that the bank doesn't need several tailors always on hand. This model isn't infinitely scalable of course, but it's more efficient. You can do more with fewer resources. This is what we call asynchronous non-blocking architecture. Next, we'll talk about how Node handles asynchronous request. Now we know the asynchronous behavior of Node. Now let me show you how Node handles request using asynchronous behavior. So let's see how it's work. A Node server is a single threaded and works differently from a multi-threaded server. With a single threaded module, it's important to remember that all of your users use the same central process to keep the flow smooth. You need to make sure that nothing in your code causes a delay blocking another operation. Node adopts an event-driven architecture to handle non-blocking I.O. What happens is that when the time-consuming process is invoked, the application doesn't wait for it to finish. Instead, the process signals when it's finished by emitting an event. This event gets added into a queue or you can say in event loop and when the event is pulled from the event loop and process, the dependent functionality is invoked with any event related data passed to it. Now enough theory, let's dive into a real world examples. So let's start by installing Node. Now installing Node in the system is super easy. You just have to open the browser and head on to nodejs.org and then you need to open the download page of Node.js and here you can find the executable file of Node.js. Throughout this course, I'm using Windows. So I'm going to click on this Windows installer to download the Node version for my Windows system. Once you download the installer, double click on it. You will see the first window, welcome to the Node setup wizard. Just click on the next, then accept the agreement. Click on the next and here you can find the Node on your system. I'm going to leave this as default and then click on next. Here you can find the custom setup. I'm not going to do anything here. I'm going to leave everything as it is. I'm going to just click on this next button here. Here you can find the automatic install necessary tools for the node. I'm going to leave this everything as it is. I'm not going to check this checkbox. I'm going to leave it as it is and click on the next button. Now here you can notice ready to install node. So just click on the install button to install node in your local system. Now, once the node is successfully installed, so just click on this finish button to finish this setup. So now you have the node installed in your local system. Now, once I install my node, let me verify the node is successfully installed or not. So I'm going to open the command prompt and here I'm going to verify my node is successfully installed or not. I'm going to just simply enter a command node hyphen hyphen version. When I press enter, I'm going to have the node version as a result. So I have 12.8.3 version installed in my local system. So your node is now successfully installed in your local system. We are not going to type everything on the command prompt. So next we're going to download and install editor for node application. Once you understand how to install node in your local system, let me show you the editor I'm using throughout this course. I'm using VG Studio Code Editor for writing node script. VG Studio Code Editor is the most popular editor out there in the market. It's free, built on open source, and runs anywhere on any system. VG Studio Code comes with a lot of built-in features. So let me first install this editor in the local system so we can work with Node script. To install VG Studio Code, just head on to code.vgstudio.com and right from here, install VG Studio Code in your local system. I'm going to click on this download for Windows and download and install the VG Studio Code editor in my local system. I already done that, so I'm going to just open the VG Studio Code editor. So when you open the Visual Studio Code first time, you'll get the result something like this. On the left side of the Visual Studio Code editor, you have the Explorer tab and here you can find the current directories of your project. Then you have the search section and right from here you can search for a specific word and replace it. Then you have the Git section to initialize your project with Git and then you have the Debug tab. Then you have the Extension tab where you can install the different extension in your Visual Studio Code editor. So let me first show you which extension I'm using for this editor. I'm going to just click on this, enable extensions and here you can notice I'm using material icon theme for adding icons as a prefix of the file. So when I create a file, I'm going to have these different icons before my file name. Just out of that, I'm going to install one dark pro theme. I'm using this theme for this editor. If you want, you can choose your favorite theme as well. That doesn't matter. This is the most installed and used theme in Visual Studio Code Editor. So I'm going to install this theme and set it as my Visual Studio Code Editor theme. Now, if you want to install different theme, you can search here for themes 
and right from here you can install different themes for your widgets to record editor once you know that how to use the extension tab let's move on to the explorer tab and here let me first open my project folder so i'm going to click on this open folder and select the empty tutorial folder just like this and here you can notice this tutorial folder is now open in the widgets to record editor let me show you my settings i'm using for this widgets to record editor so i'm going to press ctrl p and here you can find the setting i'm using for this widgets to record editor i'm using the theme one dark pro then i'm using the icon theme material icon then i have the editor font size 18 i'm using the rubik font family for this editor the font width is 400 and the zoom level is 1 and for the terminal i'm using git bash shell just after that i'm using the integrated cursor style line and i'm going to specify the font family for the terminal overpass mono i'm going to save this file next we're going to install git in the local system now once i install my widget studio code editor i'm going to just head on to git hyphen scm.com and install the git in my local system git is an open source distributed version control system it used to create different versions of your application you can save a lot of time by using git in this course we're not going to talk about what is git and how to use it because git is out of this course i'm using bash shell as a terminal that is why i'm using git throughout this course if you're comfortable with command prompt then you don't have to do it so i'm going to just click on this download button and download git in my local system once i download it i'm going to just add this setting to set my terminal as a git bash shell i'm going to just say terminal.integrated.shell.windows and then i'm going to specify the path of the bash.exe file i have my git installed in my program files in my c drive so i'm going to specify that path so when i open the terminal of the vhs record editor i'm going to have the git bash as a terminal to open the terminal you just need to head on to the terminal section and click on this new terminal as you can notice i'm going to have the git bash as a terminal if you're not comfortable with bash shell that's completely fine you can use the simple command prompt the commands i'm executing with bash shell can also be executed with a command prompt of windows so don't worry about that next we are going to see how to work with node now in this lecture we're going to talk about what is ripple and how to use it ripple known as read evaluate print loop it is a programming language environment basically a console window that takes a single expression as user input and return a result back to the console after execution. A repo is waiting for us to enter some JavaScript code. Now, let me show you how to open the repo. So, I'm going to just open the Visual Studio Code Editor and here I'm going to click on this terminal navigation menu. So, I'm going to click on this terminal and select new terminal. When I click on it, I'm going to have the git bash as a result. If you're using command prompt, then you will get command prompt as a result. Don't worry, the commands are identical on both terminals. Now, what I want, I want to activate the Ripple environment. To do that, I'm going to just type here a command, node, and press enter. When I press enter, I have a welcome status. Now, you can notice this angle bracket. This indicates your Ripple environment is now active. You can type any JavaScript code inside this repo. Now, as I said earlier, node is not a language. It is a runtime environment. So, while learning node, you don't have to learn anything new. It's all about JavaScript. Let me just print some message to the user. So I'm going to just say here console.log. Down here I'm going to have a function log. So I'm going to just call a function of this log class. So I'm going to say here console.log. Then I'm going to specify parentheses in the double code. I'm going to say node course. And then I'm going to just close this parentheses. Now when I press enter, I'm going to have node course as a result. Now the node ripple is going to execute this function and return this result. I'm going to have this undefined result because this log function don't have return value. Now the cool thing about ripple is that it's interactive. As you write your code, if you press a tab key, the ripple will try to autocomplete what you wrote to match a variable you already defined or a predefined one. For example, if I just type here console.log again, then you can notice ripple try to autocomplete this word so when i press tab the ripple will autocomplete this word and when i press dot l ripple will allow us to automatically complete this function so when i press tab ripple will automatically complete this word so this is the cool thing of ripple now let me just print here document dot get element by id now when you try to execute this statement it's going to return an error message because 
you don't have this document object in node because you're not working on the browser you're working on a system node allows us to execute javascript programs outside of the browser so when you execute your javascript code outside of the browser you can't access the document object you can access the document object only in the browser so you can't use document object in node the same goes for the window object as well so if i just say here window dot prompt or something that is a property or method of window will return an error message because as i said we are not working on the browser instead of window and document you have some different useful objects for example os path numbers and so on we're going to talk about that later in this course now you know that you can't use document and window object then how do you identify which object is available in node or not you can just check out the different node modules on the node documentation or in the repo you can just type of the javascript class so for example let's say i'm going to just call here a class number and press a dot after this class and when i press tab the ripple is going to print all the properties and methods of the number class on the console so you'll get all the information of the class on your ripple now ripple not limit you to only get the properties and methods of the javascript class instead you can get the global variables as well so for example instead of this number down here i'm going to say global and press dot here when i press tab you can notice i'm going to have all the global variables of node as a result so these are the global variable you can get with node in this global variable you can notice i have this global dot console we use this global variable and then we use this property console to print a message on the terminal now sometimes you want to get some help from a ripple environment to do that the ripple has some special commands all starting with dots so let me show you let me first clear this screen i'm going to just simply press ctrl l to clear the screen in this terminal i'm going to just simply get the help from the repo to get the help you just need to type dot help when you press enter here you can find different statement in repo you can activate the editor mode as well if you want to write node script you can use this editor command but ripple is more intelligent than this ripple automatically understand where you want to write a multi-line statement for example if i say here if one is equal to zero and then i'm going to specify here curly braces and now my statement is not actually ended but when i press enter ripple will understand where i want to end the statement so here you can notice we have the multi-line statement using this triple dots ripple understand i want to write a multi-line statement here so ripple will add these three dots before the statement and here in this if statement i'm going to say console dot log and here i'm going to just simply print one is not equal just like this and then press enter you can notice the ripple will add this triple dot here as well and then i'm going to specify here closing curly braces and now when i press enter you can notice the ripple exit us from this multi-line statement ripple is so intelligent and understand where we want to start and end the multi-line statement so as i said earlier you can write any javascript code inside the ripple so let me just first create here a simple variable let a is equal to 10 when i press enter it will just return undefined because we did not return anything here using this statement so it's going to return undefined just ignore it and now let me print this a variable so if i just see here console oops so if i just see here console dot log and then i'm going to specify here a and when i press enter i'm going to have 10 as a result so in the node using ripple you can write any javascript code now let me show you how you can exit from this repo there are different ways you can exit from this repo for example let's say you want to abort the current expression so for example you stuck here after this console.log and you want to exit right from here you can press ctrl c to exit from this expression if you want to exit from this ripple you can press ctrl d or if you want to exit from this ripple you can use this ripple command dot exit let me just execute this command i'm going to say here dot exit when i press enter this will just exit me from the repo this is super easy practice with ripple to understand how you can work with it next we'll talk about how to write our first node script
Writing your first node script is super easy. We know that how to use the tuple environment. But executing JavaScript through tuple environment is time consuming. So let's create our first node script and run it using node command. So let's create a new file in the Visual Studio Code editor and write our first node script. So I'm going to just open the Visual Studio Code editor and I'm going to just click on this Explorer tab. When I click on it, here I'm going to have an option, open folder. I'm going to click on this open folder and then I'm going to select my empty folder and open it in the Visual Studio Code editor. So here I'm going to have the tutorial empty folder open inside this Visual Studio Code editor. I'm going to close this welcome window and here I'm going to create a new file for node script. So I'm going to click on this new file icon and specify name for my file. Here I'm going to say index.js. Now, as I said earlier, Node is not a language. So you don't have to specify a different extension to write a Node script. Node is used to execute JavaScript. So I'm going to say here index.js and create this file. So as you know, Node provide a console module which provide a tons of very useful ways to interact with command line. The most basic and used method in JavaScript is console.log which prints the string you pass to it to the console. So let me just say here console.log and in the parentheses I'm going to say node app. I'm going to just save the changes by pressing ctrl s. I'm going to save this file and now I want to execute this file in the node. So I'm going to just open my terminal. I'm going to click on this terminal. When you open your terminal you can execute this file using node command. So let me just execute this file using node command. So here I'm going to say node and then I'm going to specify the path of this file. So here I'm going to say index.js. As you know, I have this file inside this tutorial folder. So I'm going to just say here index.js. When I press enter, I'm going to have node app as a result. So node is going to execute this JavaScript code inside this terminal. You can execute any JavaScript code using this node command. For example, if I create here a simple JavaScript code, so if I just see here constant A is equal to 5 and constant B is equal to 10. Then if I just see here console.log and print both these variables just like this, then the node is going to print both these variables on the console. But you just need to first save this file and execute this command again. So I'm going to have 5 and 10 as a result. Now if you want, you can format this log message by passing variable and a format specifier. For example, let me just get rid of this statement and in the double quote, I'm going to say a is equal to and then here I'm going to call modulus operator then specify s and then specify here and b is equal to modulus operator and then I'm going to pass s here. So here I'm going to pass the reference of two variables. And then I'm going to pass variables by specifying here a second argument. So here I'm going to say comma and then specify a and b just like this. Save the changes, save this file and execute node index.js command again. When I execute this file, you can notice I'm going to have a result a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 10. Now you can notice when you make any changes inside the node file, you need to execute this command to execute the node script. You know that when working with big project, you waste your lot of time. To solve this problem, I'm going to just install a simple extension to execute this node script. So what I'm going to do is, let me just close this terminal and here I'm going to open the extension tab and here I'm going to search for code runner. So here I'm going to say code runner and I'm going to just install this extension in my Visual Studio Code editor. I'm going to click on it and install this extension in my Visual Studio Code editor. I already installed this extension so I'm not going to do it again. Once you've done that, just open your setting file. So just press Ctrl P and open this setting.json file. Here you can notice I just specify some settings to this code runner extension. So here I'm going to say code runner dot executor map and then I'm going to specify Python and JavaScript command and then here I'm going to specify code runner show executable message false and the code runner clear previous output true. So you just need to add this setting, save all the changes, close this setting file and open the explorer tab. And instead of executing node command, you just need to run this command using code runner. So what you need to do is you just need to select this code and right click on it. And here you can find the code runner option, run code. And the shortcut of executing this node file is alt s. 
maybe you have different shortcut for executing code. You can change it anytime whenever you want. I'm going to just click on this run code. When I click on it, you can notice I'm going to have the output tab and here I'm going to have my result. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just make some changes inside my file. So I'm going to just get rid of this message from this console and here I'm going to just multiply A by B just like this. Let me save the changes and execute my file. You can notice I'm going to have 50 as a result. So using this extension, this is super easy to execute your node script. So I hope you understand how to create and execute your first node script. Next, we'll talk about modules. Module is one of the most important concepts in Node. Node has a built-in module system or you can create your own module as well. Now let me first show you how you can import module in Node. The simple way to import module is by using required function. So to import built-in module in Node application, you can just simply say here constant then I'm going to just specify here OS is equal to and then I'm going to call a required function. So here I'm going to import OS module. So here I'm going to say OS. Now the node is going to import this OS module inside this script. Now if you want to access this OS module, you can use this OS variable. Now if I want to print the type of OS I'm using on my console, I can just simply say here console.log and in the parentheses, I'm going to say OS.type and then I'm going to specify here parentheses just like this and I save the changes and execute this file. I'm going to have my OS as a result. So this type method is going to return the OS from this OS module. Now if you want to get the, the platform you're using, you can just simply say here console.log and using the OS module, you can call the platform method just like this. So when you execute your file, you will get the platform you're using on this system. Now you're not limited to only access the OS built-in module in Node. Now there are many core modules are there in Node. We'll talk about that later in this course. But just for now, let's understand how to create your own module. Now this is the example of accessing the built-in module in Node. Now let me just create my own module. To create my own module, I'm going to just create here a variable. Here I'm going to say constant car and then specify object to it. And in this object, I'm going to first specify brand and specify value to it BMW then specify comma and I'm going to specify here model and for this model I'm going to specify Z4 if I try to print this object using console.log I'm going to have this object as a result now what I want I want to export this object as a module so I can use it in other files modules help us to reuse the code multiple times now what I want, I want to use this object in my other JavaScript files. So what you need to do is, you need to convert this file in a module. To do that, you just need to export this object. I'm going to get rid of this console.log and here I'm going to say module.exports. Keep in mind, you need to specify here exports, not export. It's exports. And then I'm going to specify here my variable car just like this. So I'm going to just specify this object to this module. So this statement is going to return this object so I can access it in my other JavaScript files. So let me just create here a new file and I'm going to name this file magic.js and in this file I'm going to access this object. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just simply back to my magic.js and here I'm going to just say constant car is equal to then call the required function and in the double quote, here I'm going to specify the path of the index.js file. So here I'm going to say dot forward slash index.js. Save the changes. Just out of that, I'm going to say here console.log and then print the car variable. So when you execute this file, it's going to return this object. Any object or variable defined in the file by default is private and not exposed to the outer world. This is what module.export API offered by the module system allows us to do. So you can use this code in other files or in other apps. So to export this object, we use module.export, which is an object provided out of the box by module system. And this will make your file export just that object. Now there is a second way to do the same thing and create a module. Now we use here module.export and return this object. Now if you want, you can create a property of this export and specify this object to that property. For example, if I remove this module right from here and if I say here exports dot car then this is also a valid statement. This statement will also export this object. 
let me just save the changes and execute this file but when i execute this file i'm gonna have the result something like this you can notice in this object i have a car key and to this car key i have this object as you know we created here a property car and then specify the object to that property so when you want to access this object you need to call a car property so here to this car i'm going to call a property car just like this save the changes when i execute this file i'm going to have the result what i want the difference between module.export and export is very simple module.export exposes the object it points to the export exposes the properties of the object it points to you can notice here we use here property to expose this object but when we use module we expose the object directly instead of creating a property of export class so this is how you can use and create your own module in node next we'll see what is npm sometimes the built-in modules are not enough to create a complete node project in that case, you can use NPM. NPM is a Node Package Manager for Node.js. In January 17, over 3.5 million packages were reported being listed in an NPM registry, making it the biggest single language code repository on earth. And you can be sure there is a package for almost anything. NPM allows us to install different packages in the Node module that can save a lot of time and the code. NPM allows us to install different packages from the Node Package Manager. Now there are some built-in packages you will get with Node, but the built-in packages is not enough to create a complete Node project. In that case, you can use NPM to install different packages in your Node application. So let's take a look at how you can install and use NPM in Node. So I'm going to just click on this terminal and select a new terminal. Here in my terminal, I'm going to just verify NPM is successfully installed or not. Here I'm going to say NPM hyphen hyphen version or you can just say hyphen V. When you press enter, you will get the NPM version installed in your local system. NPM is automatically installed when you install node in your local system. Now, once you know that your NPM is successfully installed in your local system, let's create a new package using NPM command. NPM allows you to install packages in your node module. NPM will also help you to initialize your project as NPM package so you can publish it in a public repository. So let me first show you how you can initialize your project as package. So I'm going to just say here npm and then I'm going to specify in it. Now I want to initialize this project as npm package. So I'm going to just specify command npm in it and press enter. When you press enter, you will have the result something like this. So as you can notice, the default package name is tutorial. If you want, you can specify new package name as well. For example, if I say here node app, then this is also a valid node package. The node package name should be in a lowercase and not have space between two words. Just so that, once I initialize my package, I'm going to just press enter. When I press enter, it will just ask me to specify my version. I'm going to leave the version as it is and press enter. So it will take the default value. And just so that, node will ask me to specify description for this package. So here I'm going to simply say node course package. So this is the description of this package and then I'm going to press enter. Node will ask you the entry point of this package. I'm going to leave it as it is and press enter. NPM asks me to specify test command. I will leave this command as it is. Press enter. Git repository. Press enter and leave this as it is. And specify keyword for this package so it can easily find on node repository. I'm going to leave this keyword as it is and press enter. I'm going to specify author name, daily tuition and press enter. Just after that, I will leave the license as it is. Press enter. And here you can notice the npm will create a file package.json and in this file you have the code something like this we'll talk about all this code in detail later in this course but just for now just press enter npm will create a new file in your project you can notice here in your project directory you will have package.json file just open it in this file you have some code you have the package name version description and so on so this file is going to initialize this project as npm repository. So now using this file, you can publish your package as public repository. Now, let me just open my terminal and clear this screen. I'm going to just press control L. Now, what if you don't want to answer any of these questions? You can use a similar command for that. You can use the npm init with hyphen y command. 
For example, you want to create a default package.json file. In that case, you just need to say npm init hyphen y. When you execute this command, the npm will create package.json file with a default values. So let me first delete this file and create a new file using this command. So here I'm going to just press enter. When I press enter, you can notice you have the default values to this file. You can notice here. So this command will create a default package.json file and initialize your project as npm package. Next, we'll talk about how to install a new package in the node application. Now, once we know that how to initialize your project as an npm package, let me just install a package from the public repository. So to do that, I'm going to just use a simple npm command and install a new package in this project so we can use it in the node application. To install a new package in your node application, you need to open the terminal and here you need to execute a command called npm install or you can just specify here i to install a new package. So I'm going to say here npm install and then I'm going to specify the package name I want to install in this node application. There are thousands of public packages available in node repository. I'm going to just choose a simple one. I want to install low dash package. So I'm going to say here low dash. Now I want to install this package in my node application. So I'm going to specify here low dash. Now with this command, you can pass two flags. The first one is the save and the second one is the save hyphen dev. I will explain the difference between both these commands after a few seconds. But just for now, just specify here save and press enter. When I press enter, node will install a new package in your project. So here you can notice in your project directory, you have a new folder called node modules. NPM will create a new folder and store all the public repository in the node modules folder. When you open these node modules, you have different packages. Let me just minimize it. When you install this package, you can also see here you have package log.json file. We'll talk about that later in this course. But just for now, just open the package.json and you can notice here you have a dependency lodash. When you specify this hyphen save, the npm is going to store this lodash package as a dependency of this project. So what do I mean by dependency package? Dependency package means this project is depends on this package. So using this save flag, we inform node to use this package as a dependency. Dependency are the module which required at runtime. Now let me just install another module with a different save flag. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say here npm install. So here I'm going to say i uuid. The uuid library let us create a various kind of unique ids. And just out of this package name, here I'm going to specify hyphen hyphen save dev. You can notice this is the different command we used earlier. I'm going to just press enter to install this UUID package in this node application. I'm going to press enter and as you can notice, this package is now installed in my node modules folder. Now once this package is installed, you have here an entry in the dev dependency section. Now what is the difference between these both flags? Let me explain the difference between both these flags. Now when I install this package using this hyphen hyphen dev, it actually install in the dev dependencies. The dev dependencies are the modules which are only required during development. And on the other hand, dependency packages are required at runtime. These are the two important differences between both these flags. So when you install package, you have two options, hyphen save and hyphen hyphen dev. So whenever you want to use the package at runtime, use hyphen save flag. And when you want the package that is only required during development, use hyphen hyphen save hyphen dev. Now there is another way to install package using npm. Now for example, now what happen if you forget to specify this flag while installing node package? Let me show you what happen if you do that. Let me just clear the screen and here I'm going to install another package in node module. So here I'm going to say npm i for install and then I'm going to specify the package name. So here I'm going to say web pack. So I'm going to specify the package name and then I'm going to press enter. I'm not going to specify any flag here with this install command. I'm going to press enter and let me show you what happens if I enter and install this package. Now once this package is successfully installed in your node module, you can notice when you refresh your package.json file, you will have this web pack in dependency section. 
So by default, when you use npm to install any package, it will use the default save flag. Next, we'll talk about how to execute your node script using npm command. Now we know that how to execute the JavaScript code using node command. We just open the terminal and just say node and specify index.js. Now this command is going to execute the JavaScript code which we have in this index.js. But what if this file is not in this tutorial folder? We have this file somewhere else. In that case, you need to specify the absolute path of this file in the node command. And at the same time, what if you want to specify the watch flag with this node command? For example, if I see here watch, then you can notice this is a big command. Whenever you open a new terminal, you need to write this command to execute your JavaScript code. To solve this problem, we have npm script. I'm going to get rid of this statement right from here and close this terminal. And I'm going to just open my package.json file. And in this file, you can notice we have this script section. In this script section, you can specify what command you want to execute using terminal. By default, when you create a package.json file, you will get the test command with it. I'm going to create a new command. So here I'm going to specify comma. So in the double code, I'm going to say execute and then specify colon here. And in the double code, I want to specify which command I want to execute in the terminal. So here I want to execute node and execute the index.js. I want to execute the index.js file using node command. So I'm going to just specify that in this double code, save this file and in the index.js. Here I'm going to just specify console.log and just specify npm scripts. Save the changes, open the terminal. Instead of executing node index.js command, here I'm going to say npm run and then specify my command which I want to execute in the terminal. I want to execute this execute command. So here I'm going to say execute. When I press enter, you can notice I'm going to have the result npm script. So the npm run command it allows us to execute command line task. You're not limited to only create one command inside this script. You can create multiple commands as well. So for example, if I want to create another command, I'm going to specify here comma and then specify my second command here. I'm going to specify name for this command, watch, and then specify command here inside this double code. Here I'm going to say node index.js. When we work on big node project, we have different commands inside this script. I'm going to save this file. I want to execute this watch command. So here I'm going to say npm run watch. When I press enter, this command is going to execute this file. You can use the built-in commands as well. I'm going to just specify here comma and create a new command here. So here I'm going to specify double code and here you can notice you have different commands. I'm going to choose this start command and just click on it. If you want to execute this command, you just need to type npm start. I'm going to use this start command so I'm going to select it. And here in this double code, I'm going to say node index.js. Now, if I want to execute this command, I just need to specify here npm start. That's it. When I press enter, oops, I think I forgot to save the changes. Save this file. Let me just execute npm start. When I press enter, you can notice I'm going to have the result what I want. So, this is how you can execute different commands in node. Next, we'll take a look at the type of npm packages. Now, when you install package using npm command, there are two types of packages you can find in node. Local packages and global packages. By default, when you type npm install, this command is going to use the local package. We use npm install lodash to install this package in the node project. This package is installed in the node modules folder. The package is installed in the current file tree under the node modules folder. As this happens, npm also add a low dash entry in dependencies property. You can notice here in the package.json you have this entry of the low dash package. So you can find this package in this dependency section. A global installation is performed using hyphen g flag. If you want to install a package globally, you can use hyphen g flag with the package name. Let's say you want to install this package globally. You don't want to install this package only for this project, which you can use everywhere in every application. You can use the hyphen G flag for that. So here I'm going to just specify hyphen G just like this. When you use this flag, this package is going to install in your system globally. 
which you can use everywhere in every node application. When this happens, npm won't install the package under the local folder, but instead it will use the global location. The npm root-g command will tell you where that exact location is on your machine. When I press enter, you can find the location of this package installed in your machine. Now, once you understand how to install package locally and globally, let me show you how to uninstall it. So, to uninstall this package, I'm going to use npm uninstall and then specify the package name which I want to uninstall from this project. I'm going to say here low dash. Let me first open the package.json and now let me execute this command. When I press enter, you can notice this package is now uninstalled from my project. You can notice in my dependency section, I don't have this package. The package entry is now removed from this dependency section as well. Next, we'll talk about what is npx. So, what is npx? npx is not a typing mistake. npx is a tool that is used to execute packages. npx package runner tool comes with npm. So, you don't have to install this npx manually. To understand npx, let's take a look at a very simple example. So, I'm going to just open my terminal and here I'm going to install a package. So, as you know, to install package, I'm going to say npm install low dash. As you know, we already uninstalled this package in the previous lecture. So, I'm going to just install it in my node modules folder. So, I'm going to press enter. So, as you know, to use this package, we need to add required statement in this index.js. So, for example, if I want to use this package, I need to add here a constant statement and then specify the required function and specify the package name. So, using this statement, I can use this package. Now, suppose if your package is executable. In this case, node will put the executable file under node modules bean folder. If you just open the node modules, then you can find here you have bean folder. And in this bean, you have some executable files. Node will use this file with npx command. I'm going to just minimize these node modules and I'm going to just install another package. So, I'm going to clear the screen and here I'm going to say npm install and I'm going to install a package cow c. I'm going to press enter and install this package in my node modules folder. Now, this cow package provides a command line program that can be executed to make a cow say something and the other animals as well. When you install this package using npm install, it will install itself and a few dependencies in the node modules folder. You can notice if you open the node modules folder, you have some folders. These are the dependencies. So, this package is depends on these different dependencies. In this node modules, I'm going to have this dot bean folder. And in this folder, we have the executable files. So, when you open this bean folder, which contains the symbolic links to the cow say binaries. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use this symbolic links and execute this cow say library using npx command. Let me show you how to do it. Let's minimize these node modules, clear the screen, and here I'm going to execute a command npx cow say. Here I'm going to say cow say node.js is cool. When I press enter, I'm going to have a text cow say node.js is cool, and I'm going to have the cow on my console. So using npx command, I'm going to execute this cow say module and pass argument to it. If the package is executable, then you can execute it using npx command. npx included in the recent version of npm since 5.2. So, you don't have to worry about installing npx manually. Next, we'll talk about package.json. Now, let's take a look at the different properties of package.json file and how we can use it in node application. So, in this lecture, we'll take a look at a detailed information of package.json file. So, I'm going to just open the package.json and here I'm going to have the different properties. I'm going to explain each and every property of this package.json file. And we're also going to talk about some additional properties you will get with package.json file. So, what is the use of package.json file? The package.json file is a kind of manifest for your project. It can do a lot of things. It is a central repository of configuration for tools. If you are building a Node.js package that you want to distribute over npm, then you must have to set properties that will help other people to use it. So, first we have the name property. Using name property, we specify the package name. The name must be less than 214 characters and the name must not have spaces. It can 
only contain lowercase letters. You can notice this is not the valid name for the package. You have to just specify lowercase letters. This is because when a package is published on NPM, it gets its own URL based on their properties. That is why we need to follow these instructions. Then we have the version. This indicates the current version of package. The version is always expressed with three numbers. The first number is the major number, the second is the minor version and the third is the patch. Just out of that we have the description. This property contains a brief description of the package. This is especially useful if you decided to publish your package to NPM so that people can find out what the package is all about. Then we have a main property. The main is the entry point of your package. When you import this package in an application, that is where the application will search for the module exports. Then we have script. Script define a set of no script. You can run this script on the terminal using npm run command. You can use any name you want for these commands and script can do literally anything you want. Just out of that you have a property keyword. Here is where you specify some keyword to your package so that your package can be easily find. Just out of that we have author. In this author property you can specify the author name, email and URL. Just out of that we have the license of this package. Then we have the dependencies and the dev dependencies. As you know, dependencies set a list of npm packages installed as dependencies. The install packages is automatically listed in this dependency section. Just out of that we have dev dependencies. The dev dependencies is a list of npm packages installed as development dependencies. In this project we just installed the UUID as development dependencies. Development dependencies are different from dependencies because they are meant to be installed only on the development machine, not need to run the code in the production. Just out of that, we have engines. The engine property is going to set which version of Node.js and other commands this package works on. Just out of that, we have a browser list. We use browser list property to tell which browser you want to support. This configuration means you want to support the last two major versions of all the browsers with at least 1% of users. Then in the package.json file, we have the contributors property. This property tells the package have one or more contributors. This property is an array that is a list of them. We can have multiple contributors to the package. Just for that, we have bugs. Using this property, we can specify the package bugs so the user can find it on the GitHub page. Just for that, we have home page. The home page property is going to set the package home page. Just for that, we have a property called repository. This property is going to specify where this package repository is located. So if your package is located on Git, you can specify that using this property. And at the end, you have the very important property of the package.json file, which is private. By default, this property set to true. This property prevents the package to be accidentally published on NPM. If you want to publish your package on npm, you have to just specify here false. So I hope you understand the different properties of package.json file. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the package versions. Now once we know that the different properties of package.json file, in this lecture we're going to talk about the package versions. In the package.json file, you might have seen the package versions operators. It's quite difficult to understand what is the meaning of this and which other version specifier can you use. These symbols specifies which updates your package accept from that dependency using same word or you can say using semantic versioning. As you know, all versions have three digits. The first being the major release, the second is the minor release and the third is the patch release. So here in this package, one is the major release, four is the minor release and zero is the patch release. Node set some rules for package versioning. So let's talk about some rules of package versions. So let's talk about them. Let's start with its engine section. Here we use the greater than operator with equal to sign and then specify the package version. The meaning of this rule is you accept all version equal to or higher than the one you specified. So it means it accept all the versions of 6.0.0 .0 .0 or higher than that. The opposite of this rule is less than. The less than operator accept any version equal to or lower the one you specify. So it means this package is going to accept the version you specify or 
the lower version than this. Just after that, we have just a less than operator. This accept any version lower than when you specify. So this package is only going to accept the version less than 6.0.0. And if you specify here greater than, it's going to accept the version greater than 6.0.0. Just after that, we have this Azure operator. You can notice here to this UUID, to this webpack, to this low dash, and to this cow says we have this Azure operator or you can say a caret operator. So it means this Kausi library is going to accept the version 1.5 or 1.5.1. The meaning of this caret operator is to update patch and the minor release, not the major one. Just out that, we have tilde operator. If you write tilde operator before your package name, it means you only want to update this batch release. So here in this Kausi library, you want to update it to 1.4.2. This will not update the major or the minor release. It will update only the patch release. So using these symbols, you specify which updates your package accept from the dependency. If there is no symbol as the prefix to the version, node will accept that specific version. So this statement will only accept this specific version. I know the symbols are quite confusing, but with practice, it will easy to understand. Next, we'll talk about how to uninstall the packages from the dev dependencies. Sometimes you need to uninstall the package from the node application because it's not in use. Sometimes you install package accidentally or if the package is not in use, you can uninstall them from the node modules folder or you can say from the node application. So let's take a look at how to uninstall module from the node modules folder. So I'm going to first open my terminal and here I'm going to install bootstrap module. So to install modules, as you know, I'm going to start with npm install and then I'm going to specify bootstrap. Now, this is the simple way to install bootstrap. Now, what if you want to install a specific version? For example, if you want to install a specific version of bootstrap, you can specify here at the red sign and the versions. So here I'm going to specify 4.5.1. So as you know, this is the major release. This is the minor and this is the patch. Now I want to install this bootstrap package in this node module folder. So I'm going to press enter. Now what I want, I want to uninstall this bootstrap because I decided to make my website only using standard CSS. I don't want to use any bootstrap code inside my website. So in that case, I can uninstall this bootstrap from my node modules folder. If I open my package.json file, you can notice the bootstrap is now installed in the dependency section. I want to uninstall this package from this node module folder. I'm going to open my terminal and here to uninstall this package, I'm going to say npm uninstall and then specify the package name. So here, as you know, I want to uninstall this bootstrap. So I'm going to say here bootstrap. When I press enter, this will uninstall this bootstrap package from this node modules folder. If you want, you can specify version as well, but I'm going to leave this as it is and press enter. So this command is going to uninstall the bootstrap package from your node application. Now, what if your package is in the dev dependency section? Here you can notice I have this UUID in the dev dependency section. I want to remove this package from this dev dependency as well as from this node modules folder. To do that, I'm going to just simply say here npm uninstall and then here I'm going to specify the flag which I used to install this package. You can simply say here hyphen hyphen save dev and then specify the package name UUID. Now, what if you want to use a simple flag instead of this save dev instead of this save dev i'm going to just simply say here hyphen d now this hyphen d is going to remove this package from this dev dependency section and then i'm going to specify uuid so this hyphen d flag is going to remove this package from this dev dependency section and if you want to remove this low dash from this dependency you can simply specify here hyphen s make sure the character is capital you need to specify here capital D and capital S. Now I want to uninstall this low dash. So here I'm going to say hyphen S low dash. So now this low dash package is going to uninstall from my node modules folder as well as npm will remove this low dash package entry from this package.json file. So when I press enter, this will remove this package from this dev dependency section. You can notice here. And if you want to remove the UUID from this dev dependency, you can simply say here npm uninstall hyphen d and then specify the package name uuid when you press enter 
the UUID package will uninstall from this dev dependency section. Now you are not limited to only use this hyphen D and hyphen S flag with uninstalling package. You can use it to install packages as well. For example, if you want to install a SAS package, you can simply see here npm install hyphen S to install this package as a dependency and here I am going to say SAS. When I press enter, this package is going to install in the dependency section. And if you want to install a package in this dev dependency section, you can simply use here npm install hyphen d and then specify the package name so here i'm going to say low dash when i press enter this package is going to install in this dev dependency section you can notice here now suppose you want to uninstall a package from global location you can use hyphen g fly and here what i'm going to do is i want to uninstall this low dash package from my global location so here i'm going to say npm uninstall then specify hyphen g and then i'm going to say a package name so here i'm going to say low dash when i press enter this will uninstall this package from the global section so this is how you can easily work with npm in node next we're going to talk about event loop the event loop is one of the most important aspect to understand about node.js so why is this so important because it explains how Node.js can be asynchronous and have non-blocking I.O. The Node.js JavaScript code runs on a single thread or you can say on a single process. There is just a one thing happening at a time. The most browsers, there is an event loop for every browser tab to make every process isolated and avoid a web page with infinite loops or heavy processing to block your entire browser. So let's take a look at a very simple example to understand how event loop work in Node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just simply create here a constant variable and specify arrow function to it. And in this arrow function, I'm going to specify console.log and print bar. Arrow function were introduced with ES6 as a new syntax for writing JavaScript functions. This is just a simple function and I'm going to just specify this function to this bar variable. Just out of that, I'm going to create another arrow function and specify a different name to it. Here I'm going to specify bars and I'm going to specify console.log with the message bars. Just out of that, I'm going to create another arrow function and specify foo variable to it. And then I'm going to create a body of this arrow function. And inside this arrow function, I'm going to first call a console.log and then specify foo message. Just out of that, I'm going to call this bar function. Just out of this console.log right here. And then I'm going to call my simple bars function, this one. Just out of this bar function right here. And then I'm going to simply call this foo function. So here I'm going to say foo and then specify parenthesis. Now you can notice this is just a simple JavaScript code. We created a simple arrow function and specify console with a message. And then here I'm going to just call a console.log and call both these functions. At the last, I'm going to just call this foo function. Let me just save the changes and execute this file. When I execute this file, you can notice I have the result something like this. This will just return foo, bar and bars. When you run this code, first foo function is called. Inside foo, we have this console.log. So the node will execute this console.log, then call this bar function. And then inside this bar, we have this console.log and print this bar on the console. Just after that, we have this bars. So this will just call this function bars and print this console.log on the console. So you will have the result something like this. You can notice all these functions execute one by one from top to bottom. When you call foo, it will just call this foo function, then print this message and call both these functions one by one. So this is what we call a call stack. The call stack will take the function and execute it. So when you execute this file, a call stack will put these functions in a row or you can say in a queue and then execute it one by one. The event loop continuously check the call stack to see if there is any function that needs to run. While doing so, it adds any function call it finds to the call stack and execute each one in order. The call stack iteration start from the calling foo. So this will first call the foo, call this bar function, then the call stack will execute this bars and we're going to have the message something like this. This process is happen until the call stack is empty. But sometimes node programs are not that simple. A node program would have a function that would delay the execution process. This example looks normal. There is nothing special about it. Here, the JavaScript just find things 
and execute it. Run them in order. But what if I add a function that execute after one second or more? Let's see what happens if I do that. So what I'm going to do is instead of this bar, I'm going to just call here set timeout function. So here I'm going to say set timeout. And as a first argument, I'm going to pass this bar function and then pass a millisecond 1000. So this will execute this bar function after one second. So let's see what happened if I execute this program. Let me just save the changes and execute this program. When I execute this program, you can notice I'm going to have foo as a result, then I'm going to have bars as a result, and at the end, we have this bar. So the call stack is going to execute this bar function at the end of this application. When the program is run, the foo is called. Inside foo, we have this message, and then we have this set timeout function. To this set timeout function, we pass bar as an argument and we instruct it to run bar passing 1000 as a timer. So it will execute after one second. So let me show you how call stack execute this program. The call stack will first execute this foo function. Inside foo, it will execute this set timeout function. And as you know, this set timeout function have a timer. So it will execute after one second. Just after that, the call stack will move to the next function and execute it. And at the end, the call stack will execute the function that is causing delay. So when the set timeout function is called, a Node.js start a timer. Once the timer expires, in this case 1000 as a timeout means one second, the callback function is put in the message queue. Here you can notice we have the callback function bar. So the call stack will put this function in the message queue. When the process of this function is finished, the call stack will pull this function from the message queue and execute it. So you can notice here, we have the bar at the end of the program. Now, if you deploy your app, you don't want to create a function that delays the execution. This may add error in your code, like undefined object or undefined function. I know you don't want to add any error because of the function delay. To save this problem, nodes provide promises. Promises is a way to execute a result of an sync function as soon as possible, rather than being put at the end of the call stack. So every time, if the function makes delay, it execute at the end of the program. To solve this problem, we have promises. We'll talk about all about promises later in this course. Next, we'll talk about what is callbacks. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what is callback. In the previous lecture, we understand what is event loop. In the event loop, we understand any function that making delay in the execution will execute at the end of the application. Now to solve this problem, we have promises and we also have callbacks. Promises and callbacks allow us to solve this problem and make the code asynchronous. A callback is a function that is passed into another function as an argument to be executed later. Callbacks are so common in JavaScript that you probably used callbacks yourself without knowing they are called callbacks. If you try to execute a long running operation within a single threaded event loop, the process is blocked. This is technically bad because the process stops processing other events while waiting for your operation to complete. Callbacks are used in two different ways, in synchronous functions and asynchronous function. So let's take a look at how synchronous function work using callback. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply create here a function and I'm going to pass a console message inside this function. So here I'm going to create a function get message and then print get message on the console. Just out of that, I'm going to create another function down here and then specify name to it and then print display message text on the console using console.log. At the end, I'm going to call get message as well as I'm going to call display message. Now, as you know, when I save the changes and execute this file, I'm going to have the result something like this. So as you know, the call stack will first execute this get message function and then execute this display message function. The get message function executed at first and then display message is executed. Both display message in the output and both of them executed immediately. In certain situations, some code is not executed immediately. For example, if we assume that this get message function perform an API call where we have to send a request to the server and wait for the response. In that case, this function makes delay and the call stack will execute this function at the end of the application. Now, let me show you a very simple example. I'm going to just get rid of this console.log right from here. And instead of this console.log, I'm going to just simply say here, set timeout. And in this set timeout, I'm going to specify arrow function. 
just like this and specify console.log here and I'm going to just specify timer to this set timeout function so here I'm going to specify 1000 so this message will display after one second I'm going to save the changes and execute this file again when I execute this file you can notice I'm going to have a display message on the top so this function is making delay in the execution so the JavaScript will put this function at the end of the call stack now in the same situation what I want I want to execute this get message function at the beginning instead of executing this display message I want to execute this get message so what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply use asynchronous JavaScript so what I want I want to execute this function before this display message in that case I can use callback now let's take a look at how to create the asynchronous code using callback in the set timeout function we use here callback as I said earlier callbacks is a function that pass into another function as an argument so you can notice here set timeout is a function and as an argument we pass a callback function so let's take a look at how to write this program in synchronous JavaScript so now suppose you want to execute this display message function after this get message function you want to execute this display message function in the call stack at the end in that case you can use asynchronous functions using callbacks so let me show you how you can do it so what I'm going to do is in this function in this get message function I'm going to simply pass two parameters first is the message and second is the callback you can name this parameter anything that doesn't matter now just for that in this console.log I'm going to simply put here message so I'm going to pass this parameter to this console.log so when I call this function I can pass value using this parameter just out of this console.log down here I'm going to call this callback and I'm going to just specify parentheses just after this callback variable so I'm going to just pass here function to the second argument to this get message function so when you call this get message you need to first specify a message and then call another function as an argument to this get message to the arg so when you specify function as an argument to this get message I'm going to just call it using this statement now just for that what you need to do is you just need to get rid of this display message right from here and to this get message I'm going to pass some argument as you know we have this message as a first argument so here I'm going to say in the double code I'm going to say get message you are free to specify any text here that doesn't matter and just for that I'm going to pass my second argument as you know we have a function as a second argument so this is what we call a callback function so here I'm going to simply pass this function display message if you want you can create a function here as well now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this function to this second argument so I'm going to copy this function and pass it here just like this save the changes and now let me execute this file when I execute this file you can notice I'm going to have get message as a first result and then I'm going to have display message so the callback function is going to return the result what I want now let me explain this code line by line I'm going to just simply create a function get message and pass two parameters here first is the string parameter and second is the callback function just for that here I'm going to just add set timeout function to add some delay for executing this function and then I'm going to just call a console.log message and then call this callback function so when you call this get message function I'm going to first pass get message so this string is going to pass to this parameter and execute this console.log with this string just for that here I have the callback as a second argument and just for this console.log I'm going to call this callback function so after one second I'm going to have the result what I want using this statement now suppose you don't want to specify the function reference as a second argument to this get message function in that case you can create the arrow function as well for example here I'm going to create an arrow function so I'm going to get rid of argument and here I'm going to say parentheses and specify arrow and here I'm going to say console.log and print display msg save the changes and execute this file when I execute this file I'm going to have the result what I want so this function is going to execute the get message first and then execute this display message so this function is called a callback function because we pass this function as an argument to the function so I hope you understand how to work with callback 
in node next we'll talk about promises in the previous lecture we understand how to create a callback and make a code asynchronous the another way to create asynchronous code in javascript is using promises promises are one way to deal with asynchronous code without getting stuck promises have been part of language for years promises are introduced in ecmascript 15 and have recently become more integrated with sync and await function in ecmascript 17 so let me first explain what is promises promises is a way to execute the result of an asynchronous function as soon as possible rather than being put at the end of the call stack promises is the class so we need to create an instance of the class and then initialize it with a function and then specify function as a first parameter let me show you how to create a simple promise in javascript so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say here let then specify a variable name here i'm going to say promise is equal to and then i'm going to create a new instance of the promise so here i'm going to say new promise just like this so this will create an instance of the promise class and as you can see we have the executor as a first argument to this class so here i'm going to specify function and then here to this function i'm going to specify two argument here i'm going to say resolve and reject the promises have two states resolve and reject using resolve and reject we can communicate back to the caller what the resulting promise state was and what to do with it so just out of this parameter, I'm going to pass body of this function and inside it, I'm going to call set timeout function. And in this function, I'm going to simply call a callback function. And here I'm going to say resolve. And in the parenthesis, I'm going to say run before. And just after that, I'm going to specify timer 1000. It means I want to execute this promise after one second. Just out of that, specify semicolon and down here, I'm going to call a method then of promises. So here I'm going to say promises dot then. And here in this method, I'm going to say result and then specify arrow function. And here I'm going to specify body of this arrow function and then specify console dot log and then specify result just like this. And just out of that, down here, just after this curly braces, I'm going to pass a second argument to this then method. So here I'm going to say error and then specify arrow function to it. And here I'm going to say console.log and print error. Now this is how you can simply create a promise in JavaScript. Now let me explain all these lines one by one. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a simple variable promise and then specify an instance of the promise class. The promise class have a constructor as a function. So we're going to pass here function as an argument. The function have two arguments, resolve and reject. Using this resolve, you can return the successful result. And using reject, you can return the error message or you can say the error result. So you can notice here, we use here resolve. So I'm going to call here set timeout and return this result run before after one second. I'm going to use this resolve as a function and return a result. This function is going to return a result once the process is finished. So when this set timeout function finish this process, the resolve is going to return this result to this then method. And in this then method, we have two argument. First is the result and second is the error. Using result, you can get the resolve messages or you can say the result data. And using reject, you can get the error messages or you can say the error data. If I return here reject, then it's going to execute this error function instead of this result. And when we call here resolve, it's going to execute this first argument of this then method. The promises is going to execute the first argument when the promise return resolve. And if the promise return reject, this then function is going to execute this second argument. Now let me execute this file and show you the result. I'm going to save the changes and execute this file. When I execute this file, after one second, I'm going to have a result run before. So the promise is going to return this run before to this result variable. And I'm going to just print that run before text on the console. Now, what if I return this reject? 
let me show you what happens if I return the reject. The second argument of the then function is the function that runs when the promise is rejected and receive an error message. Using then, you can execute a function in a synchronous way. You can specify which function to be executed after using then function. Here I'm going to say reject and in the parenthesis right here, I'm going to say here new and return the error message. So here I'm going to say error and in the parenthesis I'm going to say whoops. Now when I execute this file, you can notice the promises is going to execute this second argument of this then function because we return reject from the promises. Now let me show you what is the benefit of using promises. So for example, let's say you have here a function and the name of the function is get after and in this function you have a console message console.log and in the console.log you have a text print after right let me just call this function down here just like this and don't forget to return resolve using promises so what i'm going to do is here i'm going to just say resolve get rid of this error message and here i'm going to say run before save the changes and execute this file when i execute this file as you can notice i'm going to have this print after console message before this result so how can i execute this function after this run before text to do that you just need to execute this function after this console message so when the promise return resolve result i want to execute this result as well as this message print after so instead of specifying this get after right here i'm going to just specify that just out of this result right here save the changes and execute this file again now as you can notice after one second i'm going to have both the result so the promises is going to make this code asynchronous so what is happening here when you execute this program the new promises instance is created so once this promise is initialized with this resolve and when then function execute this first argument it's going to print this console message run before and call this function get after this one and print this message print after so this is how you can create a simple asynchronous code in javascript there are many other things as well you can do with promises we'll talk about that later this is very simple example of promises next we'll talk about async and await functions We know that how to work with callbacks and promises. We use callbacks and promises for creating asynchronous code. In ECMAScript 17, asynchronous JavaScript is even simpler with async and await function. Async functions are a combination of promises and generators. And basically, they are a higher level abstraction over promises. They hide all the unnecessary code of promises. Async and await build on promises. But why do we need async and await when we have promises? When promises were introduced in ECMAScript 15, they were meant to solve a problem with asynchronous code. And they did. But after two years, a new ECMAScript 17 released and there it was clear that promises could not be the final solution. Promises were introduced to solve the famous callback hail problems. But they introduced complexity on their own. This is why the async functions were introduced. They make the code look like it's synchronous, but it's asynchronous and non-blocking behind the scene. So let's take a look at a very simple example to understand how async and await function work in Node. So let me show you a very simple example of async and await. I'm going to create here a function and specify name to it clone. And in this function, I'm going to simply return a new promise. As I said earlier, async and await built on promises. So I'm going to just return an instance of the promise. And as you know, this promise takes a function with two state, resolve and reject. So I'm going to just create here a function, resolve and reject. If you want, you can create arrow function here as well. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to get rid of this function and just return resolve. Because I want to return the successful result, I'm going to just create an argument resolve and using arrow function I'm going to return it like this. So just for that here I'm going to say set timeout 
and to the set timeout i'm going to simply pass here a callback function and to this callback function i'm going to say resolve and return a simple icon so i'm going to simply copy icon and print here so when we have the successful result promise is going to return the resolve result just for that i'm going to specify here timer to this set timeout so down here i'm going to specify 2000 to make this function delay by two seconds and just for that down here i'm going to create a function and specify name msg and inside this function i'm going to create a constant variable msg is equal to and call a function name clown this one i'm going to call this function and just for that down here i'm going to say console.log and in the double code i'm going to say message specify colon and then specify here msg just like this and at the end i'm going to call this msg function let me just save the changes and execute this program when i execute this program you can notice i'm going to have a message with promise and you can notice a status here pending because this function is executed before two seconds now what i want i want to execute this function after two seconds so i can get this result in this console.log this function is executed immediately when we execute this program that is why i'm going to get pending result in this output what you need to do is you need to make this function asynchronous to make this function asynchronous you just need to add here async keyword just like this and inside this async function you need to add await keyword down here i'm going to just call await and save the result that's it when i save the changes and execute the file i'm going to have the result what i want after two seconds i'm going to have my message so you can notice here it's super easy to make this function asynchronous i know for you both these keywords are new so let me explain how these keywords work so what this async does is it's going to make this function asynchronous and this await is going to make this function wait for two seconds when you specify async before the function this statement will not execute immediately this function will wait for the promises to return something the await is a new operator used to wait for a promise to resolve or reject it can only be used inside an async functions you can notice here we use await inside this async so when we have resolve or reject a response from these promises await operator will inform to this async and execute this function so both these operators or you can say functions communicate with each other and execute your asynchronous code so this is more important to understand how this async and await work in real world examples so when the promises return resolve or reject await is going to inform to the async that we get the data what we want now let's execute this function so once we have the data the async is going to execute this msg function after two seconds now suppose you want to execute another message after this result so for example if i just create here a function and specify here name to it get result and in the body of this function i'm going to just specify console.log and specify execute after now what i want i want to just print this execute after text after this message but first let me just execute this get result function so down here i'm going to specify get result and specify parenthesis save the changes and execute this file when i execute this file as you can notice i have this execute after text before this message i don't have the result what i want i want to get this message before this execute after so how do i do it the simple way to do is just specify here a callback function so here i'm going to specify callback and just after this console.log here i'm going to specify callback and specify parenthesis and when i call this msg i'm going to just pass this function just like this so i'm going to pass this function as an argument to this msg function let me just get rid of this function call save the changes and execute this file and execute this file you can notice i'm going to have the result what i want so this is how we can work with async and await in node next we'll talk about how to create the http server using node 
Now let's take a look at how to create the HTTP server in Node. As you know, Node is a runtime environment for executing JavaScript outside of the browser. So when you want to communicate with the browser, you need to work with HTTP server. When you view a web page in your browser, you are making a request to another computer on the internet, which then provides you a web page as a response. That computer you are talking to using the internet is a web server. A web server receives HTTP request from the client like your browser and provide an HTTP response like an HTTP page or JSON data from API. So let's take a look at how to create a basic HTTP server in Node. So what you need to do is you need to first import a module called HTTP. So here I'm going to say constant HTTP is equal to and as you know to import module you need to say require and in the parenthesis I'm going to say HTTP. In Node you don't have to install HTTP module using npm because HTTP is an inbuilt module in Node. Here I'm going to specify the host name and the port where the HTTP server is going to run. So here I'm going to create a constant variable and name that variable host name. And I'm going to just specify host name in the single code. And here I'm going to say 127.0.0.1. So I'm going to specify here host address. And then I'm going to specify constant port 3000. So on 3000 port, I'm going to run this HTTP server. Now just out of that, I'm going to create the HTTP server. So I'm going to create my HTTP server. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to create here a constant variable server and then call the HTTP module. So here I'm going to say HTTP and using the HTTP module, I'm going to call a method create server. This method is going to help us to create the HTTP server. So I'm going to call here a method HTTP server and to this server, you need to pass a callback function. The callback function have two arguments. So here I'm going to create a callback function. So I'm going to pass here arrow function just like this. And to this arrow function, I'm going to pass two argument. First is the request and second is the response. You're free to specify any name to these parameters. The create server is going to take the request using this first parameter and return the response using this second parameter. It is always the best practice to specify request and response name to these parameters. So I'm going to specify name request and response to these parameters. Once I specify that inside this callback function right here, I'm going to say response dot status code. So I'm going to call here a property of response and I'm going to say here equal to sign and then specify here 200. And then I'm going to say response dot set header and to this header, I'm going to specify content type. So here I'm going to say content type and then I'm going to specify here text plane. So I'm going to specify a content type text plane and just after that, I'm going to say response dot end. And here I'm going to specify welcome to HTTP server. So what we are going to do is when we get the successful request from the browser, we're going to return the status code 200. We're going to set the type of content we are going to return as a response using this set header method. And then I'm going to end the response using this output. So when the browser requests something, I'm going to return this data. You can see here using end method, we return the data to the request. The end method is going to help us to end the response process. You can notice here, we set the status code 200. This tells the browser everything is okay. This is the code of successful response. So here I'm going to say server dot listen. So I'm going to call a method of server. And in this method, I'm going to specify on which port I want to listen to the server. So here I'm going to specify port. As you know, we already have this variable port. And then I'm going to specify the host name. So as you know, we have this host name variable here. So I'm going to specify here host name. Now just out of that, to the third argument, to this listen method, I'm going to pass the callback function. This callback function is very helpful. If the server is successfully started, we're going to get this callback function console message on the terminal. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to specify here parenthesis and call the callback function here, just like this. And then I'm going to specify console message. And here I'm going to say console.log. 
and using the backtick operator i'm going to say server running at http and then i'm going to specify the address where the server is running on so here i'm going to specify http double forward slash then call the variable name here which is host name then specify colon and then i'm going to specify here port name just like this and at the end i'm going to specify forward slash don't forget to specify semicolon save the changes so i'm going to just open my terminal and here i'm going to say node index.js when i press enter you can notice here i'm going to have a message server running at http and here is the address of the server so i'm going to just click on this link so i'm going to press ctrl and click on this link as you can notice this will open your default browser and you will have a response on your web page now this is the address of the server we have the host name and the port now to stop this http server you can just simply press ctrl c this will stop your http server and now when you try to reload your browser you will get a result something like this this site can't be reached now let me show you some tricks to create this http server so what i'm going to do is instead of creating a server variable here I'm going to get rid of this server variable right from here and I'm going to just specify this listen method right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the server and I'm going to specify here dot and specify listen method. This is also a valid statement. Now you can notice we use here two lines to specify status code and set the header. Now let me show you how you can do the same thing on a single line. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say here response and call a method write head. This method allows us to specify status code and the set header at the same time. So I'm going to specify argument to this method. So here I'm going to specify first argument which is the status code. Here I'm going to specify status code 200 and then I'm going to specify header type. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify here object and I'm going to specify this text inside this object just like this. And don't forget to get rid of this comma and specify here colon because as you know this is an object now just for that i'm going to get rid of both these lines from this server and now as you can notice we done the same thing only in a single line and if you want to send the response independently you can do that as well what i'm going to do is i'm going to get rid of this text right from this end method and up here i'm going to call a method response dot write this one and to this method i'm going to pass my response just like this save the changes when i run my server it will work fine so i'm going to say here node index.js so when i press enter as you can notice my server is running at this url i'm going to just open my browser and reload the page as you can notice i have the response welcome to http server so this is how you can simply create the http server in node Next, we'll take a look at how to make the HTTP request. You know that how to create the HTTP server in Node. In this lecture, we're going to make HTTP request. We're going to understand how to create HTTP request in Node. We use HTTP request to send the request to the server and get the response from the server. So let's take a look at how to create a simple HTTP request in Node. What I'm going to do is, here I'm going to first require the HTTP module. So here I'm going to say constant HTTP is equal to and then call the require function and in the double quote, I'm going to say HTTP. Now once I have my HTTP module, I'm going to call the get method of HTTP module to create HTTP request. So here I'm going to say HTTP dot get. I'm going to call the get method and then inside this get method, I'm going to pass some arguments. To the first argument, I'm going to specify the URL where I want to send the request. I'm going to send the request to the opennotify.org website. So in this get method, I'm going to specify single quote. And here I'm going to say HTTP colon double forward slash, then specify API dot open and then specify hyphen notify dot org. And I'm going to just go astros dot JSON file. So I'm going to send the request to this astros.json file. And now, just for that, just specify comma here. And to the second argument, we are going to get the response from this URL. 
As a second argument, we need to specify a callback function where we get the response from the URL. So what I'm going to do is, here I'm going to say response and then call the arrow function. So what we're going to do is, we want to just grab the information from this API. So we will be making a get request using this get method. Therefore, we call here get method. This method takes two arguments, the API URL and the callback function detecting what to do with response from the request. The Open Notify is the open source project to provide a simple programming interface for some of NASA's awesome data. If you want to know more about this Open Notify, you can just open your browser and just head on to api.open-notify.org. You will find more about this API on this web page. Inside this get method, I'm going to just do some work with this response. So what I'm going to do is, here I'm going to just simply specify response dot and then I'm going to call a method on. And to this method, I'm going to specify first argument. So I'm going to specify here data. So when we get the data from this URL, the on method will automatically trigger. So I'm going to pass here event data. To this on method, as a second argument, I'm going to pass a callback function. And here, I'm going to just add that data in the variable. So here I'm going to say chunk. So I'm going to create a parameter chunk and specify callback function here. And just for that, I'm going to just concatenate all the data. So I'm going to say here data plus equal to and specify here chunk just like this. Don't forget to specify here semicolon. Inside this get method, I'm going to call a method on. This method takes the event as a first argument and callback function as a second argument. The data event collects the data from the request. So I'm going to use here data and collect this data from this URL. And just out of this method, I'm going to call another method to end this request. So here I'm going to say response dot on and to this on method I'm going to pass event. So here I'm going to specify event end. Just out of that I'm going to specify the callback function. So here I'm going to specify a simple callback function without any parameter and inside it I'm going to just simply say console.log and print my data. So now as you can notice I'm going to get the data using this on data event and store it in this data variable. Now as you can notice, I did not initialize this data variable. So let me first initialize it before this method. So up here, I'm going to create let data is equal to and initialize it with empty string like this. I'm going to just get all the data from this chunk variable and concatenate it with this data variable. And then I'm going to print this data variable by ending the request using this end event. I'm going to save the changes. As you can notice, your HTTP request is now created. Now let me execute this file and show you the result. I'm going to open my terminal and here I'm going to say node index.js. When I press enter, as you can notice, I'm going to have the result what I want. So this open API is going to return the result something like this. Now keep in mind, once all the data have been received from the request using this data event, the on end event is automatically fired and then you will get the result what you want. This URL is return this data as string. So as you can notice, we have the string data as a result. What if you want to convert this data in JSON format? You can use a simple json.parse method. For example, let's say I want to convert this data in JSON format. So here I'm going to specify let JSON data is equal to, then I'm going to specify json.parse. I'm going to call a method of JSON parse and then I'm going to specify here my data variable and just out that just use this variable right here that's it save the changes let me clear the screen and execute this statement again so as you can notice getting the data with JSON format is always a best practice because it's easy to read and it's easy to understand so I hope you understand how to make a simple HTTP GET request using node next we'll talk about how to create the HTTP POST REQUEST In the previous lecture, we understand the easiest way to create the GET request. Now, let's take a look at how to create the HTTP POST REQUEST. There are many ways to perform an HTTP POST REQUEST in Node. I'm going to show you two different ways to create POST REQUEST. So let me first show you a native HTTP POST REQUEST. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to first create here constant variable, HTTP and require the HTTP module. Just out of that, I'm going to create the constant data variable so I can pass this data 
with the HTTP POST request. So here I'm going to create a variable constant data and specify here json.stringify and right here I'm going to pass an object. So here I'm going to pass name and I'm going to specify value to it John Doe and then I'm going to specify job and I'm going to specify job content writer. Just for that down here I'm going to create a request. So here I'm going to say constant request is equal to then I'm going to call the HTTP module and then I'm going to call a method request. And inside this method, we have two argument. First is the URL of the API and second is the callback function. So I'm going to first specify URL here. So what I'm going to do is instead of just specifying URL, I'm going to specify host name, path, method and the content type. So I'm going to simply specify here an object like this and then specify my callback function here just like this. So this is my first argument of the type object and this is my second argument of the type callback function. Now to the first argument, I'm going to specify first the URL. So using hostname property, you can specify URL to this request method. So here I'm going to say hostname, specify colon and in the single code, I'm going to specify request response dot in. So this is the URL and then I'm going to specify path and here I'm going to specify the path in the single code. I'm going to specify forward slash API forward slash users. Now, as you can notice, this is a type of object. Why don't you specify this object independently instead of specifying this object inside this argument? So what I'm going to do is up here, I'm going to create a variable, a constant variable options is equal to and then I'm going to specify here an object and then I'm going to specify these properties inside this object like this and then I'm going to copy this path specify here comma and then specify here path variable and then right here as the first argument I'm going to specify these options now just for that once I specify the path of this URL I'm going to specify a method so here I'm going to say method specify colon and in the single code I'm going to specify post so this is the type of post method so here I'm going to specify post just for that, I'm going to specify header and in the object, I'm going to specify content type and just for that, specify here colon and say here in the single code application JSON. Now, just for that, I'm going to save this file. Now, let me explain this code. So here in this options, I'm going to specify the host name request response dot in. This is the website where you can test your API. If you want to know more about this website, you can just head on to your browser and just search for request response dot in using this website you can test your application against a real api so this is a very helpful website and as you can notice i specify here path of this hosted url then specify the method post and the content type just for that inside this request inside this callback function right here i'm going to simply create a variable let data is equal to and then specify single quotes so here in this data, I'm going to store all the response data. Just for that, I'm going to say here console.log and using this console.log message, I'm going to display the status code. So in the double code, I'm going to say status code. And then here, I'm going to call the status code property of response object. So as you can notice, we did not specify here response object. So let me just specify that inside this parenthesis. So when we get the response from this URL, I'm going to store it in this variable. So here I'm going to say response. And now let me just print the response code. So here I'm going to say response dot status code. So using this message, you will get the successful or the error status code of the response. Just out of that down here, just out of this message, I'm going to just say here response dot on. I'm going to call a method on and then specify event data. As you know, when we get the data from the URL, this event will automatically fire and execute the callback function. So for the second argument, I'm going to specify a callback function like this. And don't forget to specify parameter here to get the URL data. So here I'm going to specify chunk. And inside this on method, I'm going to concatenate this data with data variable. So here I'm going to say data plus equal to chunk like this. And just out of that down here, I'm going to simply say response 
dot on and call an event end so when the request is successfully end i'm going to just return this callback function and with this callback function i'm going to print a message so here i'm going to say console.log and then i'm going to specify here body and then specify here json dot parse and i'm going to specify here my data so i'm going to call my data variable here now just out of that once we've done that as you know with post request you send some data so as you can see i have this data variable i'm going to just send this data with post request so here i have this request object i'm going to use this object to send the data so down here i'm going to say here request dot write i'm going to use this method and pass my data variable and just out of that i'm going to just end this request using request dot end save the changes and now let me just change the name of this data variable so you will not get confused i'm going to just change it to body like this so you will completely understand the difference between this data variable and this response i'm going to save the changes and now let me execute this file open the terminal and here i'm going to say index.js and press enter oops as you can notice i'm going to have the error message unexpected end of a json input most of the node applications use http modules but many api block the request because of the ssl issues so to solve this problem i'm going to just make this request as http s request so instead of http here i'm going to specify http s http s is the http protocol or tls or you can say or ssl in node.js http s module implemented separately this module used to make a request to any server so i'm going to use here https and save the changes and try the same thing again i'm going to open my terminal clear the screen and here i'm going to say node index.js when i press enter as you can notice i'm going to have the result what i want so using this secure https you will not get any ssl issue so in the output you can see a status code 201 which is the successful status code of api and then we have the body inside body we have the json data now as you can notice to make the post request it takes almost 35 lines of code using axios library you can make the post request within few seconds so let me show you how to make the http post request using a simple axios library so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open my terminal and here i'm going to install the axios library so to install library i'm going to say npm install hyphen s to save this library as dependencies and i'm going to specify the library name so here i'm going to say axios when i press enter we have this library in this node modules folder and if you open the package.json you have this library here as well as a dependencies now i'm going to use this library and make the http post request so i'm going to back to my index.js and instead of this request I'm going to use Axios library. So I'm going to get rid of this statement right from here. And I'm going to import this library in this index.js. So instead of this HTTP module, I'm going to say here constant Axios is equal to call the require function. And inside it, I'm going to call the Axios library. And down here, I'm going to simply say Axios.post. So I'm going to call a simple method of this library. So as a first argument to this post method, I'm going to specify the address. So as you can notice, this is the URL of the request. So I'm going to specify this URL as a first argument. So in the single code, I'm going to say HTTPS colon forward slash, then specify request of response dot in forward slash API users. So I'm going to specify this host name and the path in this url just out of that as a second argument i'm going to get the data from this url i'm going to say here data and just after that once we have the data i'm going to use then method we use then method in promises then method allows us to create a synchronous code so using this library we can make a synchronous request so down here i'm going to specify dot then call method then and inside this method I'm going to call a response and specify a callback function here like this and inside this function i'm going to say console.log and in the backtick operator i'm going to say status code 
and then I'm going to just concatenate the status code here. So I'm going to specify dollar curly braces response dot status. Just after that, I'm going to specify console dot log, and using the backtick operator, I'm going to specify body, and here I'm going to specify response dot data, and at the end, I can call the error as well. So I'm going to say here catch, and here I'm going to call error. And in the callback function, I'm going to specify console.log and print this error. And I'm going to just get rid of this constant variable. Just like this. Save the changes and execute this file. So I'm going to open my terminal, clear the screen. And here I'm going to say node index.js. When I press enter, as you can notice, I'm going to have the result what I want. So when you execute your file, you can notice you have the result something like this. We have the status code 201 and have the body. Inside body, we have object. Now, if you want to print this object, you can use adjacent stringify method. For example, let's say I want to print this object on my console. So I'm going to grab this response and here I'm going to say json.stringify and just pass this data. Save the changes and now execute this file again. As you can notice, when I execute this file, I'm going to have the result what I want. I'm going to get this data from this request. So as you can notice, it's super easy to create a POST request using Axios library. It takes only 16 lines of code to create this POST request. So I hope you understand how to work with HTTP request in Node. Next, we'll start working on files. Now, once we know that how to make HTTP request using Node, let's understand how to work with files in Node. Working with files is super easy in Node because you have inbuilt Node modules to work with files. In Node, you can create, update, delete, or manipulate any file. So let's take a look at some example of files. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the fs module inside this index.js. So here I'm going to say constant fs is equal to and require the module called fs. fs short for file system. It is the one of the most basic and useful module in Node. FS is one of the out of the box module that comes with Node. So it is already available to you. You don't have to install this FS module using NPM. So once you have FS module, let's use it. So down here, I'm going to say FS dot read file. I'm going to call method read file. So as a first argument, as you can see, we have the path of the file. Here as a first argument in the double code, I'm going to specify the file name. So here I'm going to say test.txt. As you know, I don't have this file in my folder. Just out of that, I'm going to specify the type. So in the single code, I'm going to say utf8. So this is the type of this file. And then I'm going to call the callback function. So here I'm going to say function. Then first parameter is the error parameter. And second is the data parameter. So as you can notice, I'm going to call the callback function here. Oops. I just specify here function. Let me just get rid of this function. Now, once I have my arrow function as a callback function, inside this function, I'm going to say if, if we have error, then just throw it. So I'm going to use here throw keyword with error variable. As you can notice here, I have this error parameter. So if we have any error using this read file method, I'm going to just throw it. Don't worry, we will understand how to use exception handling in Node later in this course. Just for now, just throw this error. And then here I'm going to say console.log. I just specify here data parameter. So once we read the data from this file, I'm going to just put that data inside this data parameter and just print it. I'm going to save the changes. And now, as you know, I don't have this file in my folder structure. So let me just create it. So I'm going to just create here a new file with the name test.txt. And inside this file, I'm going to specify welcome to node application save the changes back to the index.js save this file and execute it when i execute this file as you can notice i'm going to have the result welcome to node application so i'm going to have this data in this data parameter and i'm going to just print it using this console.log method so this read file method allows us to read the data from any file you can notice here we write this code in a synchronous way if you want, you can make this code synchronous as well. FS module have two methods, asynchronous and synchronous. This is the asynchronous version. Let me show you 
how to create the same thing with synchronous way. So down here, I'm going to call a method of synchronous fs module. We just have to create here a variable constant data is equal to, and I'm going to just get the data from the function in this data variable. So I'm going to say here fs dot and call a method read file sync. I'm going to call this method of fs module. So as you can notice here at the end of this method we have sync. So this indicate this is the synchronous method. So I'm going to just specify here a method parameters and inside it as a first argument I'm going to specify the path of the file. So here I'm going to say test.txt. Just out of that you need to specify the encoding and the flag. As you can notice here we have the options as a second argument. Here we have encoding and flag. So I'm going to specify here curly braces and inside it I'm going to specify encoding colon and in the single code I'm going to specify utf8 and now I'm going to specify flag so I'm going to specify here flag specify colon and specify r here I want to just read this file so I'm going to specify a flag r save the changes and now let's just print this data so down here I'm going to say console.log and print this data variable like this when I execute this file as you can notice I'm going to have the same result so as you can notice I just introduced both these methods to work with files this is the asynchronous way and this is the synchronous way now suppose you want to check the file status you have the method for that as well so here I'm going to say fs dot state using this state method you can display the different status of the file so here I'm going to say state and in the parenthesis I'm going to specify argument so here I'm going to first specify the file name test.txt the second argument is going to be the options or the callback functions so I'm going to specify here callback function so I'm going to specify here callback function just like this and I'm going to pass parameters here oops I'm going to specify parameter error and the second argument is going to be the status so I'm going to say here state just out of that in this callback function you can do many things with this text file so inside this callback function here I'm going to say if if there is any error in this file just console this error using console.error and I'm going to just print this error like this and I'm going to say here return statement just like this if the file successfully open using this status down here I'm going to say console.log and using this state argument I'm going to check if it is a file or a directory so inside this console.log here I'm going to say states dot is file so I'm going to call this method is file save the changes and now let me execute this file as you can notice I'm going to have true as a result I put this synchronous code before this status so I have to get this output before this true this is happening because you choose here sync function as I said earlier asynchronous coding is best for time consuming task here we use sync function and this is the synchronous code as you can notice this code execute at the end of the application now as you can notice this statement returned true because this is a file then let's check this file is a directory or not here I'm going to say console.log if you want to check this file is directory or not you can say here states dot is directory this statement will return false because this is not directory it is a file just for that here I'm going to say console.log and using the states I'm going to call a method is symbolic link and this statement is also going to return false as you know this is just a simple file we don't have any link or any reference inside this text file so this is not the symbolic file so it will return false as a result just for that I'm going to say here console.log using the state argument you can print the size of the file as well here I'm going to say state dot size this property is going to print the size of your file I'm going to save the changes and execute this file and as you can notice this is the size of your text file so these are some useful way you can work with files in node next we're going to talk about how to write and update files now in the previous lecture you understand how to read the file using fs module of node in this lecture, we're going to talk about how to write and update the file using FS module.
So if you want to update, raid and delete files, you have three methods. So there are three methods which is very important while working with files. So these are the methods. These are the asynchronous methods and these are the synchronous methods. Keep in mind, synchronous code will stop later code from running when there is an error message. Asynchronous code will not do that. It will continue the execution. So if you want to stop the execution, use synchronous method of files. I'm going to show you how you can use both these methods one by one. Now I'm going to first show you how to write the file using node. So here I'm going to create a variable constant content is equal to and then I'm going to specify here array and pass object inside it. And here I'm going to specify type and specify value to it node application. Just start that down here. I'm going to call synchronous method. So here I'm going to say fs dot write file sync. So I'm going to just choose this write file sync. Just after that, just specify parentheses in the single code. I'm going to specify the path of the file. So here I'm going to say test dot json. As you can see, I don't have this file in this node modules folder. This method will create this file and put this data inside it. So as a second argument to this method, I'm going to pass json dot stringify and pass my content. This one. I'm going to pass this content inside this JSON file using this second argument. Save the changes and execute this file. When I execute this file, you can notice I'm going to have here a file test.json and inside it, I'm going to have my data. So that's super easy to create a file using a synchronous code. Now let me show you how to do the same thing with a synchronous code, but this time I'm going to write the data inside this test.txt. So I'm going to get it off and this data right from here, save this file and get rid of these statements. And here I'm going to say constant content is equal to and specify node application. Just sort of that. Here I'm going to call the asynchronous method. So here I'm going to say fs dot write file. So this is the asynchronous method. As a first argument, I'm going to specify the file name. I'm going to specify here test.txt this one let me just delete this file here i'm going to specify test.txt so this method will create this file and i'm going to specify the second argument so here i'm going to specify the data i want to insert inside this file i want to insert this content so here i'm going to say content just like that i want to specify the flag so in the object i'm going to specify flag colon and in the single quote i'm going to specify a plus just after this flag I'm going to call here error and call a callback function and inside it I'm going to say if if there is any error just print it using console.log and just exit from this method or print a message successfully done save the changes when I execute this file I'm going to have a message successfully done and you can notice here the test.txt file is created with the data node application so using a synchronous way, it is also very easy to create a file. Now suppose you already have this file in your project directory. This method won't create the duplicate file. Instead, instead this method will append the content inside that file. Now there are different flags you can specify with this method. Here you can notice I specify here A+. A+, means open the file for reading and writing. Positioning the stream at the end of the file. The file is created if it is not exist. Just out of that, we have a flag. This a flag open the file for writing, positioning the stream at the end of the file. The file is created if it is not exist. We'll talk about how stream work later in this course. Just for now, just understand the second flag, which is r plus. This flag open the file for reading and writing. Then we have w plus. The w plus flag will open the file for reading and writing, positioning the stream at the beginning of the file. The stream is actually allows us to append the data at some position. W plus flag allows us to stream the data at the beginning of the file. So for example, if I append node plus, save the changes and execute this file again, then you can notice if you open the test.txt, you can notice here the data of this file is append at the beginning of the stream. And just out of that, what if I specify here A plus, save the changes and execute this program again. When I execute this file, you can notice the data is now append at the end of this file. So using this a plus flag, I'm going to just append this data at the end of the string. 
So as you can notice, using this flag, you can update your file content. So what if I just specify here daily tuition? Save the changes and execute this file again. This will update this file and add daily tuition at the end of the stream. So I'm going to have this daily tuition at the end of the file. And what if you want to remove all the content from this file and put a new content inside it? So basically you want to update this file. In that case, you can use a W flag with plus sign. So here I'm going to specify W plus and I'm going to change this content and here I'm going to specify node.js. Save the changes and execute this file. When I execute this file, inside this file you have node.js. So this W plus flag will update your file very easily. So if you want to append the content at the end of the file, just use A plus. And if you want to update the complete file, use W plus. And if you want to just read the file, use R plus. And if you want to just open the file for writing, not for reading, just use A. So these are some useful flags while working with Node files. You can find more about these flags on Node website. Just out of that, what if you want to delete the file? You can use a Node unlink method. So I'm going to just get rid of this statement from here. And here I'm going to say fs.unlink. I'm going to use the asynchronous method unlink. And if you want to use synchronous, you just need to specify here unlink sync. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use unlink. And in the parenthesis, I'm going to specify the part of the file. I'm going to specify here test.txt. So this is the file which I want to delete using this unlink method. So just for that, I'm going to specify the second argument, which is the error as a callback function. And here I'm going to say if, if there is any error inside this file, just print it using console.log and exit from this method or print a message console.log and I'm going to say here file removed. Let me just save this file and execute this program. As you can notice, when I execute my program, I'm going to have a message a file removed and the file is now removed from your project directory. So I hope you understand how to work with files in Node. Next, we'll take a look at routing. In the previous lecture, we understand how to work with files in Node. Now, let's take a look at what is routing. Once you understand how to create the HTTP server using Node, it's important to understand how to make it do things based on the path that the user has navigated to. Performing tasks on a particular path is called routing. Let me repeat this sentence. Performing tasks on a particular path is called routing. Let me show you a very simple example to understand what is routing in Node. So let me first show you the syntax of routing. You have if statement and you check the path with the request URL. If the requested URL is matched with this path, we're going to execute this if statement and return the response. So this is a very basic concept of routing. Let me show you how you can work with routing in Node. So we're going to create a simple example here. So I'm going to first create here a constant variable and call a module HTTP and using require function, I'm going to require the HTTP module. Just for that, here I'm going to create the server. So as you know, I'm going to create the server using create server method. To the first argument, we're going to specify function, specify request and response. Now, once we have request and response inside this function, here I'm going to say if request dot URL. I'm going to call a method of request. Oops, let me just get rid of this arrow. So I'm going to call here a method request dot URL and I'm going to compare it with the path which we are going to specify in the browser URL section. So here I'm going to specify equal to sign and in the single code, I'm going to specify forward slash. This forward slash refers to the root path. And inside this if statement, I'm going to say return and I'm going to just return here a function. So I'm going to just call a function index and pass request and response just like this. And just for that down here, I'm going to call a method listen and I'm going to specify the port name 8000. If you want, you can change this port name as well. Now, as you know, we don't have this function in this program. So let me just create this function. So up here, I'm going to create this function. So I'm going to say here function index and I'm going to pass two parameters to it. As you know, we have this request and response parameter to this index function. So here I'm going to say request and response. So I'm going to pass here two parameters and then I'm going to return the response to the user. So here I'm going to say response dot 
right here 200 so this is the successful response code and then i'm going to specify here response dot end and i'm going to end the response with node routing text save the changes and now let me explain this code i'm going to first import the http module to create the http server so using this method create server i'm going to create the http server i'm going to listen that server on port 8000 in this create server i'm going to create each statement if the user specify a root path in the browser url i want to return this index function and to this index function we pass a request and response object so when we call this index function it's going to call this function with this request and response parameter and inside it i'm going to have this response message i want to print this message using this route so this is what we call a route let me just save the changes and show you the result first i'm going to open my terminal and here on my terminal i'm going to just type node index.js when i press enter this statement will start this server on port 8000 as you know we did not specify any console message with this listen method so i'm not going to get anything here but the server is now started now let me just open this 8000 port so i'm going to open my browser and on my browser i'm going to just search for this port so here i'm going to search for localhost colon 8000 just like this when i press enter as you can notice you're going to have a message node routing so this is the root path of your route so as you can notice here we just specify here forward slash this indicates when the user send request using the url of the browser just check this if condition if it is true then return this index function now as you can see here we just specify here forward slash this indicates the root path so this will execute this index function and print this message now what if you have different path for example let me just create here another path so here i'm going to say if request.url is equal to in the single code i'm going to specify forward slash and specify here about us and inside this if statement i'm going to call a function where i'm going to send the response to this request so down here i'm going to create a function so here i'm going to say function about us and inside this function and in the parenthesis here i'm going to say request and the second parameter is going to be response so i'm going to say here response dot end and i'm going to just specify this is about page save the changes and now let me just call this function here inside this if statement here i'm going to say return about us and then specify request and response parameter save the changes and restart the server so i'm going to press ctrl c and execute the server again when i reload the browser i'm going to have no routing as a result but when i specify forward slash with about us i'm going to have a different message here you can notice i'm going to have this is about page so this is the different routing path we specify here about us route path and return a different response so using routing you can return different response to the user depending on the route path so using this technique you can route the user on different pages creating route like this would add a massive amount of callback functions in a big project so let me just clean this up and show you a very simple way to create a routing so instead of these functions i'm going to create here a constant variable so up here i'm going to create a constant variable routes is equal to and specify object to it and inside this object i'm going to specify key so here i'm going to specify single code forward slash as you know this is my root route and to this root route i'm going to specify a function so here i'm going to specify function and here i'm going to specify name to it index specify request and response parameter and inside this function as you know i have these two statements i'm going to cut it right from here and paste that inside this function like this just for that let's create a next route and i'm going to specify here single code forward slash about us so this is our second route and here i'm going to specify this function so i'm going to copy this function and paste it here like this and i'm going to just get rid of these functions from here and just out of that down here instead of calling this if statement 
here i'm going to just say if request dot url in routes and then i'm going to specify curly braces to start the if statement and i'm going to just return routes in the square bracket i'm going to specify request dot url and in the parentheses here i'm going to pass request and response so as you can notice this is super easy to create this route using this technique now let me explain this code now here what i did i just created if statement and specify request url in routes so this url request will match with these keys if you find these keys in the url we will execute this if statement inside this if i'm going to just return the route and using this square bracket i'm going to get a specific route so for example if you request for the root route it will execute this root route section and then i'm going to pass parameter to this response and request parameter using this argument so if you call the root route it will execute this root route section with these both parameters now let me just save the changes and restart the server so i'm going to just restart the server let me just check this code is successfully running or not as you can notice this code is successfully running so when you request for the root route using this url the browser will first check for the url using this if statement if the code finds the root route inside this variable it's going to execute that route so here i have the root route so it's going to execute this root route function as you can see we just return the route with the requested url with the parameters using this route you can create a different api you can return different html pages and you can do a lot more things this is just a basic example of routes we are going to learn how to work with routes later in this course when you deploy your app to the node.js specified hosted environment this environment usually offer a port environment variable that you can use to run your server on changing the port number to process dot env dot port allows you to access that application environment variable so here instead of this 8000 i'm going to just specify process dot env dot port just like this so this will use the port environment hosted variable and just like that you can specify the default port name as well using double pipe operator like this here i'm going to specify 8000 so when we deploy the node app we use this process.env.port variable we'll talk about this port variable later in this course so i hope you understand how to work with routing in node next we'll talk about path module the path module provides a lot of very useful functionality to access and interact with file system there is no need to install it being part of node.js core it can be used by simply requiring it there are different useful methods we can access with path module let's just take a look at the different methods of path module which you can use in node application so here i'm going to say constant path is equal to and then specify require statement and in the double code i'm going to specify path module as i said earlier you don't have to install this path module because path is inbuilt module in node this path module have different useful methods let's start with the base name method here i'm going to say file is equal to and specify here path dot and i'm going to call a method base name and in the parenthesis of this method i'm going to specify the file name here i'm going to specify test.json the base name method is going to return the last portion of the path so when i save the changes and print this file using console.log i'm going to have the last part of this path save the changes and execute this file as you can notice i'm going to have test.json as a result so this base name is going to return the last portion of the path so whenever you want to get the file name from the path you can use this base name method just for that we have a directory name method here i'm going to say path.dir name this method is going to return the directory part of the path so here i'm going to save the changes and execute this file as you can notice so this will just return this directory tutorial then just for that we have is absolute method so here i'm going to say is absolute this method is going to return true if it is an absolute path now when i save the changes and execute this file it's going to return false because this is not an absolute path so here i'm going to just specify the absolute path of this folder save the changes and execute this file 
as you can notice i'm going to have true as a result so this is the absolute path so this method will going to return true so whenever you want to find the absolute and relative path you can use this is absolute method just after that we have join method so i'm going to just copy this statement paste it down here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to just divide this part in different pieces so here i'm going to create a variable let dir is equal to tutorial so here i'm going to just specify this tutorial folder and just have that here i'm going to say path dot join i'm going to call the method join the join method is going to join different path so in this join i'm going to specify this c drive so i'm going to copy the c drive in the single code i'm going to paste it just for that i'm going to specify comma and specify the second argument and in the second argument i'm going to copy this path and paste it here just like this so this is my second path and just out of that i'm going to specify here comma and then specify this tutorial folder so i'm going to call this a dir variable like this and at the end i'm going to specify the file name so i'm going to specify here test.json and now let me get rid of this statement save the changes and execute this file when i execute this file as you can notice i'm going to have the complete path inside this file variable so using this join method you can join different path very easily you can notice here i did not specify any forward or backward slash to this c drive or here as well the join method will automatically specify this forward or the backward slash depending on the operating system i'm using windows so it will specify the backward slash just after that we have parse method so here i'm going to specify parse and in the parenthesis right here as an argument i'm going to specify the tutorial folder forward slash then specify test.json let me just get rid of this directory and now let me just print this statement save the file and print this statement when i print the statement i'm going to have the result something like this this parse method will return different segments of the path so here it will return root directory name base name of this path extension of the file and the name of the file so this parse method is very useful this will return all the information of the path as an object so you will get object as a result just after that you have a resolve method so here i'm going to say resolve this method is going to return the absolute path of the file using the relative path calculation i'm going to save the file and execute it when i execute this file you can notice i'm going to have the absolute path of this file using this resolve method so if you don't know the absolute path of the file you can use the resolve method this method is not limited for absolute path if you want to specify the base folder name you can do that as well here i'm going to get rid of this tutorial right from here and as a first argument like this and at the beginning of this tutorial folder i'm going to specify forward slash so this resolve method will take this tutorial folder as a base path so as you can notice the path module is very helpful when working with a big node project next we'll talk about event module event loop is one of the most important and useful module in node event module allows us to create different events in node events are basically used to perform a statements on certain action node.js allows us to create and handle custom events easily by using event module with an event emitter we can simply raise a new event from a different part of application and a listener will listen to the raises event and have some action performed for the event the event module provides us the event emitter class which is the key working with event in node.js event is also a very important module in node if you want to work on events so let's take a look at how to create an event and how to work with it so down here i'm going to create a simple variable so here i'm going to say constant events is equal to and require event module so here i'm going to call require and call a module events so once i require this module as you can notice events are inbuilt in node so you don't have to install this event using npm now once i have this event module let me just create an object of event emitter class by using this event module so here i'm going to create a variable let ev is equal to new events dot event emitter i'm going to call a class event emitter now once i have an instance of event emitter i can create my own events so let's create a simple event using this ev instance so here i'm going to say ev dot and i'm going to call a method 
on on method is used to create events so here i'm going to say on and to the first argument i'm going to specify the event which i want to create so here i want to create my event so i'm going to name this my event if you want you can specify a different name as well that's upon you and once i call this event i want to perform a certain action so i'm going to just call a function here as a second argument so here i'm going to call a function and pass a data parameter to it and inside this function i'm going to say console.log and in the double quote i'm going to say event and then just specify data using the sentence i'm going to just console this function data now when i call this event i'm going to pass this data variable value i'm going to just pass this function as a callback function to this on method so the first argument is the event name which i want to create and then the callback function which you want to execute when this event is called or you can say raises so to call this event or you can say to raise this event i'm going to say ev dot emit the emit method is used to call the event in the parenthesis i'm going to call a single code and specify the exact name of my event so i'm going to copy this event name and specify here just like that as you can notice i just specify here data parameter to this callback function so we need to specify this value as well so as a second argument in the double quote i'm going to say call emit method to fire my event i'm going to just save the changes and execute this file when i execute this file i'm going to have this message call emit method to fire my event so this will just console this message so you can notice i'm going to just fire this my event using this emit method you can create different events using this event module that's how on you now suppose you want to create an event which execute only once to do that you can use once method let me show you i'm going to get rid of this on method right from here and here i'm going to call ev dot once so i'm going to call this method once and then specify event name so here i'm going to specify my event name event once so i'm going to create a new event with the name event once and specify a second argument which is the callback function so instead of creating a standard function i'm going to create here an arrow function and to this arrow function i'm going to just say console.log and here i'm going to say event once fire and just out of that i'm going to call this event so as you can notice i have this emit method to call events so i'm going to get rid of this second parameter and here i'm going to call this event like this save the changes and execute this program again when i execute this program you can notice i'm going to have a message event once once fire now what if i duplicate this statement let me just duplicate this statement like this save the changes and when i execute this file i'm going to have a single message this statement will not execute this event multiple times so this once method will execute event only once so emitting events register with once method will have no impact now just for that if you want you can pass callback function as a second argument to this once method and you can specify multiple parameters as well so here i'm going to specify multiple parameters so here i'm going to say code and msg and i'm going to pass these parameters inside this console.log so here using this backtick operator i'm going to say got and call this code variable and then i'm going to say and and print msg like this just for that get it off this second emit and here as you know i have these two parameters to this callback function so we need to pass value to it using this emit method so down here i'm going to pass value to it i'm going to pass 200 to the first parameter and okay to the second parameter save the changes and execute this file when i execute this file as you can notice i'm going to have a message got 200 and okay so using this technique if you want you can pass multiple parameters to the event now you can notice how to register an event using on and once method now what if you want to unregister the event you can do that with off method when we register an event we pass a function as a callback function when we unregister the event we also need to pass this function so let me just grab this function and put that here so i'm going to create here c1 is equal to and i'm going to pass this function and i'm going to just say here c1 like this i'm going to specify here variable where and down here just out of this once i'm going to call a method ev dot off this method is used to unregister the event as a first argument i'm going to pass the event name like this 
and as a second argument i'm going to pass the function so i'm going to call this callback function c1 now when i execute this file i'm not going to get anything because we unregistered this event using this statement so this statement will return nothing so this is how you can use event module in node next we'll talk about stream Streams are the one of the fundamental concepts that power Node.js application. They are the way to handle reading, writing files, network communication, or any kind of end-to-end -end information exchange in an efficient way. In the traditional way, when you tell the program to read the file, the file is read into memory from start to finish, and then you process it. For example, let's say you are watching a daily tuition tutorial on YouTube. You want to move to the next section of this video. You can just simply click on this video timeline and move the timeline. When you click on the timeline, a new piece of data passes to the memory and process. So you will get the result what you want. Using streams, you can read data or you can say you can get data piece by piece, processing its content without keeping it all in a memory. Streams basically provide two major advantage using other data handling, memory efficiency and time efficiency. In memory efficiency, you don't need to load large amount of data in memory before you are able to process it. And in time efficiency, it takes away a less time to start processing data as soon as you have it, rather than waiting till the whole data payload is available to start. Let me show you a very simple example of stream to understand how stream work in Node. I'm going to simply create here a variable constant HTTP is equal to and I'm going to require a module HTTP. Just for that, we are going to work on files so i'm going to say here constant fs is equal to and require the fs module then i'm going to create a server so i'm going to say here constant server is equal to http dot create server and i'm going to pass here a function as a callback function and to the callback function i'm going to say request and response and inside this i'm going to say fs dot read file so i'm going to call asynchronous method read file and to the first argument i'm going to simply pass the file path so in the single quote i'm going to say test.json so i'm going to pass this file name as a first argument to this read file method to the second argument i'm going to specify a callback function so we can work with this file data so here i'm going to say error as a first argument and data as a second argument just for that using this callback function i'm going to return a response to the request so here i'm going to say response dot end and i'm going to response with the data variable like this so this is a very simple example of file handling now just for that down here i'm going to say server dot listen and i'm going to listen the server on 300 port if you want to print a message you can call here a callback function with console dot log and in the double code we can say application started on port 3000 just are that save the changes and now let me execute this file i'm going to have a message application started on port 3000 so i'm going to just open my browser to open this server so i'm going to say here localhost 3000 i'm going to get the data from my file so this statement will return the data from this test.json file now the read file reads the full content of the file and invoke this callback function when it's done just after that we have the response.n method using this response.n method we're going to return the file content to the http client if the file is big the operation will take a quite a bit of time and as you know if your application is slow to load the data the user will likely to leave from your application and close it now let me show you how to do the same thing with stream so what i'm going to do is here i use the read file method so instead of using this read file, I'm going to use this stream method to get the data from this file. As I said earlier, if the file is too big, it takes time to load the data inside this data variable and return to the request. To save the time and return the data as soon as possible, we are going to use streams. So I'm going to get rid of this statement right from here. And here I'm going to create a variable constant stream is equal to fs.create read string i'm going to call a method of fs module using fs module i'm going to call a stream method so here i'm going to say fs create read stream and in the parenthesis as a first argument i'm going to pass 
test dot json just for that down here i'm going to call this stream dot pipe i'm going to call a method of stream pipe and pass the response like this save the changes and now restart the server and execute this file so i'm going to open my terminal and here i'm going to say node index dot js when i press enter it will just show me a message let me just back to my port and reload this browser now when i reload the browser i can't see any effect here because this is a very small file when we work on the big files streams are very helpful instead of sending a whole data at once stream will send the data piece by piece now let me explain this statement instead of waiting until the file is fully read we start streaming it to the http client as soon as we have a chunk of data ready to be sent so using this statement using this pipe method we're going to send a chunk of data to this http server the pipe method is called on a file stream it takes the source and pipes it into a destination you call it on a source stream so in this case the file stream is piped to the http response so i hope you understand how to work with stream in node next we'll see what is buffer In the previous lecture, we understand how to work with stream in Node. In this lecture, we will understand what is buffer. Buffers were introduced to help developers to deal with binary data in an ecosystem that traditionally only deals with strings rather than binaries. Buffers are deeply linked with streams. When the stream processor receives data faster than it can digest, it puts the data in a buffer. Stream in Node.js simply means a sequence of data being moved from one point to other point over time. The whole concept is you have a huge amount of data to process, but you don't need to wait for all the data to be available before you start processing it. A simple visualization of the buffer is when you are watching a YouTube video and the red line goes beyond your visualization point. You are downloading data faster than you are viewing it and your browser buffers it. You can think of a buffer like an array of integers, which each represent a byte of data. Let me show you a very simple example to understand what is buffer and how to work with it. So I'm going to simply create here a variable constant buff is equal to and call a buffer class here. And from this buffer, I'm going to call a method from and here I'm going to specify hey. So this is kind of string. Now just out of that, down here I'm going to say console.log and in the parenthesis, I'm going to say buff. I'm going to call this buff variable. Now let me just save the changes and execute this file. When I execute this file, I'm going to have to result something like this. So as I said earlier, buffer is like an array. So you can access it using square bracket. So down here, I'm going to say console.log and I'm going to just call buff. And in the square bracket, I'm going to specify zero to access the first index of this buffer array. I'm going to save the changes and execute this file. As you can notice, I'm going to have 72 as a result. Here we have three numbers. These three numbers represent this string and this 72 represent this first edge character. These numbers are the unique code that identifies the character in the buffer position. So here's the buffer position and we have the edge character at this position. So this statement will print the unique code of this edge character. So it will print 72. Let me just duplicate this statement and change this index. I'm going to say here 1 and 2. Save the changes and execute this file. You can notice here, I'm going to have 101 and 121. So you can notice here, H has unique code 72, E has unique code 101, and Y has unique code 121. Now, let me show you what happened if I try to print this buffer using toString method. If I just say here dot toString, let me show you what would be the result. Save the changes and execute this file. As you can notice, I'm going to have this message as a result. So this buffer is going to print this message using this two string method. As I said earlier, buffer is going to take the data as binaries. Now you can notice we call a buffer class and call the from method of buffer class to create this buffer. Now if you want, you can write to a buffer a whole string of data by using a write method. Let me show you. Let me just get rid of this method right from here. And I'm going to call here a method allocate to allocate a memory for the buffer. So here I'm going to specify four. And using the buffer dot write method buff dot write, I'm going to write my buffer. So here I'm going to say, hey, like this. 
we allocated the size of this buffer 4. So we specify here 4 characters inside this write method. Now just after that, let me save the changes and execute this file again. I'm gonna have the same result. So using this technique, you can also write your own buffer. Now you notice, you can access the buffer using array index. You are not limited to only access the buffer index. Just like you can access a buffer with an array syntax, you can also set the content of the buffer in the same way. So down here, I'm gonna say buff and to the first index, I'm gonna specify 1, 1, 1. So this is equal to O. So this is the unique code of O. Now let me just print this buffer. I'm gonna console this down here. Save the changes and execute this file. As you can notice, I'm gonna have O at the first index of this buffer. So I hope you understand how to work with buffer in Node. Next, we'll talk about what is exception handling. Now, in this lecture, we're going to talk about what is exception handling. Every application must handle errors. Errors in Node.js are handled through exceptions. An exception is created using a throw keyword. Usually in client-side code value can be any JavaScript value including a string, a number, or an object. In Node.js, we don't throw strings. We just throw error objects. An error object is an object that is either an instance of the error object or extend the error object. If you want to throw error message to the user, you can just simply say here throw new and then create the error object and specify the error message to it. Now this is the simple way to throw an error to the user. You can also handle error using try and catch method. For example, if you want to handle the error message, you can use this syntax, try and catch. We first create the try block. Inside this try block, we put the code and then if this code return any error, we're gonna catch that using this catch block. This key represent the exception value. So when this code return any error, this E object will catch that error and execute this catch block. You can handle exceptions with promises as well. Using promises, you can chain different operations and handle error at the end. For example, let me just print here a code. Now, as you can notice here, I just created a function, do something one, and then I'm gonna change some methods with it. I'm gonna execute this do something two method. Once the execution of this first method is finished, then if the execution of second method is finished, I'm gonna execute this do something three method and then execute this cache method if there is any error inside this code. But how do you know where the error code occurred? You don't really know, but you can handle error in each of these functions you call. You can create an object of error in each of these error functions. So you will understand where the error came from. Inside these functions, you can specify this throw and throw a new error object using these functions. That's going to call this outside catch handler. Now let me show you the one by one examples of these three syntax. So let me get rid of these two syntax right from here and save the changes. Now let me execute this file. Now as you can notice, we just throw an error message with this statement. When I execute this file, I'm gonna have an error message as a result. So using this statement, you can throw a simple error message in your program. Now once you understand how to use this throw keyword to return the error to the JavaScript code, let me show you how to use try and catch block. So here I'm gonna say try and in this block, I'm gonna say console.log and print start try block. Just for that, here I'm gonna say catch and in the parentheses, I'm gonna specify the error object like this. And down here, I'm gonna say console.log and say error message. Save the changes. And now let me execute this file. When I execute this file, I'm gonna have this simple console message. Right now, I don't have any error inside this try block. So this statement will not execute this catch block because I don't have any error inside this try block. Let me add some error inside this try block. So down here, I'm gonna just create a variable, la la la, like this. I just specify semicolon. As you can notice, this will return an error message because the variable is not defined. Let me save the changes and execute this program again. When I execute this program, I'm gonna have error message. This program will execute this catch block. So if you copy this console and put that down here, and if I just say here, and try block, save the changes, execute this file, this statement will not execute 
because you have error at this line. If any error occurs in this try block, we'll execute this catch block. So this statement return an error message. So this will execute this catch block and will not execute this console message after this error. Now, if you want to get this error detail, you can just put this error object in your console like this. If I see here error, save the changes and execute this file again. I'm going to have the error detail in my console. So I'm going to have this la 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 is not defined. So using this object, you will understand what exactly the error message is. So this is just a simple example of try and catch method. You can return any error using this try and catch block. If you want, you can throw the error right here as well. So if I just say here throw and create an object of error. And if I just return this error, then this statement will also execute this catch block. Save the changes and execute this file. As you can notice, I'm going to have the error message in my console. Now let's take a look at how to handle the error in promises. So let me get rid of this statement and just copy some code and paste it here. And now let me explain this code. Now you can notice this is the promises code. I'm going to first create this method, do something. And just after that, I'm going to call a method then. So once the processing of this do something method is finished, I'm going to execute this then method. Inside this then, I'm going to return this do something to method. So this will execute this do something to with catch object. So if, if there is any error inside this do something to, it will execute this catch block. And when this then method find any error inside this function, this will just break this chain and will not execute this then method. Instead, it will execute this catch block. The same goes for the second method as well. If this method will not return any error, then this do something will move to the next then method right here and execute this then method. And inside it, if this returns an error message, it will execute this catch block and exit from this chain and print this message to the user. So this is a very simple example of promises. Now you're not limited to only use exception handling in promises or in standard JavaScript. You can use it for sync and await functions as well. Let me show you how you can do it. Here I'm going to create a sync function and specify name to it, some function. Inside it, I'm going to call try block. And inside this try block, I'm going to say await and just call this function. Just after this try block, I'm going to call this catch block. So if this statement return any error message, it's going to execute this catch block and print this error message on the console. So these are some simple examples of exception handling. Next, we'll start learning Express.js. In the previous lectures, we understand all about Node.js. Now, from this lecture, we're going to understand what is Express.js. Or you can say, what is Express Framework? So what is Express Framework? Express.js is a web application framework for Node.js. It provides various features that makes web application development fast and easy, which otherwise takes more time using only Node.js. Express built on top of Node.js. So any functionality of Node can be used in Express application. Express is similar to jQuery. Developer often have to write boilerplate code and lot of it. jQuery exists to cut down on this boilerplate code by simplifying the API of the browser and adding helpful new features. Express exists to cut down on this boilerplate code by simplifying the API of Node.js and adding helpful new features in Express application. That's basically it. Express is relatively small framework that sit on top of Node.js web server functionality to simplify its API and add helpful new features. So Express is minimal and it sugarcoats Node.js to make it easier to use. Now let me just quickly explain the best feature of Express application. Express application provide convenient basic web server creation or you can say a routing tool which is so essential to bare bones Node.js. It uses very flexible modular middleware pattern where special middleware modules or you can say functions used to process different requests. In Express, we have a new concept called middleware. Express is very friendly to functional programming and it uses the Node.js core concepts, event emitter, sync flow and streams. Express uses all these concepts, so it's super easy to work with Express application. Express can build RESTful APIs faster. Express support MVC architecture with little bit of work. You can also work with HTML templates with Express. 
using PUG or EGS template engines, which reduces the amount of HTML code you have to write for a page. Express also supports the NoSQL database out of the box and pretty much simple implementing it too. Don't worry, you can also create a relational database like MySQL and other languages as well. So before taking your too much time, let's see how to create a simple Express application using Node.js. I'm going to just open the Visual Studio Code editor and here I'm going to open an empty folder inside it. And down here I'm going to create a new folder for Express application. So here I'm going to create a new folder and name that folder Express App. If you want, you can specify any name to this application, that doesn't matter. Inside this Express app, I'm going to create my Express application. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to open my terminal and inside this terminal, I'm going to first change my directory. So I'm going to say here CD and specify Express app. And I'm going to just enter in my Express app directory. Clear the screen. And now here I'm going to create my Express application. So as you know, you need to first initialize this application as npm package. So I'm going to say here npm in it. So this will just initialize this package as npm package. I'm going to specify default values to all the questions. So I'm going to specify hyphen y. When I press enter, this will create the package.json file in my node application. So now once I initialize this package as npm package using this package.json file, let me install my express framework. So let me first open the package.json file. Now, as you can notice, I don't have any dependency inside this project because we did not install anything yet. So I'm going to just close this package.json file and I'm going to install express framework. So here I'm going to say npm install and then specify express like this. And I'm going to just save this express framework as dependency. So here I'm going to say hyphen hyphen save or you can say hyphen s. Both are identical. I'm going to say hyphen hyphen save. When I press enter, this will install this express framework in the node modules folder and here in the package.json file, you will get express as a dependency. Once the express is successfully installed, let's start working with express framework. I'm going to just close this terminal. The npm install command will install the latest version of express framework and install it in the node modules folder. You can check out the express framework inside this node modules folder. Here you can find the express framework with the different dependencies. And now let's create our first node application. So inside this express app, I'm going to create a new file. So I'm going to click on this new file and name this file server.js. As you know, we are working on JavaScript. So I'm going to just specify extension JS. If you want to work on express framework, you need to first require it. So down here, I'm going to say constant express is equal to and you need to require the express framework. So once you install the express framework, you will get the express framework inside this require statement. So I'm going to just require this express and store it in this express constant variable. Just after that, just after this express framework, I'm going to create the express application. So here I'm going to say constant app is equal to express and then specify here parenthesis. So I'm going to call the express class and initialize it to this app variable. So this will create the express application. So now you can use this variable as express app. Now just for that, let me just create HTTP server using express framework. So here I'm going to say app dot get. I'm going to call the get request of HTTP server. So I'm going to call here app dot get and inside this get as a first argument, I'm going to specify the path. So here I'm going to specify forward slash and then say ping. So this is the path of this get request. Just out of that, I'm going to specify comma here. And the second argument is the callback function. So here I'm going to specify parentheses, then specify request and response. Then call the arrow function like this. And inside this request and response, I'm going to just send the response. So I'm going to say here response.send. And here I'm going to say pong. So I'm going to say here ping. And here I'm going to send pong. Just for that, I'm going to just listen to the server on a port. So here I'm going to say app dot listen. And then I'm going to call the port number. I'm going to listen to the server on 3000 port. And then I'm going to call the callback function. So here I'm going to call the callback function like this. And here I'm going to say console.log and then print server 
started on port 3000 like this save the changes and now execute your program your http server is now created if you compare this code with node http server then you can notice we just write few lines to create this http server in express this is super easy to create the http server using express i'm going to save the changes and execute this file so i'm going to open my terminal clear the screen and here i'm going to say node server.js when i press enter this will start the server on port 3000 so let me open my browser and in the url i'm going to search for localhost colon 3000 when i press enter we cannot get anything here because we did not specify this address so i'm going to say here forward slash ping when i press enter as you can notice i'm going to have pong as a result so this will just execute the get request using express framework so if you just take a look at this code then it's super easy to understand this function or you can say this method tells what to do when get request at the given route is called so when you type ping in the browser url this will execute this callback function and return this response message and using this app.listen i'm gonna listen my server on port 3000 if you want you can change this port as well that doesn't matter and using this listen method i'm gonna just listen the server on port 3000 just after that i'm gonna call here a callback function to print message when the server is started so i'm gonna say here server started on port 3000 so when the server is started i'm gonna have this message so you can notice the big difference between a simple node http server and express http server now what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this text and here i'm going to say node express application i'm going to save the changes when i refresh my browser you will notice the changes didn't take to take these changes you actually have to restart the server every time you make the changes that's no fun when you start working on a big project you don't have that much time to restart the server every time when you make changes inside your code to solve this problem we have a simple tool that makes it easy to restart the server whenever we make any changes so let's stop the server first by pressing ctrl c and then i'm going to install a new module so i'm going to say here npm install node mod so i'm going to install node one module inside this express application this will save a lot of time let me show you how i'm going to just install this module as a dependency once this node mon is installed in the node modules folder i'm going to just back to my package.json close this terminal and here i'm going to create my start command so here i'm going to specify comma and as i said earlier if you want to create a different commands you can use package.json file in the script section right here i'm going to create my start command so here i'm going to say start specify colon and in the double quote i'm going to specify nodemon server.js so i'm going to call this nodemon module and call the server.js file clear the screen and here i'm going to say npm start when i press enter as you can notice this command will execute this nodemon module and start the server on port 3000 and now let me just back to my server.js save the changes you can notice we have our changes now let me just make some changes inside this text here i'm going to say express application i'm going to get rid of this node right from here when i save the changes you can notice this node mon server will restart the server automatically when i press ctrl s as you can notice this will restart this node mon server and you will get your updated request so using this node mon module you don't have to restart your server whenever you make any changes inside your node application you just have to execute a command nodemon and specify the file which you want to execute using nodemon module so i'm going to say here nodemon server.js and i'm going to specify this command to the start script and this will execute this nodemon command so this is how you can create a simple express application with nodemon module next we're going to understand what is middleware Middleware is one of the most important concept in Express application. Middlewares is very similar to the request handler you saw in vanilla node application, accepting a request and sending back a response. But middlewares has one important difference. Rather than having just one handler, middleware allows for many to happen in sequence. 
middleware functions are functions that have access to the request and response object and the next function in the application's request response cycle. The next function is a function in the express router which when invoked execute the middleware succeeding the current middleware. We will talk about how to use next after a few seconds. Middleware functions can perform three major tasks making the changes to the request and response object and the request and response cycle and call the next middleware in a stack. Let me show you a very simple example. Now suppose you want to create a login system with authentication. You send a request to the route but before that we call a middleware function that authenticate the user using a request. If the user is valid then use the next function and move further otherwise return response. As I said earlier middleware functions can work with request and response object so you can manipulate response and request object using middleware functions. Let's take a look at a very simple example that explains everything about middleware functions. So here I'm going to simply create a middleware function called mylogger. In this example I'm going to just print log when a request to the app passes through it. So let me just create here a very simple example. So I'm going to first import the express application in this server.js file. So here I'm going to say constant express and as you know to include the express application you need to call the required function and inside it I'm going to say express. I already installed the express framework in the node modules folder so I don't want to install it again. Just after that I'm going to say here constant app I'm going to create the express app so I'm going to say here app is equal to express and using this statement I'm going to call the express class and initialize this app variable as express app. Just down here I'm going to create here a constant variable and name that variable my logger. If you want, you can specify any name to this variable, that doesn't matter. Here I'm going to create a function and pass few parameters. So here I'm going to say request, response, and next. We'll talk about next function after a few seconds. But just for now, just pass these three parameters, specify curly braces, and in this function, I'm going to say console.log and I'm going to print a message locked and then I'm going to call next function. So I'm going to call this parameter right here like this next. Now notice we call here next. Calling this function invokes the next middleware function in this application. This next function could be named anything. If you specify next one then this should be next one. You can name this function anything that doesn't matter but by convention it is always named next. To avoid confusion always use this convention. Now you can notice how easy it is to create a middleware function. This is my simple middleware function which I'm going to use in this application. Now just out of that once I have my middleware function I'm going to use it in my express app. So I'm going to just load this middleware function. So I'm going to simply use here app.use. I'm going to just call a method use to use this middleware function. So in the parenthesis I'm going to pass my logger. Now you can notice to load the middleware function we call app.use. Now once I load this middleware function just down here I'm going to say app.get. I'm going to call a method get and then to the first argument I'm going to specify the route. So I'm going to specify here root route and then specify comma here then create a callback function with request and response object and in this function I'm going to say response.send and I'm going to simply say here home route. So this is a simple get request. Just after that I'm going to say here app dot listen and I'm going to just listen this app on 3000 port and I'm going to call a simple arrow function here to print a message. So I'm going to say here console dot log and see here app started on port 3000. Save this file and now execute it. So to execute this file I'm going to open my terminal and here I'm going to just enter in my express app. So here I'm going to say cd express app and then I'm going to say npm start. As you know I already have this start command inside this package.json file. So I'm going to execute this command. So I'm going to press enter and this will start my server on port 3000. So I'm going to open my browser and here I'm going to search for localhost colon 3000. I'm going to have my response home route. Now let me just back to my terminal and here you can notice I'm going to have here logged message. Now let me refresh my browser. I have a log message again. So whenever every time the app receives the request it prints this message logged to the terminal. So you can notice here 
Whenever we make request using HTTP server, the middleware will always execute. So the middleware is the best place where you can add login and authentication program. Now keep in mind, the order of the middleware loading is important. Middleware functions that are loaded first are executed first. Now let's create another middleware. So let me just stop my server, clear the screen and close this terminal. And down here I'm going to create another middleware. So here I'm going to say constant and I'm going to name this middleware request time is equal to I'm going to specify function to it and pass request response and next function. And inside this middleware, I'm going to say request dot request time. I'm going to create a new property to this request object, request time. And I'm going to specify time to it. So here I'm going to say date. I'm going to call a class date and call a method of it. Now, so this will return a simple current date to this request time property. So once I initialize this, let me call this invert out. But before I call it, let me just call here a next function like this. Just out of that here, instead of home route, I'm going to simply say here current time. And I'm going to just print this property. So here I'm going to get rid of this double quote and specify backtick. And inside this backtick, right here, I'm going to just print my variable. So here I'm going to say request dot request time. So I'm going to call this property using this request object. I'm accessing this property using this request object. And now let me just use this middleware. You can notice I did not use this middleware yet. So I need to add this use method to use this middleware. So down here, I'm going to say app.use and call a middleware request time. Save the changes and execute this file. I'm going to open my terminal and here I'm going to say npm start. When I press enter, this will start the server on port 3000. When I reload the browser, you can notice I'm going to have my current time. The now method is going to return the number of milliseconds elapsed since January 1, 1970. Don't worry about this number. This is the current date. If you want, you can convert this number in human readable format as well. I will leave this as it is because we are focusing on a middleware. So once I reload this browser and here you can notice I'm going to have a message logged. So this will execute this logger middleware first and then execute this request time middleware. As I said earlier, the order of loading middleware functions are very important. We first load this mylogger middleware function and then load this request time. Now, let me explain how these middleware functions are executed in the node application. So when you specify this use method to use this middleware function, the node application will put both these middleware functions in the middleware call stack. In that call stack, he put this mylogger at first position and put this request time at second position. And then the middleware call stack will execute these middleware functions one by one. So it will first execute this mylogger and then using this next function, it moves to the next middleware. So this function tells the middleware call stack to move to the next middleware because the process of the current middleware function is completely finished. So just move to the next middleware. So once we move to the next middleware function, the call stack will execute this request time middleware function. So once the process of this middleware function is completely finished, this next function will tell the middleware function to execute the next middleware function. So when this middleware function moves to the next middleware function, it's going to execute this route and print a message to the user. So this is the very simple way the middleware work in a node application. So I hope you understand how to work with middleware in node. Next, we're going to understand how to work with static files in Express. When building a web server with Express, it's often required to serve a combination of dynamic content and static files. Because Node is not a web browser, it is a server you need to inform which file to use. So to serve static files such as images, CSS files, and JavaScript files, we use the Express static method. This is the built-in middleware function in Express. Middleware functions allows us to work with a request and response object and it also allows us to add many new functionality in the application when you make request. Now let's take a look at how to serve static files in Express application. So for example, let's say you have a folder here inside your application public and in this folder you have all the static files. For example, your CSS files, your JavaScript files and all the images. 
now you want to use these static files in your application. You can just simply use a middleware function for that. So before this request, up here, I'm going to use app.use. I'm going to call a method use because as I said earlier, use method used to call a middleware function. And inside the parenthesis, I'm going to call express dot static. So I'm going to call a method of express application. So I'm going to call here static method of express application. And here I'm going to specify the path where all the static files are located. So here in the single code, I'm going to say public. So using this statement, you tell the web server that use all the static files of this public folder. So this statement will serve static file within a public folder. If you want, you can change your folder name or use a multiple statement to serve a static file from multiple folders. For example, if I duplicate this statement, and if you want to serve static files from images folder, you can specify here images. If you want to serve from the files folder, you can specify here files and things like that. So using this statement, you tell the node application to use static files from these folders. So whenever you want to use the static files, you can specify a root path to that files. For example, if I just print here image tag, then I'm going to use here forward slash to use this image. Now suppose we have this image in this public folder. I can simply access this image using this forward slash. So when you use this middleware function, it serves the static file from a root directory. So you can simply access all your static files using forward slash or you can say from root directory. Now what about serving files that are not in the root directory? For example, in this root directory, I'm going to have a public folder. But inside this public folder, I have another folder called static. And inside this folder, I have this image. Then how do I serve this static file? In this case, we can create a virtual path prefix. So instead of this express static, I'm going to specify argument to this use method. Let me just get rid of this statement. And here, as a first argument, I'm going to specify this folder. Here, I'm going to specify comma and in the single quote, I'm going to specify forward slash public and in this static method, I'm going to say static. So this use method will first take the root path and then take the file from where you want to serve the static files. Now the next problem comes in. What if you change the static folder name or the root folder name? In that case, you need to change the hard coded value as well. For example, if I change this public to something else, I want to change this code as well. To tackle this problem, we have a path module. We already learned that how to use path module. So let's see how to use it. I'm going to just simply require path module up here. I'm going to say here constant path is equal to and require a path module. And just out of that, to use this path module, I'm going to simply create here a variable constant public path is equal to and call the path module and call a method resolve. We already learned that how to work with this resolve method. We call this resolve method and as a first argument, I'm going to call a property directory name. So this will return the current directory name of the project. You don't have to write hard coded value here. And inside it, I have a public folder. So I'm going to say here public like this. So this will just simply return the root path of this public folder. And I'm going to just call this public right here. So if you accidentally change the name of your application, the code still work completely fine. You can notice here, we use here virtual path prefix. So when you want to call any static file, you need to specify that virtual path. So here I'm going to simply say public like this. So whenever you want to call a static method using virtual path, you can simply specify the root folder and then specify the file name. Oops, I included two path modules. Let me just get rid of one of them. So now this is how you can simply serve a static files in Express. We will take a look at how to use these files when we start working on templates. So when we start working on template engine, I will show you how you can use these static files in your Express application. Next, we are going to understand how to work with routing in Express. Routing is one of the most important topic in Express application or you can say in Node application because without routing, you couldn't create any HTTP request. Routing is a very important topic to understand because it enables us to send and get the HTTP request. In the previous lectures, we understand the basic concept of routing using Node. In this lecture, we are going to understand how to work with routing with Express application. What if I say you already created a route 
in the Express app and you already know how to create it. In the previous example, we created a simple route like this. We call the app, then call a method get. And we pass here a route path and the handler function. Now each route have one or more handler functions, which are executed when the route is matched. To create a route, you just need to initialize your Express application and call HTTP request method. For example, just like get, post, delete, put and so on. Now just for that, once you specify the HTTP request, the first argument is the path of your route. So when the user enter the path, the request sent to the server and get the response from the server. Just for that, we have the handler function as a second argument. This function is executed when the route is matched. So this is a very simple syntax of creating route. Now let's take a look at a very simple example to understand how to create a route in Express application. You will better understand routing using example. So I'm going to just create here a simple example to understand how routing work in Node application. So here I'm going to create a variable. So here I'm going to say constant express and I'm going to just require the express application. So as you know, to create express application, you need to first require the express and then I'm going to create the express app. So I'm going to say here constant app is equal to express. So I'm going to just initialize this app with express. Just for that, I'm going to say constant port is equal to 3000. So I'm using 3000 port for the server. I'm going to listen my server on port 3000. Just for that, here I'm going to create a constant variable data is equal to and then pass object to it. Then I'm going to specify ID 1 and name is going to be India. So I'm going to just specify random data inside this data variable. And just down here, I'm going to create my first route. So as I said earlier, to create a route, you need to first access the instance of the express application. So here I'm going to say app dot and I'm going to call HTTP method. So here I'm going to call get method and using this method, I'm going to specify the route. So in the single code, I'm going to specify forward slash. This will refer to the root route, then specify comma and specify the handler function. So when this route is matched, this function will automatically execute. So I'm going to specify parentheses. In the parentheses, I'm going to specify request and response object, then specify arrow. And here I'm going to say response dot end. And here I'm going to say welcome to my home page and if you want you can call the response dot send method as well that's upon you I'm gonna say respond dot and and just out of that down here I'm gonna create my second route so here I'm gonna say app dot get and specify my route path so here I'm gonna specify forward slash about so this is my about page path in the handler function I'm gonna say request and response then call the arrow and inside it I'm gonna say response dot send and I'm going to send here welcome to my about page. I'm going to do the same and create my next route. So I'm going to copy this code, paste it down here and change this route. And here I'm going to specify weather. And I'm going to say here the current weather is nice. I'm going to just start this server. So I'm going to say here app.listen and I'm going to just listen this server on port 3000. So as a first argument, I'm going to specify port this variable and as a second argument I'm going to specify a callback function so we'll get a console message when the server is started so here I'm going to say console.log and I'm going to just specify server is started on port and here I'm going to call my port variable like this save the changes open your terminal change your directory enter into my express app clear the screen and I'm going to just call npm start command. I already have this start command in my package.json file. You can notice here. I have this command in my package.json file. I'm going to execute this command. So I'm going to say npm start and press enter. When I press enter, the server is started on port 3000. So I'm going to open my browser and here I'm going to say localhost 3000. When I press enter, I'm going to have a message. Welcome to my home page. Now let me just check my second route. I'm going to specify here forward slash and say about. When I press enter, I'm going to have welcome to my about page. And if I want to check my weather, I'm going to say weather and press enter. I'm going to have a message. The current weather is nice. So using route, you can send different response to the user. So now suppose you don't want to send this static data. You want to send a variable or a data that is stored in the database. Let's say you fetch the data from your database and you get the data something like this as an object. You store that object in the data variable and now you want to return that data when the route is matched. 
So I'm going to just copy this data variable and instead of this static text, I'm going to return this data like this. Save the changes and reload my browser. When I reload my browser, you can notice I'm going to have my data as a result. Now you can notice here, this is a type of object. You can notice here the content type is an object. What if you don't know what type of response the server is sending? And this may be a problem with response. But there is another way to send response using HTTP server. You can send any data as a response with a JSON type. JSON doesn't matter which data you want to send. It sends response as a JSON type. JSON type of data is widely used over internet or HTTP request. Most of the time when you request something from the server, the server responds with a JSON data instead of the object or any other data type. It always returns the JSON type of data. So let's get this data as JSON type. So now instead of returning this object, I'm going to just return this as JSON type. So here I'm going to say response dot JSON. And in the parenthesis, I'm going to specify my data variable, this one. Save the changes and now reload my browser. When I reload my browser, this will just change this object and return the JSON type of data. This looks like an object, but it is a JSON type of data. Express can also send a file as a response. Express add methods like send file, which lets you to send a whole file as a response. For example, let's say you don't want to return this data. Instead, you want to return a file as a response. So here I'm going to say response.send file. So this method allows you to send a file as a response. So in the double code, you need to specify the file you want to send to the client. So here you can specify your static folder where you have your index.html file. So when you call this route, it's going to display this HTML file as a response. In the next lecture, we are going to understand how to send the file as response using HTTP server and we're also going to see how to create views in Express application. So the next lecture is very important. As you know, websites are built with HTML. They have been built that way for a long, long time. It's often the case that you want a server to dynamically generate HTML. You might want to serve HTML that greets the currently login user or maybe you want to dynamically generate the data table. To create a dynamic HTML, you have different view engines. There are different template engines you can use with Express application to create dynamic HTML. For example, we have EJS, which is stands for embedded JavaScript. Then we have handlebars, bug, and more. For the rest of these examples, we'll use bug. Basically, in template engine, you can use many JavaScript syntax, like if and else condition, you can use for loop, while loop, and so on. The template engine replaces the variable in the template file with actual values and transform the template into HTML file and send to the client. So let's just take a look at a very simple example to create a view in Express application. So I'm gonna first create here constant variable express is equal to and I'm going to require the express application. Just out of that, I'm going to say constant app is equal to express and create an instance of express application. Just out of that, I'm going to say constant port 3000. If you want, you can change this port name and specify your own. Now, just out of that, I'm going to save the changes and install the perk template engine. Template engines are not inbuilt in Node application or you can say in Express application. So I'm going to just open my terminal and here I'm going to first enter in my application using cd command, cd express application. And here I'm going to say npm install and then I'm going to specify the name of the module or you can say the template engine name. So here I'm going to say pub. I want to save this as dependency. So here I'm going to say save. I'm going to pass here save flag with this pub module. I'm going to press enter to install this pub in my application. Once we have this module, let's clear the screen and close this terminal. Just down here, we need to inform the express application from where he needs to get the template files. So here I'm going to simply say app.set. I'm going to call a method set of the instance of express application. And in this method, I'm going to first pass the template engine name. So here in the single code, I'm going to say view engine. Just out of that, specify comma, and here I'm going to specify the template engine pub. To create the views, you need to first create a folder called views. So inside this application, I'm going to create a new folder and name this folder 
views. Now, views is a directory where the template files are located. Now, this is the default directory of template engine. If you want to change this directory, you need to add a set command again with a template directory name. For example, if you change this name of this directory, you need to add another command right down here with the name of the directory. You can notice here we specify views and specify the name of the directory. If you change this directory name, you need to specify that name right here. But I'm going to use the default name views, so I'm not going to add this command here. We are, going to, we are going to use the default name views. So I'm not going to add this command here. Now, just after that, once I install my perk in this Express application, and once I have this views folder, let me just create my index file. So in this folder, views, I'm going to create a new file and name this file index. And keep in mind, you need to specify here perk as an extension. I'm going to specify here perk as extension. Keep in mind, you don't need to specify here HTML because we are going to generate the dynamic HTML file. That is why we are going to use the perk extension. Now here, I'm going to create a simple dynamic HTML using this perk file. If you want to know more about this perk language, then you need to head on to perkjs.org. From here, you can understand how to implement the simple HTML file using this perk language. Perk syntax are different than standard HTML. To create this index page, I'm going to just simply first specify the doc type. So here I'm going to say doc type html and press enter and down here i'm going to create the html tag so here i'm going to say html and press enter in perk language you don't have to close the html tag you just have to specify the tag name and then specify indention when i specify here indention all the tags are created inside this html tag just after that i'm going to just create title express view engine just after that i'm going to specify body and inside this body, I'm going to specify h1 heading tag with the text express application. Or you can specify any text here, that doesn't matter. Just out of that, just out of this h1 heading tag, I'm going to simply create here a paragraph and specify text here express template engine. That's it. You can notice how easy it is to create the HTML page using Pug language. I'm going to save the changes. And now back to my server.js file. So I'm going to simply create here a route to render this page. So here I'm going to say app.get. I'm going to create get request. And to the root route, I'm going to return this page. So here I'm going to create a function with request and response parameter. And inside this function, I'm going to say response.render. I have a method to render templates. So I'm going to say here render. And inside this render, I'm going to first specify the page name. So here I'm going to say index. So this is the name of my file. And then I'm going to save all the changes. Just out of that, here I'm going to say dot listen. I want to listen this on port 3000. And I'm going to just create here a callback function and specify a console message, console.log. And say here server started on HTTP localhost 3000 save the changes and execute this file so i'm going to open my terminal and here i'm going to say npm start as you know i have this command in my package.json file you can notice here i have the start command nodemon server.js so this will execute this command using this npm start i'm going to press enter to start this server you can notice the server is started on http localhost 3000 so I'm going to click on this link and open my application. When I open the browser, you can notice when I open the localhost 3000, I'm going to have the result something like this. I'm going to have the h1 heading tag with a paragraph. So you can notice here, this is super easy to create HTML page using Perg language. Now what if you don't want to specify these hard coded values here? Instead, you want to pass values from the server. You can do that with Perg language. I'm going to get rid of this express view engine from this title and specify here equal to sign and then i'm going to specify variable name title and i'm going to pass this title right here when i render this page so as a second argument i'm going to pass object and to this object i'm going to create title key and to this key i'm going to pass this text like this just out of that i'm going to get rid of this text right from here specify equal to sign and then specify h1 back to the server.js create here a key 
h1 and then specify value to it so i'm going to see here express application just after that i'm going to get rid of this hard-coded text specify equal to sign specify variable name p save the changes open the server file and create here a key p and specify value to it like this save the changes and when i reload the browser i'm gonna have the same result but at this time i'm gonna have this text from the variable instead of hard coded value so when i change this variable name this will reflect to this perk file now i hope you understand how to create a simple view using express application practice with this code to understand how views are created in express application from the next lecture we're going to start the core express From this section, we are going to start the core concept of Express. I introduce what is Express, how to use it, and we also understand how to work with Node.js without Express. And we also took a few major concepts like middlewares, routing, and views. But we just understood the basic concept. From this section, we are going to take a look at the advanced topics of Express application. So let's get started and see what we are going to learn in this advanced section. We are going to first understand what is session. Then we'll take a look at how to create a cookies in Express application. Then we just take a look at what is core middleware, core routing, build our own API using Express. Then we understand the core views. And then we're going to see how to store the data in the database and see how database integration work in Express application. So this is very important section. So we're going to dive deeper into this topic. But instead of learning syntax and examples, I'm going to explain all these topics in real world projects. But before we move to the core concept of Express application, you need to first understand how to create a form in Express application. So in this lecture, we are going to understand how to create a simple form using Express application. So let's see how to create it. So I'm going to just back to my project and here you can notice we already have this project with some dependencies. Here I have Express, Nodemon and Puck. We already installed this module in the previous lecture. So I'm going to use this module in this tutorial. I'm going to close this package.json and open the server.js and here I'm going to first create a simple server. So here I'm going to say constant express is equal to require and then require the express framework. Then I'm going to say constant path and require the path module. Then I'm going to create the express app using the instance of the express class. At the end, I'm going to create a constant variable port is equal to i'm going to say process dot env dot port if the environment variable is not available then i'm going to just specify the default value 3000 just out of that i'm going to create a simple route so here i'm going to say app dot get and to the root route i'm going to return a function with response and request parameter and inside it i'm going to return a simple form so what I'm going to do is I'm going to back to my index.perg file which we created in the previous lecture and here I'm going to create a simple form. I'm going to first specify the doc type HTML then I'm going to create the HTML tag inside it I have title and here I'm going to say hash and in the curly braces I'm going to say title. So I'm going to use the variable value here when I render this file. Now just for that I'm going to open my browser and say here getbootstrap.com and click on this get started and copy this and copy this cdn so we can use the predefined styling for this html template and i'm going to just paste this link tag here like this you don't have to convert this link tag in perg language now just for that just sort of this title here i'm going to say body inside this body i have a division tag with the class text center so in perk you just have to specify here dot to create a class and then specify the class name text center now this is the bootstrap class i'm going to specify to this division tag i'm going to create here h1 heading tag and specify class to it h1 then i'm going to specify padding by 4 and i'm going to simply specify a text to this h1 heading tag so here i'm going to say simple form now this is a simple syntax of perg language so this will just create h1 heading tag with these classes and specify this text inside the h1 heading tag just out of that outside of this div I'm going to create another div so just down here right here i'm going to create a division tag and specify container bootstrap class 
and with this container i'm going to say text center and width is going to be 25 percent so i'm going to add three bootstrap classes now just sort of that down here inside this div i'm going to add a form tab so i'm going to specify here tab to insert the form inside this div keep in mind when working with bug language indention is very important so i'm going to specify here indention to create a form inside this div so here i'm going to say form and in the parentheses i'm going to specify attribute to this form tab so here i'm going to first specify attribute method i'm going to specify equal to sign in the single code i'm going to just return the post request and specify comma and i'm going to say here action action is equal to specify forward slash and say form submit so i'm going to submit this form to this route just out of that inside this form so i'm going to just press here indention like this so all the input tags will insert it inside this form tag so inside this form i'm going to create a simple div with the class form group and inside this div i'm going to create input tag and specify some attributes so here i'm going to say type is equal to text then i'm going to create a name property so here i'm going to say name is equal to username now keep in mind the name property is very important when you want to access the data of this input tag just for that i'm going to specify class here class is equal to form control this is the bootstrap class then specify value value is going to be none and i'm going to specify placeholder now this is for username so here i'm going to say username like this just out of that, I'm going to copy this input tag and this division tag like this outside of this div. Right here, I'm going to create another div with the class form group. But this time, I'm going to change this name to email. And I'm going to change this placeholder as well to email. At the end, I'm going to just duplicate this line like this. And inside this division tag, instead of this input tag, right here i'm going to say input type submit then i'm going to remove this name attribute remove this placeholder and value is going to be submit and i'm going to just change this class and here i'm going to say btn btn primary now if you want to change these classes that's upon you you can find different classes on bootstrap website save all the changes and back to my server.js file and here i'm going to render this index.perg file so as i said in the previous lecture to render this file you need to use response.render method so here i'm going to say response.render i'm going to specify the file name here index then as you know i have the title variable inside this index file this one i'm going to pass value to this title variable so in the curly braces i'm going to specify title form handling and just after that down here i'm going to start the server so i'm going to say app.listen call the port variable here and call a callback function so i can display a message when the server is started so i'm going to say here console.log and in the back tick i'm going to say listening to request on http localhost and then pass my port variable just save the changes and start the server i'm going to open my terminal and i'm going to just enter in my express app like this and say npm start i already have this command in my package.json file so i'm not going to worry about anything just click on this link and open your server now here's the problem response render is not a function oops i forgot to initialize this bug template engine so what i'm going to do is just out of this port i'm going to say app.set then specify the folder views and specify path to it so here i'm going to say path dot join and call the directory name so this will return the project directory name and then specify views folder like this then i'm gonna set the view engine so i'm gonna say app dot set view engine pub and reload the browser oops i'm getting the same error response dot render is not a function let me just check my code yeah right here i just misplace these parameters the first parameter is the request and second is the response and let me just clear this path right from here save the changes and reload the browser that's it now this is working fine 
Now, just for that, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just submit the data using this submit button and get all the data using post request. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to back to my server.js file and here I'm going to create another route down here. I'm going to create a route app.post to get the posted data and then I'm going to specify the route path. When I open the index.perk file, you can notice here I specify here action form submit. So I'm going to just submit all this data to this route. So I'm going to get this data from this route using this post method. So here I'm going to specify forward slash and specify form submit. Just after that, specify comma and say request and response. And inside this callback function, I'm going to say constant username is equal to and to access the submitted data you just have to access the body property so you just need to say here request dot body and to this body you have your input data so i'm going to say here username as you know i have this username input text box so i'm going to just access the value of this username text box using this property username I'm going to duplicate this statement and instead of this username here, I'm going to say email and I'm going to change this variable name to email. Just out of that down here, I'm going to say response.end. Using the backtick operator, I'm going to say your username is and in the curl braces, I'm going to specify username and say add email is and I'm going to just print email. Save the changes back to your project and reload it. And now let me just specify some input inside this simple form. So here I'm going to first specify username daily and then email example at the rate gmail.com. When I press submit, I'm going to have this submitted data on my page. When I click on the submit, oops, the username is undefined. You will get this error because you did not serialize the data. You need to serialize the data when you submit the form. Using encoding, you can serialize your data. So to access this username and send this post data in serialized order, we need to call here a middleware function. So up here, I'm going to say app.use. I'm going to call express middleware and say here express dot URL encoded. I'm going to call this middleware and in the parenthesis, I'm going to pass property extended true. Let me just save the changes and reload my browser. Now, as you can notice, I'm going to have my data. Your name is daily and your email is example at the rate gmail.com. So as you can notice, we successfully submitted the form data and we get all the posted data on the route form submit. In the next lecture, we're going to see what is session. Session handling in web application is very important and it is the must have feature in any web application. Without it, you won't be able to track user and its activity. So in this lecture, I'm going to show you how you can use the session in the express application. Basically, sessions are used to track the user activities. You will better understand how to use session using example. Now to understand how session work in node application, let's create a simple example. As you can notice here, I have the constant variable and I'm going to just require the express application. Then I'm going to create an instance of the express application. And then I'm going to create a constant variable port and specify the port number. And just out of that, here I'm going to say app.listen. And then inside this console, I'm going to say listen to the request on this address. And I'm going to specify this port as a first argument to this method. Now let's understand how to create a session in Express application. To use session in the Express application, you need to install a module called Express Session. So I'm going to just open a new terminal and enter in my express app like this and here i'm going to say npm i for install and say express session and i'm going to just install this module in my express application inside this node modules folder now once i have my session module let me just check that so i'm going to open the package.json file and here i can notice i'm going to have this session express module in my dependency section and now let's set up the session so to set up the session, you need to use the session module as a middleware. So here I'm going to say app.use. So using this use method, I'm going to use the session middleware module. 
and inside this parenthesis i'm going to call this session module but before i specify here session module let me just require it up here i'm going to say constant session is equal to and require a module called express session just are that inside this use here i'm going to say session and then specify parenthesis to the parenthesis i'm going to pass some argument so i'm going to specify here curly braces so here i'm going to first specify secret now this key is going to hold the secret key for the session so here i'm going to say secret and i'm going to just specify here your secret key and down here i'm going to just call a property called receive and to this receive i'm going to specify true and then at the last i'm going to say save uninitialize true now this property is going to force the session to be saved and then we have these save uninitialize this property is going to force a session that is uninitialize to be saved and stored now using this secret property you can store any secret key inside this secret variable and now down here i'm going to create different routes so here i'm going to say app.get i'm going to create get method with a forward slash so this will just refers to the root route and then create here a function with request and response parameter and inside this callback function i'm going to create my session variable so here i'm going to say request dot session and i'm going to create here a session variable name and to this name variable i'm going to specify name john just out of that down here i'm going to say return response dot send i'm going to send the response and here i'm going to say session set to the root route i'm going to create a new session variable called name with this john value and return the response session set just for that i want to get this session variable on different route so down here i'm going to say app dot get here i'm going to say session so i'm going to create here a route session and just specify here a callback function with request and response parameter and when you request on this session route i want to return this session variable so here i'm going to say where name is equal to request dot session dot name i'm going to call my session variable name and specify that to this name variable just so that here i'm going to return response dot send name now save the changes and let me just start the server so i'm going to open my terminal and here i'm going to say npm start when i press enter this will start the server on localhost 3000 let me open the browser when i open the browser you can notice on root route i'm going to have a message session set let me just open my session route so here i'm going to say forward slash session when i press enter i'm going to have my session variable john so i have this session variable stored in my session object if i just say here console.log and print the request dot session save the changes reload the browser then you can notice you have here a session object with these properties to this object you have different properties like path expires the original max age and http only you don't have to worry about this property just close this terminal and just get rid of this console.log now let me just explain this code when I start the server, I'm going to first store the secret key inside this property called secret. Then I'm going to create the get request on root route and then create a variable called name and specify value to it. Then I'm going to send the response session set and then I'm going to create another route and just for that to access the session variable, I'm going to call request.session.name. This will just return the session value to this variable and I'm going to just return that value using return statement. Now, what if I want to destroy this session? Let me show you how to destroy this session. So down here, I'm going to say app.get and here I'm going to specify forward slash and say destroy. Just out of that, I'm going to call here a callback function with request and response object. Inside this request and response, I'm going to say request dot session and call a method of session object destroy. This method is going to destroy this session and as a callback function here i'm going to specify function with parameter error if there is any error you will get the data inside this error parameter inside this function i'm going to say console.log and say 
session destroy save the changes and we start the server now i'm gonna have a message session set then i'm gonna open my session route here i'm gonna have a john and now let me just destroy this session variable so here i'm gonna call destroy when i press enter oops i think i did not return anything here yeah right here i did not return anything as a response so down here i'm gonna say response dot end save the changes reload the browser reload the browser and now the session is set then i'm gonna open the session route here i'm gonna have a message john so the session name variable is created with the value john and now let me just destroy this session variable so here i'm gonna say destroy and press enter when i press enter here you can notice i'm not gonna have anything when i open my terminal i'm gonna have a message session destroy and now let me just open my session route when i press enter i'm not gonna have anything here because now the session is destroyed completely you will not get anything here because the session is completely destroyed now i hope you understand how to work with session in express application in this advanced section i'm going to create a simple example of login and logout with session but for now let's move to the next topic of express which is cookies so in the next lecture we're going to understand how to work with cookies in express Cookies are also one of the most important topic in Node application. Cookies are small data that are stored on a client side and sent to the client along with server request. Cookies have various functionalities. They can be used for maintaining sessions and adding user specific feature in your web application. Now to understand cookies, I'm going to create a simple example and show you how you can store your cookies in your application. So let's create a simple example to understand how cookies work in Node. Here I have a simple structure of HTTP server. So I'm going to first require the express, then create an instance of the app, then specify the port and call the listen method to listen the server on this address. Now to work with cookies, you need to install a module cookie parser. So I'm going to open my terminal and here I'm going to say npm install cookie parser. So using this module, I can create cookies in the application. I'm going to press enter and install this module in my node modules folder. Clear the screen, close this terminal and when you open the package.json you will have here cookies parser. You will have this module as a dependency. Let's close this package.json. So let me first create my basic route. So for the home page I'm going to say app.get and for the root route I'm going to create a simple request and response parameter and just say response.send and here I'm going to say cookies tutorial. Now this is just a simple home route. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple variable and store that variable data inside the cookies. So we need to first require the cookies parser module inside the application. So just after this app here I'm going to say constant cookies is equal to and here I'm going to just require cookies parser. And as you know to use this module I'm going to use the app dot use middleware method and inside this use i'm going to say cookies and specify parenthesis so this will just call a class cookies so this statement is going to allow us to use this module and create cookies so just down here just out of this home route down here i'm going to say app dot get i'm going to create get request and i'm going to create a route set user so this is the name of my route if you want you can change it and here I'm going to set request and response and inside the callback function I'm going to set response dot cookies and in the parenthesis I'm going to create a variable called user data now if you want you can specify any name to these cookies this is just like a variable name I'm going to create a cookies using this method cookies and specify a variable name user data and specify value to it so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable up here. I'm going to say let users is equal to and in the object as a key and value pair, I'm going to say name John and age 28. Now I'm going to store this data inside my user data variable. So 
I'm gonna copy this user variable and pass it as a second argument to this cookies method. So I'm gonna have these values inside this user data variable. So this will just create a cookies called user data and store all these values using this variable. Now once I have my cookies, let me just send a response. So here I'm gonna say response.send and I'm gonna say user data added to cookies. Now just after that, I want to get all this cookies data on a different route. So down here I'm gonna say app.get and to the get request, I'm gonna create a new route called get user. So this route is going to return the cookies data. So I'm gonna say here a callback function, request and response, and create here a curly braces. And inside this callback function, I'm gonna just response with this send method, and here I'm gonna say request dot cookies. That's it. Let me just save the changes and start the server. I'm gonna open my terminal, and here I'm gonna say npm start. When I press enter, this will just start the server. When I open the localhost 3000, I'm gonna have a message, cookies tutorials. This is just a simple homepage route. To set the cookies, we need to call this route, set user. Just out of this root route, here I'm gonna say set user. When I press enter, you can see a message, user data added to cookies. So this will just set a cookies inside the client browser. Now, once we set the cookies, I want to get all that information on this document. As you know, I have this route here, get user. I'm gonna use this route to get all the information of the cookies. I'm gonna say here, get user. When I press enter, I'm gonna have a cookies as a result. So this will return the connect SSID. This is the unique ID to identify the cookies. And this is the variable name, user data. And to this user data, I have this name and age value. So we can easily access this name and this age using this user data cookies variable. Now, once you understand how easy it is to get the cookies, let me show you how to destroy the cookies. So I'm gonna to back to my project and down here, I'm gonna create another route. So here I'm gonna say app.get and to the route logout, I'm gonna create a function, a callback function with request and response parameter and specify curly braces. And inside this callback function, I'm gonna clear these cookies. So I'm gonna say here response dot clear cookie. So this method is going to clear the cookie. So to this method, you need to pass the cookie name you want to clear. As you know, I have this cookie user data. So we need to pass this argument to this clear cookies. So here I'm gonna say in the single code user data. So this statement is going to clear the cookies from the browser. Just after that, I'm gonna return the response. So I'm gonna say response.send and in the double quote, I'm gonna say user logout successfully. Let me save the changes, reload the browser. This will set the cookies. When I say here get user, this will get the cookies information. And when I say here logout, you will see a message user logout successfully. And when you back to the get user, you can notice the cookies is now deleted. You don't have the user data inside these cookies. You'll just get the cookies SSID. Now, I hope you understand how to work with cookies in Node application. Let's create a simple login system and understand how to work with session and cookies. So from the next lecture, we're going to start a new project called login system. In this lecture, we're going to understand how to create login and logout system in Express application. So we're gonna start by creating a design for this login system. I'm gonna add here a panel and inside it, I'm gonna add a title login system with some text. And just out of that, here I'm gonna create two input text boxes for the email and password. When the user specify valid email and password, I'm gonna just redirect the user to the dashboard of the website. Now, let me just show you how this login system work. So I'm gonna just specify my email. So I'm gonna specify here demo email admin at the rate gmail.com and I'm gonna specify password admin123. Now, when I click on this submit button, this will just redirect me to the dashboard. You can notice here, the route is changed to dashboard and I'm gonna have a welcome message on my dashboard. If you want, you can create a new dashboard as well for your website, that's upon you. Here you can notice we have a message, welcome to Express dashboard and this is your username. Now, once you successfully log in to your website, let me show you how you can log out. So, here you can notice I have a button to log out from my website. 
I'm going to just click on this logout button to log out from this website. I'm going to click on it. When I click on the logout button, this will just redirect me to the login system page with a beautiful message log out successfully. Now let me just try with invalid username. I'm going to specify here admin at the rate gmail.com. Let me just change this admin to add gmail.com. Then I'm going to specify password. And when I press submit button, this will just show me a message invalid username. Let me just back to my login page. And at this time, I'm going to specify invalid password. So here I'm going to specify one, two, three. When I click on the submit button, this will just display the invalid username error message. And now let me just back to my login page. So I'm going to get rid of this route and press enter. This will remove the logout successful message from this login page and you will get your fresh login page in front of you. So this is what we are going to create in this project. So let's get started and see how to create this beautiful login and logout system. So let's get started and see how to create this beautiful login system using Express application. So I'm going to just back to my tutorial folder and inside it, I'm going to create a new folder. So I'm going to click on this new folder icon and create a new folder and name this login system. If you want, you can specify any name to this folder that doesn't matter. And inside it, I'm going to create a new file with name server.js. Inside this file, I'm going to create my HTTP server. I'm going to leave this as it is. And let me first initialize this folder as npm package. So I'm going to open my terminal and enter in my login system folder like this. And just for that, I'm going to initialize it as npm package. So here I'm going to say npm in it. And I'm going to pass hyphen y to skip all the questions and create a default package.json file. So this will just create this default file inside my login system folder. If you want, you can change these properties as well. That's upon you. I'm going to leave everything as it is. And now just for that, let me install some modules which you are going to use in this project. So here I'm going to say npm i for install and then I'm going to specify the list of modules I want to install in this project. So I'm going to first install express, then I'm going to install nodemon. Using nodemon, we don't need to restart the server manually. It will automatically start the server. Just for that, we're going to install EJS. Instead of using pug, we're going to use EJS as a template engine. So I'm going to say here EJS and then I'm going to install express session. So I'm going to install the express session module and just for that I'm going to install body parser. This module allows us to return the posted data in JSON format. And just for that I'm going to install the UUID module. This module is going to create a random UUID for your session variable. I'm going to install all these modules so I'm going to press enter. Once all these modules are successfully installed, you can notice in your package.json file, you will get all these modules in the dependency section. So your app is depends on these modules. I'm going to change this start command and I'm going to say here nodemon server.js. Save this file, close package.json, close this terminal. And now let's create a simple HTTP server. So I'm going to say here constant express is equal to require and require the express module. Just start of that, I'm going to say constant app is equal to and call the express class. So I'm going to just create an express app using this constant variable. Just like that, if you want to create a port variable, you can say here constant port is equal to process.env.port. And then I'm going to specify the default value 3000. Just like that, I'm going to create my first route. So this is going to be my home route. So here I'm going to say app dot get i'm going to create get request for the root route and here i'm going to specify a callback function so here i'm going to say request and response and inside this callback function i'm going to simply say response dot render and i'm going to render a simple html page so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new folder inside this login system and inside it i'm going to create a new folder and name that folder views now this is a default folder for this template engine. So I'm going to name this folder views and inside it, I'm going to create a new file with name base.ejs. Now keep in mind, you don't have to specify here HTML. This is a type of ejs file and using this file, we are going to create a dynamic HTML. So throughout this project, we are going to use the ejs template engine. So I'm going to create this file and I'm going to specify this file 
to this render method. So when we call this root route, I'm going to have this file as a result. So as a first argument, I'm going to specify base. And as a second argument, I'm going to specify data to this file. So here I'm going to specify title and specify title to this file. I'm going to say login system. Just after that, you need to initialize this engine before you use it. I'm going to say app.set. As you know, to initialize the engine, you need to specify a method set. And using this method, you can specify the view engine. So here I'm going to specify view engine. And in the single code, I'm going to say EJS. So this is the default view engine I'm using for this project. Just out of that, I'm going to back to my base.ejs file and here I'm going to create a simple HTML5 snippet. So I'm going to press exclamation mark and press tab. So this will just create a simple HTML5 snippet. And here I'm going to specify title to this page. As you know, when I render this file, I'm going to return this title. So I'm going to specify this title right here. So if you want to display this variable inside your HTML file, you have a different syntax. So I'm going to just get rid of this document and add here EJS syntax like this. So you just need to add here angle bracket and inside it you need to add percentage sign and inside it and inside it you can specify the variable you want to display at this position. Now I want to display this title. So I'm going to specify here title like this and don't forget to specify here equal to sign. So this statement will easily display the value of this title variable. Just for that, in the body section, I'm going to create h2 heading tag. And here I'm going to say login system. Let me just save the changes, save this file as well. And now let me start the server. So I'm going to say here app.listen. I want to listen to the server on port 3000. So I'm going to specify here a variable port, call the callback function. And inside this function, I'm going to specify console.log. And here I'm going to print a message listening to the server on HTTP localhost 3000. So when you start the server, you will get this message with this link. So you can easily open your server by clicking on this link. Save this file and start your server. I'm going to open my terminal and clear the screen. And here I'm going to execute a command npm start. So I'm going to execute this start command using npm. I'm going to press enter. So this will just start this server on HTTP localhost 3000. Let me close this package.json and open the server. So I'm going to press control and click on this link. So this will just open the HTTP localhost 3000. So now the server is successfully running. Now just out of that, I'm going to just close this terminal and I'm going to back to my base.ejs. And here I'm going to create a simple design for the login system. Now you can notice this is just a few lines of code in this HTML file, but what if you have a thousand lines of code inside this HTML page. In that case, your project is hard to manage. For this reason, I'm going to just use a simple programming principle called separation of concern. Using that principle, I'm going to separate this code in different files so we can easily manipulate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this code right from here, from the opening body section, grab it. So I'm going to cut this code right from here and create a new file inside this view and name this file header.ejs and inside this file I'm going to paste this code like this. Save this file back to the base.ejs and here I'm going to grab this closing HTML and this closing body and just after that I'm going to create a new file inside these views and name this file footer.ejs and I'm going to paste my closing body and closing HTML here. Just after that I'm going to save both these files and back to the base.ejs and here what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply include both these files inside this base.ejs. I'm going to simply use here ejs syntax like this and inside this syntax I'm going to include my header file. So here I'm going to say include in the parentheses in the single quote I'm going to say header. That's it. You don't have to specify the ejs extension. Just after that I'm going to copy this header and paste it down here like this and just change this header and here I want to import footer. Let me just save the changes. When I reload the file, you can notice nothing will change. But you can notice the code is now more accurate and readable. Next, we're going to design the login system form. 
Now to design this form, I'm going to use Bootstrap library. So I'm going to open my browser and here I'm going to search for getbootstrap.com. Using Bootstrap, you can specify predefined styling to your project. So I'm going to just open the getbootstrap.com and click on this get started. Then I'm going to use this CDN to add this library in my project. I'm going to copy the CDN and paste it in the head section of this website. So I'm going to open the header.ejs and just start with this title. Down here, I'm going to paste this link tag. So I can use all the classes of Bootstrap in my project. Back to the base.ejs and here I'm going to create a simple login page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a division tag and add some Bootstrap classes to it. So to create a division tag, you don't need to specify here div and then specify the class name. Instead, div is a default class in Visual Studio Code Editor. So you don't need to specify div here. If you want to add a class, you just need to specify dot or if you want to add ID, you need to just specify hash. That's it. This will automatically create a division tag with class and ID. Now I'm creating a division tag with class. So I'm going to say here dot and specify class name text center. When I press tab, this will create a division tag with a class text center. If you want, you can add multiple classes as well. Let me show you how you can do that. I'm going to just specify text center and then I want to add my custom class. So here I'm going to specify dot again and say center D. When I press tab, this will create a division tag with two classes, text center and center D. Now, what if I want to add ID with this division tag? So just for that, what I'm going to do is once I specify these both classes, I'm going to specify here hash and then specify ID to it. So here I'm going to say login. When I press tab, you can notice here, I'm going to have two classes and a simple ID. So you can notice this is super easy to create any HTML element in Visual Studio Code Editor. Now, just for that, inside this div, I'm going to create a division tag with the class container. So here I'm going to say dot container as well as I want to add with 25% to this div and I'm going to specify border to it. So I'm going to add border and padding Y 5. So this will add top and bottom padding to this division tag. When I press tab, it's going to add these classes to this division tag. The container is going to specify 80% width to this div and make all the content at the center of the document. The W25 will specify 25% width to this division tag. Then I'm going to specify border class. This will add border to this div. And then I'm going to specify padding by 5. So this will add top and bottom padding to this division tag. Just for that, here I'm going to create another div with title class. And inside this div, I'm going to have my login system title. So here I'm going to create h2 heading tag and specify class right. So here I'm going to specify class font width bold. When I press tab, it will create h2 heading tag with the class font width bold. Oops, I think I misspelled the class here. Font width bold. Just for that, inside this h2 heading tag, I'm going to specify title to this page, login system. Then I'm going to specify padding bottom to this div and save the changes. And load the browser. You can notice I have the result something like this. Just for that, I'm going to back to my project and just after this h2 heading tag, I'm going to create here a span tag and specify here login for the existing user. So this is just a simple message for the user. Save these changes and just after this div, just down here, I'm going to create a new form. I'm going to leave this action attribute as it is for now. And inside this form, I'm going to create input elements. So I'm going to add two input elements inside this form. First for the email and second for the password. So here I'm going to add division tag with the form group class. So this is a bootstrap class to group the elements. So inside this form group, I'm going to add input tag of type email. Then specify class to it form control. So this will add predefined styling to this input element. And just for that, I'm going to specify placeholder. Placeholder is going to be email. And then I'm going to specify name. This is very important property because we're going to access the value of this input element using this name attribute. So here I'm going to say name, email. Just out of this input element, I'm going to create a small tag and specify text, register email address. And to this small tag, I'm going to specify class, which is form text text muted to specify light color to this text and specify text left to move this text to the left side of the container. Save this file. Here you can notice I have this span tag 
this input element and this small tag just after that just after this div here i'm going to create another form group class and inside it i'm going to create input tag but this time this is a type of password and i'm going to specify class form control and specify name password so you can access the password using this name attribute don't forget to specify placeholder and i'm going to specify here placeholder password let me just save the changes reload the browser here i'm going to have input tag with the password field and just out of that just out of this div here i'm going to add a button and this is a type of submit button so i'm going to specify type submit then i'm going to specify class btn btn success so i'm going to add a bootstrap class btn btn success and then i'm going to specify text to it submit save the changes reload the browser and here i'm going to have my button now let me just modify this button a little bit more i'm going to add another class here rounded pill so this will just add this border radius to this button now just for that what i want i want to add my custom styling to this login form so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create my own style.css file and add some custom styling to this project so i'm going to just back to my editor and create a new folder inside this login system and name this folder public because inside this folder i'm going to add css styling and the asset file so inside this public folder i'm going to create a new file and name this file style.css if you want you can create this file inside the css folder as well i'm going to just add this style.css inside this public folder before we add style inside this style.css file we need to inform this server to use this static asset we already know that how to inform the http server to use a static asset so what i'm going to do is just out of this view engine down here i'm going to create a command and say load static assets and here i'm going to inform the http server to use this style.css file so here i'm going to say app.use and here i'm going to create a virtual path so here i'm going to specify single quote and specify forward slash and then specify static so whenever i want to access this style.css i can access it with this static path just for that i'm going to specify the path of the static asset so i'm going to specify the path of this public folder so as a second argument i'm going to specify express dot static and inside this parenthesis i'm going to pass the path of this public folder now instead of specifying the hard coded value here i'm going to use path module so i'm going to just add here constant variable with name path and i'm going to just import this path module so i'm going to say here require path keep in mind you don't have to install this path module path module is pre-installed in node so you just need to require it once i require this path module let me just use it here so here i'm going to say path dot join i'm going to call a method of path module and here i'm going to specify double underscore dir name so this will just return the project directory name to this join method and i'm going to just specify here second argument which is the public folder so i'm going to specify here single quote and say public that's it so this statement will return the path of this public folder to this use method so we can easily load the static asset inside this project i'm going to save the changes and now let me just link this style.css in my header section of this html page so i'm going to open the header.ejs and just after this link tag just after this bootstrap right here i'm going to say link and inside this href i'm going to link this style.css now here i'm going to just specify the path of this style.css as you can notice i just specify here virtual path to this style.css so to add this style.css here you just need to say forward slash static style.css that's it this statement will add this file in the header section of your html page let me just save the changes back to the style.css and let me just check this style is working or not i'm going to say here body and to this body i'm going to specify background color black save the changes reload the browser as you can notice the style is now successfully applied to this project so let me just add some styling to this login system so i'm going to back to my style.css get rid of this body section and here i'm going to first create a class center d which i already included inside this base.ejs right here i have this class to this division tag 
I'm going to just implement this class. So I'm going to open the style.css and to this center div, I'm going to specify padding top 10%. So this will add top padding to this HTML form. As you can notice, this will add some padding to the top section of this form. Just out of that, down here, I'm going to add some padding to the button as well. So I'm going to say here btn, btn success. And then I'm going to add padding 0.4em and 2em. Save the changes, reload the browser. This will add padding to this button. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to change this font family of this login system. So I'm going to open a new tab and open the Google font. And from this website, I'm going to add my favorite font inside this project. So I'm going to select this open SAS and select this regular 400 style. So I'm going to select this style, open the embed and import this font inside my project. So I'm going to copy this import statement with this URL and paste it inside the style.css file up here like this. Just out of that, down here, I'm going to add body and inside this body, I'm going to specify font family. So as you can notice, I have this font family here. I'm going to copy it and paste it right here like this. Save the changes when I reload the browser. This will just change the font family of this login form. Now, just out of that, I want to add some padding to these input elements. And down here, I'm going to add form. I'm going to select form and add padding to it. Padding is going to be 0 for the top and bottom and 3 em for the left and right. Save the changes, reload the browser. This will add some padding to the left and right side of these input elements. Just out of that, I want to just change the size of this span tag. I'm going to back to my style.css. Here, I'm going to say hash login. I'm going to select the login ID this one then select this title and then i'm going to select this span tag so here i'm going to specify dot title and inside it i have a span tag i'm going to select the span tag and specify font size 0.8 em save the changes reload the browser this will just change the size of this span tag now just out of that what i want i want to add background image to this form and inside this public folder i'm going to create a new folder and name this folder assets and inside it i'm going to add my background image so i'm going to just copy this background image and paste it inside this asset folder of my login system project right here like this now when i open my project i can see i have this file inside this asset folder don't worry you can download the source code of this project from the link provided in the description now just for that let me inform this http server that i'm going to use this background.png file inside this project so let me just add here another statement down here i'm going to add app.use and in the single code i'm going to specify the virtual path so i'm going to say here assets and as a second argument i'm going to specify express.static and inside it i'm going to specify path.join and i'm going to just specify the path of this asset folder so here i'm going to specify double underscore directory name so this will return the project directory name and then I'm going to specify in the single code public forward slash assets. So I'm going to specify the path of this asset as a second argument. Now, once I load this asset inside this project, let me just use it. So I'm going to open my style.css. To this body, I'm going to specify background image in the URL. In the single code, I'm going to specify forward slash assets forward slash background underscore png dot png. So I'm going to specify the exact name of this image right here. And as you can notice, I'm using here virtual path assets. Just out of that, here I'm going to specify background size, cover, and background repeat, no repeat. When I reload the project, as you can notice, the background image is now loaded successfully. I'm going to back to my editor, open the base.egs file, and let me just add some padding to this form. I'm going to add a class to it and add padding top three. This will add some top padding to these input elements. Now, as you can notice, we just successfully created a simple login system. Next, we're going to add a login functionality to this form. Once you understand how to create this beautiful login system design, let me show you how you can add a beautiful login logout feature inside this express project. So I'm going to back to my editor and here I'm going to back to my server.js file. And inside it, I'm going to first add the body parser module so here i'm going to say constant body parser is equal to and then call the require statement and call 
the body parser module. We already installed this module in this project, so we don't need to install it again. So just out of this port down here, I'm going to just add app.use and inside it, I'm going to specify body parser dot JSON. And then I'm going to say app.use body parser dot URL encoded and in the parentheses, in the curly braces, I'm going to say extended true. Now let me explain what is this body parser module. Basically, the body parser module is responsible for passing the incoming request bodies in the middleware before you use it. Now, if you don't want to use this body parser in this project, that's upon you. You can skip it and add a simple express middleware to serialize the form data. I already explained how to serialize the data in the previous lecture. Now, just for that, just out of this body parser, I'm going to just require this session module. So here I'm going to say constant session is equal to and require the express session module so i can create a session variable using this module so just out of this app dot use out here i'm going to create app dot use i'm going to call a middleware method use and here i'm going to say session i'm going to pass some properties so in the curly braces i'm going to say secret and to the secret i'm going to specify string so here i'm going to say secret then i'm going to say here receive false and save uninitialize true i'm going to pass these properties to this session module now you can notice here i just specify here hard-coded value secret now what if i want to make this session completely secret from the user i can use the hash value here instead of this string value like this so if you want to make the session completely secret you can use this string right here so as you know I install the UUID module inside this project. The UUID module is going to create this string value with UUID method. So up here, I'm going to say constant. In the curly braces, I'm going to say v4 version 4 of UUID. And then I'm going to specify UUID v4. And I'm going to just specify equal to sign and require the UUID module like this. And don't forget to call this method down here instead of this secret string so here i'm going to say uuid4 specify parenthesis so this function is going to generate the string something like this so this method will make this session completely secret and unique now just for that once you have the session let me just create a simple route that can get the user input from this form check that user input and redirect the user on different pages depending on the user input so down here i'm going to create my different routes but instead of making this file more complicated i'm going to use the programming principle separation of concern and i'm going to just add routes inside a separate file but before we create routes now let me just show you a very simple error you will get when working with template engine let me just change this title and specify here ditl save the changes and here you can notice you're going to get an error message this will just say title is not defined you'll get this error from the ejs template engine because you can notice here in the header you have this title variable so to solve this problem i'm going to just use here if and else condition so what i'm going to do is instead of this title i'm going to simply see here locals dot title so this will just get all the local variables of ejs template engine and here I'm going to check that using this ternary if and else condition. So I'm going to specify here question mark. And if we have value inside this title variable, just return the title variable. So I'm going to specify here title. Or I'm going to specify colon here, return login system. Save the changes. And now when you reload the browser, you can notice you have a login system text here. So this statement is going to execute this false value because we don't have this title variable return from this server so this is how we can easily solve this problem while working with ejs template let me just change this title variable like this now let's move to the section where i'm going to add a different routes to this project so i'm going to create a new file inside this login system so here i'm going to create a new file router.js and inside this file i'm going to create a different routes of this project so inside this file, I'm going to first say var express is equal to and require the express module. 
I'm requiring this express module because I want to use the router method. So just down here, I'm going to say var router is equal to express dot router. So I'm going to call this method router to create router inside this file. And just down here, I'm going to create a different routes for this project. So I'm going to create my first route for the login user. So here I'm going to say router dot post. I'm going to call a HTTP method post and inside this parenthesis, I'm going to call the route path. So in the single code, I'm going to specify login. As a second argument, I'm going to specify the callback function. So here I'm going to specify request and response parameter. Call the arrow function like this. And inside it, I'm going to send the response when the route is matched. So when the route is matched, I'm going to execute this callback function. So inside this route, I'm going to just simply check the user input. So what we are going to do is when we specify here input inside this email and this password field and when we click on this submit, I'm going to just redirect the user on this login route and I'm going to just get that user input using this request parameter. So down here, I'm going to say if request dot body dot email, I'm going to have this email value inside this variable and I'm going to just check that value with the database value but as you know we don't know the database integration yet so instead of getting the values from the database i'm going to create here a simple variable a constant variable with the name credential is equal to specify curly braces specify email and specify here admin at the rate gmail.com and specify password password is going to be admin123 so i'm going to check this input value with this object so i'm going to say here equal to sign if this input value is equal to credential dot email and i'm going to check the second condition request dot body dot password if this value is equal to credential dot password then execute this if statement otherwise execute this else statement now you just need to assume that we are going to get these values from the database. If the input value and the database value match, I'm going to execute this if statement, otherwise execute this else statement. So in the else statement, I'm going to say response.and and return invalid username. Or you can specify any error message here. That's upon you. Inside this if statement, here I'm going to say request dot session i'm going to create a new session if the input value and the database value match and i'm going to create a new session with the variable name user and i'm going to specify here value request dot body dot email so to this user session i'm going to specify this email now just for that once i have this session variable i'm going to just redirect the users so here i'm going to say response dot redirect and in the parenthesis i'm going to specify single quote and say here forward slash dashboard so i'm going to just redirect the user on dashboard ejs file don't worry we're going to create this file soon but for now let me just save the changes and back to the base.ejs now you can notice here i did not specify the action attribute value so here what i'm going to do is i'm going to specify here forward slash then specify route then specify login so I'm going to specify here route path inside this action attribute and don't forget to specify the method and this is the type of post method so I'm going to specify here post. You can notice here I'm going to redirect the user to this login route when I click on this submit button. So let me just save all the changes and just back to my server.js file and here I'm going to add my route.js file. So up here I'm going to first add a constant variable constant router is equal to require and I'm going to just require dot forward slash the router dot js file so here I'm going to say router and just down here before this home route I'm going to specify app dot use and in the single code as a first argument I'm going to specify forward slash route and as a second argument I'm going to specify router so this middleware will add all these routers inside this server so when I want to execute this login, I want to first specify this route, then specify forward slash, and then specify this login route. You can notice here, 
and just paste over here route forward slash login. So any route included inside this router.js file will start with this route path. Let me just save the changes and right now instead of returning this dashboard, I'm going to just return response dot and and I'm going to say here login successful. Let me just save the changes, reload the browser. Oops, I think I misspelled something. I, I just forgot to export this route. I used to do this type of mistake. So here I'm going to say module dot export is equal to router. So this will just export this router module using this statement, save the changes, save this file as well. As you can notice, this will successfully reload the browser. And now let me just check my login is working or not. In the email, I'm going to specify the database value, this admin dot at the rate gmail dot com like this. And in the password, I'm going to say admin one, two, three. When I press submit, you're going to get a message login successful. And this will create a session variable with your email. But for now, let me just back to my login page. Just load it, specify my email. But this time, I'm going to misspell this password. I'm going to say admin. And when I press submit button, you can notice I'm going to have a message invalid username. Now you can notice the route is now successfully working. In the next lecture, I'm going to show you how you can add a dashboard to this project. And then I'm going to add logout feature to this express application. Just out of that, once you understand how to create a successful login feature to your Express application, let me show you how you can redirect the user to the different route when you successfully log in to your website. So what I'm going to do is instead of this successful login message, I'm going to redirect the user to the dashboard. So I'm going to just uncomment this statement and comment this statement. And I'm going to just create this file inside these views. So here I'm going to create a new file with the name dashboard.ejs. And let me just design this file. So I'm going to first add this header inside this file like this. And then I'm going to copy this footer, paste it down here. And inside this header and footer, I'm going to create a simple dashboard. So here I'm going to create a division tag with the class text center, then add center div and press tab. So this will add these both classes to this div. Just for that, I'm going to just add here margin top, margin top five, and then I'm going to specify ID login. Just down here, I'm going to specify div with the container class and specify width 25%, then specify border and padding by 5 and margin top 5. When I press tab, I'm going to have all these classes to this division tag. Just inside this division tag, I'm going to create a three heading tag and specify welcome to express dashboard. Just out of this h3 heading tag, I'm going to create h5 heading tag. And here I'm going to simply display EJS variable. So here I'm going to add EJS syntax like this and just specify equal to sign to display the variable and say locals dot user. If we have value inside this user variable, just display the user variable. Otherwise display user. Just down here, I'm going to add anchor tag and say here logout. And inside this href attribute, I'm going to specify forward slash route and specify logout route. Now this is my simple dashboard. Now just save this file back to the route.js and change this path. So as you know, I have this route as a path. So don't forget to specify here for the slash route. So when we have the successful login, it's going to create a new session with this username session variable and redirect the user to this dashboard. So let me just create this dashboard route. So just down here, I'm going to create route for dashboard. So here I'm going to say router dot get and to the guest request, I'm going to specify path of the route. So I'm going to say here dashboard and as a second argument, I'm going to specify request and response parameter. And inside this route, I'm going to specify if request dot session dot user, if the session is created and if we have value inside this user variable, just return the response. And I'm going to say here response dot render. And I'm going to just render the dashboard template. And then I'm going to specify the value for this user variable. So here I'm going to say user colon request dot session dot user. And if we don't have this session variable in the else statement, I'm going to specify response dot send in the parenthesis. I'm going to specify unauthorized user. 
Save this file back to the project and reload it. I'm going to just specify my email and password inside these input text boxes. So I'm going to just copy this email and specify that in the email section. And here I'm going to say admin123. So I'm going to pass my password here. And when I press submit, you can notice this will load the dashboard route and you will get the dashboard template as a result. You can notice you will have the username as well on dashboard. So when you specify correct username and password, you will successfully log in to your dashboard with your username. Now let me just back to my login page and here I'm going to specify admin at their gmail.com but at this time I'm going to just misspell this password. Here I'm going to say admin and press submit. When I click on the submit button, this will just return a response invalid username. Now here you can create a separate template for this invalid username response. I'm going to leave everything as it is and just log into my dashboard with admin 123. When I press submit, this will just log in me to my dashboard and create a session variable with the username admin at the rate gmail.com. Now let me show you how you can add the logout feature to this application. So I'm going to just back to my editor and just down here, just after this dashboard, right down here, I'm going to create a command and just say here route for logout. And here I'm going to call router dot get. I'm going to call a get method and as a second argument, I'm going to specify route path. So in the single code, specify forward slash and then specify logout. So this is my route path for the logout feature. Then I'm going to specify the callback function with request and response parameter. And inside this function, I'm going to just say request dot session dot destroy. So when I click on this logout anchor tag, I want to redirect the user to the logout route and destroy the session variable. So we can easily log out from the website. So here I'm going to say destroy. And here I'm going to specify a function, a callback function. So if there is any error, it will just return that error using this parameter. I'm going to just say here error and here I'm going to say if we have error in this error variable, I'm going to just console it using console.log. If you want, you can just send a response using response.send. And in the else statement, if there is no error when we click on the logout, I'm going to say here response.send render and I'm going to render my base file. So here in the single quote, I'm going to say base and I'm going to just specify here two variables. First is the title. As you know, in the header section, I have this title variable. So I'm going to specify the value to this title variable. So here I'm going to say express and then I'm going to create another variable when we click on the logout button. And here I'm going to create another variable logout. So when we click on the logout, I want to display a message on the login page. So I'm going to create here a variable logout and say here logout successfully. Save the changes and just back to your base.ejs and just after this spawn tag right down here I'm going to just add ejs syntax and here I'm going to say if locals dot logout inside this if statement I'm going to print a message but before I create here if statement I'm going to just close it like this using the closing curly braces. So I'm going to create here if statement if this condition return true I want to execute this if statement otherwise I don't want to do anything so here in the if statement I'm going to create a division tag with some classes here I'm going to add some bootstrap classes alert alert success as well as I'm going to specify text center bootstrap class I'm going to just create here a message log out successfully or if you want if you don't want to specify here hard coded value you can use this logout variable so instead of this hard coded value, here I'm going to add ej syntax like this and specify here logout variable. So this will just print the logout variable value inside this if statement. Let me just back to my project and open the login page. So here I'm going to specify admin at the red gmail.com and here I'm going to specify password admin123. When I click on the submit button, you can notice this will just redirect me to the dashboard and when I click on the logout, I want to redirect the user to the login page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just back to the dashboard and here you can notice for the anchor tag, I'm going to specify href attribute route logout. So when I click on the anchor tag, this will just open the route logout route. And when the route is match, this will just execute this get request and render this login page. So I'm going to just back to my project and click on this logout button. When I click on this logout, you can notice this will just redirect me to the login page with this message. 
log out successfully you are not limited to only print this message inside this logout page if you want you can print this message down here or up here that's up on you so when you click on the logout button this will successfully log out from your website and destroy the session variable so you are not able to log in again with the same session id so i hope you understand how to create login and logout system using express application next we're going to create the express middleware application now we understand how to create a simple login system using express application now let's build a simple little application that serves files from the folder i'm going to show you how you can create a folder that serve different files to the requested user user can request html file images or their favorite mp3 song so let me first talk about the requirements for this application your server should log every request whether or not it's successful then the application should check if the file exists in the folder or not if it does it will send that file over the internet it will continue onto the final middleware and the last requirement is if the application didn't find the file it should return 404 message and finish up the request so let's take a look at how to create this simple middleware application in express so i'm going to create a new file inside this tutorial folder so here i'm going to create a new file and name this file middleware app so let me first initialize this file so i'm going to open my terminal and here i'm going to first enter in my middleware app like this and initialize this project as npm package so here i'm going to say npm init hyphen y so this will just initialize this project as npm package just for that i'm going to clear the screen so as you can notice i have this package.json file inside this middleware application let me just install some modules which we are going to use throughout this project so i'm going to use here npm command to install modules and then i'm going to install express and node mod i'm going to install two modules in this express application when i press enter this will install these two modules as a dependency of this project so it will create a node modules folder and inside it i'm going to have this express and node mon module let me just clear the screen open the package.json and let me just create my start command so here i'm going to specify double quote and specify start node mon server.js right now i don't have this file inside my project so let me just create it so inside this middleware app i'm going to create server dot js now just for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a static folder inside this middleware app and in this folder i'm going to put all the files that i want to serve to the user so here i'm going to create a new folder and name this folder static if you want you can specify any name to this folder that doesn't matter and here inside this folder i'm going to create a few files so i'm going to first create cool dot txt file and inside this file i'm going to say express middleware application save this file and close it just after that i'm going to create another file inside this static folder so i'm going to click on this new file icon and here i'm going to say app.json and inside this json file i'm going to create a json format like this and here i'm going to say app and specify value middleware app and just after that here i'm going to specify version version is going to be 1.0 save the changes and now here i have some data inside this file and let me just copy a simple image and put that inside the static folder so i'm going to just copy an image and paste it inside my middleware inside the static folder so here i'm going to paste image and i'm going to just back to my editor now you can notice here i have this pixel.jpg image you can choose any image here that doesn't matter and if you want you can choose mp3 file a video file and other type of files I'm going to serve these files to the user when the user requests these files. Now, once you create this static folder, let me just create HTTP server. So here I'm going to first say constant express is equal to require and require the express module. Just after that, I'm going to say constant path and require the path module. Just after that, I'm going to create constant variable and then I'm going to require the fs module, the file module. So here I'm going to say fs. As you know, we use this module to work with files in Node application. Just for that, here I'm going to say constant app is equal to express and initialize this app variable as express instance. Just for that, here I'm going to say constant port is equal to process.env.port or I'm going to specify the fallback value 3000. 
Just for that, let me just listen to the server on 3000 port. So here I'm going to say app.listen and on port 3000, I'm going to just listen to the server. So I'm going to say here port and in the callback function, I'm going to specify console.log and in the backtick operator, I'm going to say listening on http forward slash localhost 3000. So instead of 3000, here I'm going to specify my port name like this. Save the changes. Now you can notice here, I don't have any route inside this application. I'm not going to create any route inside this middleware application. Instead, we are going to work on middlewares. So here I'm going to create a simple middleware that handle the request and send the response. So I'm going to just simply say here app.use as you know to use middleware, we call the use method. Inside this use method, I'm going to simply pass a function. So here I'm going to say function and don't forget to pass the request and response parameter as well as the next parameter. Just for that, I'm going to specify curly braces and inside this function, I'm going to specify console.log and in the double quote, I'm going to say re request date and I'm going to just concatenate here. So I'm going to add here plus sign and say new date. So I'm going to create an instance of the date class. So this will just return the current date to this console message. Let me just save the changes and start the server. So I'm going to open my terminal. So here I'm going to say npm start. So this will just execute the start command of this package.json file. When I press enter, this will start the server on port 3000. Let me just click on this link and open this URL in the browser. You can notice here your browser will hang. The loading spinner will spin and spin and spin until the request eventually time out and you will get an error message in your browser. That's not good. Let me just back to my editor and when you open your terminal, you can notice here you, you have a console message here, requested date and you will get the current date as a result. So this middleware will log every request whether or not it's successful. So when you execute your application, you will see the loading spinner. That's not good, right? So I need to solve this problem. So when you create a middleware, it needs to finish responding to the request. So to end this process, you can simply use here Inside this middleware, you can simply use response.end or you can use response.send or you can use response.send file. These methods are helpful to finish the response and just for that, it needs to call the next function to continue on to the next function in the middleware stack. And here I'm going to simply say response.send. And I'm going to say in here, welcome middleware app. Back to the browser and as you can notice, the spinner is now stopped and you will get a message, welcome to middleware app. So this will just successfully finish the request. If you want, you can use response.send file or response.end method. Now, let me just get rid of this response and use this next function. So let me just get rid of this response right from here, save the changes. But instead of sending the response, I'm going to say here next. I'm going to call this next function. Let me just save the changes and reload the browser. So you will get an error message cannot get. Now you can notice we successfully tackle the spinner problem from this application. Next, we're going to understand how to serve the static files to the user. Now, once we understand how to finish the process of the middleware, let me just send the response. And as a response, we are going to send these static files. Up here, I'm going to just say response.send file. And in the send file, I'm going to specify the path of these files. When you specify the path of these files, so in the double quote, I'm going to say dot forward slash static and then specify cool.txt. So when you call this middleware, it's going to return this file. But this is not the way you send a file to the user. What if the user don't need this cool.txt file? User need this pixel.jpg file. In that case, you need to create another middleware. Just get rid of this statement. And now let me show you how you can serve the static file to the user. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to check here in the middleware, I wanted to check if the requested file is exist in the static directory or not. If it is exist, respond with the file. In the code term, this is a call to response.send file. If the file doesn't exist, continue to the next middleware in the stack. In code terms, this will just call a next middleware. Now let's turn this requirement into code. 
we are going to use the node built-in module called path. This module helps us to get the path of the requested URL. To determine whether the file is exist or not, we are going to use this module. Let me just show you how you can use this module in this middleware application. So just out of that, just out of this middleware, I'm going to create here another middleware. I'm going to say here app.use and create a function inside it. And to this function, I'm going to specify request and response parameter with next function. Now you can notice we have two middlewares inside this application. Once the process of this middleware finish, this will call the next function and execute this next middleware. So inside this middleware, I'm going to just simply create a variable var file path and I'm going to specify equal to sign and here I'm going to say path dot join. I'm going to call a method of path module and here I'm going to specify double underscore directory name. As you know, this variable is going to return the project directory name. So this will return this middleware app as a result. Just for that, I'm going to specify comma and join my next path. So here in the double quote, I'm going to specify static, this folder name. And just after that, I'm going to specify comma and say here request.url. I'm getting the URL from the user. When the user specify URL inside this URL section, I'm going to get that URL inside this URL variable and create a path of the requested file. So just out of this statement, here I'm going to say fs dot state and inside it I'm going to say file path I'm going to specify the file path as a first argument and then call a callback function and specify error as a first argument and file info as a second argument now if there is an error while reading the file I'm going to just say here next I'm going to just move to the next middleware and return from this method and just for that down here I'm going to say if in the parenthesis I'm going to specify file info dot is file so i'm going to check here if it is a file then execute this if statement and inside this if statement i'm going to say response dot send file and specify the file path like this and just for that here i'm going to say else statement and specify next so if this condition return false just move to the next middleware function that's it save the changes now let me explain this middleware so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to call here path module to create a path and call here a join method. Inside this join method, I'm going to call directory name. This will return the project directory name. Then I'm going to specify the static folder where I'm going to have all the static files. And then I'm going to say here request.url. So this variable will return the user requested URL. I'm going to join all this path and store it in this file path variable. Just out of that, I'm going to call here fs.state method. And inside it, I'm going to check if if it is valid path, then I'm going to execute this callback function. And to this callback function, I'm going to pass error and file info parameter. So if there is any error, just execute this if statement and exit from this method. And if there is no error, I'm going to just get all the information of the file using this file info variable. So here I'm going to say if file info dot is file, I'm going to check if it is a file, then just return it with this response dot send file method. And as a parameter, I'm going to pass this file path. And just for that in the else statement, if it is not a file, just move to the next middleware. Let me just save the changes. Open the browser. So let me just request this cool.txt file. So I'm going to specify here forward slash and say here cool.txt. So I'm going to just request this file to get the data of this file. You can notice I'm going to have a data of this file as a result. So this URL will send the data of this file to the user. Now let me just check for this app.json file. Here I'm going to say app.json and press enter. When I press enter, you can notice I'm going to have the data of app.json file. Let me just request for this pixel.jpg file. So here I'm going to say pixel.jpg. When I press enter, as you can notice, this will just send me an image as a response. Now what if you request a file that is not exist in your server? For example, if I see here pixel1.jpg, and when I press enter, you will get an error message. Cannot get pixel.jpg file. Now, let me just solve this problem. So, let's add a final middleware that can handle this problem. So, let's add the 404 middleware handler. The 404 handler shows the next listening is the last function in your middleware stack. It always send an 404 error no matter what. So, I'm going to back to my editor and down here at the end, I'm going to say app.use and here, I'm going to pass a function 
with request and response parameter. Here I'm not going to specify next function. And inside it, I'm going to specify response.status. And in the parenthesis, I'm going to say 404. So this is the error code. And then I'm going to say response.send. And in the parenthesis, I'm going to say file not found. If you want, you can return a template as well as a response. You can notice here to this middleware, I did not specify this next function because I already specify here response.send method to end this response. Now this middleware will execute only if the file is not found in the URL. Let me just save the changes back to the browser and just reload it. When I reload the browser, so you can notice this will just return the 404 error message. So if the user specify any invalid URL, he will get file not found error message. This middleware is very useful when we work on the big project when the user specify invalid path in the URL. So now if the user visit the URL that doesn't have a corresponding file, you should see a message file not found. You will see this message every time when you visit the URL you doesn't have. Now for a moment, let's try moving this middleware at the top of this file. So let me just cut this middleware right from here and paste it at the top up here like this. I'm going to just make it the first middleware in the stack instead of the last. Now let me just save the changes and reload the browser. You're going to see a message file not found because we don't have this URL. So let me just specify the URL that is valid. Here I'm going to say pixel.jpg. When I press enter, you will get the same message file not found. If I say here cool.txt, you will get the same message. You can notice here if you just put this middleware at the top of your file, you will get the same message. This will always execute this middleware. If you return your app, you will see that you will always get 404 error message, no matter what you specify in this URL. The order of the middleware stack is very important. So make sure your request flow through in a proper order. Let me just get rid of this 404 middleware right from here and paste it down here at their position. So I hope you're creating this simple application. You understand how to work with middleware in node application. Next, we are going to create a simple logger app. Now, in this lecture, we are going to create a simple application that describe you how to work with Morgan module in node application. A common piece of advice in software development is don't reinvent the wheel. If someone else has already solved your problem, it's often a good idea to take their solution and move on to the better things. That is what basically we are doing here. We are going to remove the hard work and use a piece of middleware called Morgan. Morgan is basically a logger. On any request being made, it generates a log automatically. Morgan is a popular HTTP request middleware logger for Node.js and basically used as a logger. Morgan is going to log a message on the console whenever you make a request, no matter what the request is. Morgan describes itself as request logger middleware, which is exactly what you want. Morgan is third party middleware. So we need to install it and use it using app.use method. So let's create a simple app that will add an ID to all the requests and display it using the ID token. So we're going to understand how to work with Morgan completely in this project. So I'm going to create a new project here. So I'm going to click on this new folder icon and specify name for this project. I'm going to say here Morgan app and I'm going to just open a terminal and enter in my Morgan app like this. And I'm going to say npm in it hyphen y to initialize this module as npm package. So this will initialize this folder as npm package. Just out of that here I'm going to say npm install and then I'm going to install some useful module. So here I'm going to say express then I'm going to install nodemon then we're going to install morgan and then we're going to install uu id module. This command will install all this module in this morgan app. So it will create a new folder node modules and install all these modules inside this node modules folder. Let me just clear the screen. Let me create my server.js file. So here I'm going to say server.js. Now once I have my server.js, I'm going to back to my package.json and here I'm going to create a start command. So here I'm going to say start nodemon server.js. Save the changes and back to the server.js. Here I'm going to create my server. So I'm going to first say constant express is equal to require and require the express model. Just after that I'm going to say constant morgan is equal to require and require the morgan module. Just for that, here I'm going to say constant app is equal to express and then I'm going to say constant port 
is equal to 3000. At the last, I'm going to say app dot listen. And I'm going to just listen this app on port 3000. So I'm going to specify here port name. And as a second argument, I'm going to pass a callback function that's going to display a console message. So here I'm going to say console.log and say server is running on HTTP localhost. And then I'm going to specify my port name like this. Save the changes. And now let me just start the server. So here I'm going to say npm start and I press enter this will start the server on port 3000 let me just click on it and open the localhost 3000 now you can see we have an error message cannot get now let me just create here a simple route so here I'm going to say app dot get I'm going to create here a get request for the root route and here I'm going to specify request and response and I'm going to just return a response so I'm going to say response dot and morgan logger Save the changes, you are going to get a message Morgan Logger app. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to just use this Morgan module. As I said earlier, Morgan module is not built in in Node.js. So you need to install it and use it in the application. So here I'm going to say app.use and using this use method, I'm going to use this Morgan module. So here I'm going to say Morgan. And when I call this class, I have different parameters that I can specify inside this parenthesis. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify single quote. And here you can notice I have some parameters here. Combined, common, dev, short, and tiny. These are some useful parameters you can specify with this Morgan. Let me show you what happens if I specify here combine. Save the changes, reload the browser. When I reload the browser, you can notice I have the result something like this. Here you can notice you have the get request, the HTTP version, the Windows operating system, and other useful information. Now you can get all the information of these parameters from Morgan website. So what I'm going to do is here I'm going to say npm Morgan. Here I'm going to just click on this Morgan npm and open the GitHub page. So I'm going to click on this Morgan repository. So this will just open the GitHub page of Morgan module. Now here you can notice we have some documentation. You will understand here how to install the Morgan and how to use it. Now just so that when we call the Morgan class, we're going to get two arguments. First is the format and second is the options. You can notice in the syntax, we have tiny format parameter. When you scroll down, you have all the parameters, combine, common, dev, short, and tiny. These functions, or you can say these tokens, are going to display some useful messages. If you want to print all the information of the logger, you can use this combined token. Or if you want to create short or tiny console message, you can use this short or tiny parameter. And instead of combine, here I'm going to say tiny. When I save the changes and reload the browser, you can notice here, we have a tiny console message. This will just print the requested method, the requested URL, the status, and the response time. Now, when you open the Morgan website and scroll down, here you can notice you have here tokens. Tokens is basically a function. If you want to create a token, you need to specify here Morgan dot token, and then specify the token name and the callback function you want to execute when we call this token in the Morgan class as a parameter. Just after that, when you scroll down, here you can notice we have different tokens, which is the predefined tokens in Morgan module. Date format, HTTP version, method, refer, and you have some useful tokens here. So let me just show you some useful tokens of Morgan. So I'm going to just open my application. And here, instead of tiny, I'm going to just specify here colon method. If you want to call different tokens, you need to specify colon and then specify the token name. Now, this is the predefined token in Morgan module. So you don't have to create it. Save the changes, reload the browser. Here you can notice. So this will just return the requested method as a result. Now, just for that, I want to get the status code as well. So here I'm going to specify space, colon, status. Save the changes, reload the browser, and back to the project. Here you can notice I'm going to have the status code as well, which is the successful 200 code. Now, just for that, what if you want to get the URL? Here you can specify the predefined module, url save the changes reload the browser and here is the result so it will just return the forward slash what if you want to get the http version so here in the double quote i'm going to just print the http version so here i'm going to say http forward slash colon http version so i'm going to just save the changes reload the browser back to the project here you can notice i have the http version 1.1 this is the text i want to display and this is the token now, these are some useful tokens which you can use in Morgan application.
You can find more about these tokens on the GitHub website right here. Next, we're going to understand how to specify unique ID to every request and create access.log file and log all the requests in that file. Now, once you understand how to work with different tokens, let me just show you how to specify unique ID to every request of Morgan. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just simply say here, constant, and I'm going to just require the UUID module. So here I'm going to say version 4 of UUID v4, and then I'm going to just require it. So I'm going to say here require, in the double code, I'm going to specify UUID like this. So this will just import this version for UUID inside this application. Just after that, down here, I'm going to create a function. So here I'm going to say function assign id and inside this function I'm going to specify request and response parameter and specify next function. Inside this function I'm going to just simply say request.id I'm going to create id property of a request object and then I'm going to specify uuid4 method. So this will just return the random id to this id property. Just after that I'm going to call the next function like this. Just after that back to the top up here I'm going to create morgan token. So up here, I'm going to say Morgan dot token. So whenever you want to create a new token, you need to specify here Morgan dot token. So this method allows you to create a token in Morgan module. Just for that, in the single code as a first argument, I'm going to specify the name for this token. I'm going to specify name ID. And as a second argument, I'm going to specify the callback function. So here I'm going to say function, specify name to it, get ID and specify request parameter. Just out of that, inside this function, I'm going to just return request.id. So this function is going to just work on this request parameter and access this UUID using this ID property. I'm going to return to this ID token. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say here app.use and inside it, I'm going to say assign ID. I'm going to call this assign ID function inside this use method. So I can use this middleware inside this project. Just out of that, don't forget to specify this token inside this Morgan to see the result. So as a first argument, I'm going to simply specify colon id. That's it. Save the changes, reload the browser and here you can notice you have the unique id to every request. When I reload the browser, we have the unique id to the second request as well. So using this technique, you can specify the unique id whenever you make any request. Now you're not limited to only specify here request and response parameter. You can specify your own parameters as well. Now just for that, let me show you how to create a simple token in Morgan. So here I'm going to say morgan.token as you know to create a new token or you can say to create a new token function, I'm going to just specify here morgan.token and as a first argument, I'm going to specify the token name. I'm going to specify name param. So this is the name of my token, then specify comma and create here a function. I'm not going to specify any name to this function. I'm going to specify here request, response, and param. So this is my own parameter. Just out of that, I'm going to specify here curly braces. And down here, I'm going to say return. And instead of returning any complicated value, I'm going to just specify here user token. So this token is going to just return this user token string when you make a request. Let me just save the changes and use this token. So down here, inside this Morgan, just out of this id, I'm going to specify here colon and then specify param. So I'm going to specify the name of this token inside this Morgan class. Let me just save the changes and reload the browser. When I reload the browser, you can notice I'm going to have the unique id, then I have the user token text and the rest of the tokens. Morgan module is very useful and creating tokens with Morgan is very important because whenever you want to store any user information, when the user make a request, you can use the Morgan token. Now, getting the user information on the console is not a good idea. That's going to print all the log information of the user. So I'm going to just close this terminal and up here, here I'm going to first require the constant fs and here I'm going to say require. In the single code, I'm going to require the fs module. Just after that, I'm going to require the constant path module like this. And then down here, I'm going to append all the information of this Morgan inside a file. So here I'm going to create a variable let access log. I'm going to create a variable access log stream. If you want, you can specify any name to this variable. 
just out of that i'm going to specify equal to sign then call fs dot create write string so this method is going to create writable stream inside this node application so this method will append all the log information inside a file just out of that i'm going to specify parentheses and here i'm going to say path dot join and as a first argument i'm going to specify the directory name which is the property so this will just return the application path just out of that as a second argument i'm going to specify the file name which i want to create so here i'm going to say access dot log and just out of that as a second argument of this create write stream method i'm going to specify curly braces and specify flags and in the single code i'm going to specify a so this will just append all the information of this log message inside this file just out of that what i want i want to get all this log message inside this access.log file so just down here i'm going to say app.use and inside it i'm going to call a morgan class and as a first argument i'm going to specify the tokens so here i'm going to copy these tokens and specify that here and as a second argument i'm going to specify in the curly braces stream specify colon and call the access log stream variable this one so this option will create this file and append all the information of this log message i'm going to just save the changes and reload the browser and back to the project you can notice i have here access.log file let me just open it when i open this file you can notice i have a data inside it this is the unique id of the request this is the user token the type of method the status and the http version let me just call only the parameter so instead of these tokens i'm going to specify colon param when i save the changes this will just print user token so it's going to print this message now let me just show you what is the use of this access.log file let me just back to my browser and here i'm going to search for a route called api forward slash accounts when i press enter i'm going to have a message cannot get api magic let me just close this access.log and instead of this param here i'm going to call my default tokens save the changes back to the browser and reload it and now when i open the access log you can notice i'm going to have here access token get but at this time the url is going to be api magic but at this time i'm going to get the status 404 this means the user requested a file that is not exist in the application so using this information you can solve that error and understand what is the request of the user and using this technique you can get all the information of the user request if you want you can store all this information inside a database as well that's upon you so i hope you understand how to work with the morgan module in express application so i hope you understand how to work with morgan and create a logger app in express application next we are going to create a routing app Now, in this lecture, we are going to understand how to work with different HTTP methods using routing app. I am going to create a simple routing app and show you how to work with different HTTP method. So, let's get started and see how to create a simple routing app. So, I am going to create a new folder inside this tutorial folder and name this folder routing app. And just after that, I am going to initialize this folder and install some node modules. So, I am going to open my terminal and enter into my routing app. So, here I am going to say cd routing app. Let me just clear the screen and here I'm going to say npm init hyphen y to initialize this package as npm package. When I press enter, this will just create a package.json file inside this routing app. Just after that, let me just install some npm modules. So here I'm going to say npm i for install. I'm going to install two modules. First is express and second is a node mod. When I press enter, this will just install these modules inside this project in the node modules folder let me just clear the screen close this terminal and create a server.js file to create http server so here i'm going to say server.js and inside it i'm going to create my http server so as you know to create a http server you need to first require the express so here i'm going to say constant express is equal to require express just after that i'm going to say constant app is equal to express so i'm going to just create an instance of the express app using this variable just down here i'm going to say constant port is equal to 3000 just for that here i'm going to say app dot listen and i'm going to just listen this port and specify the callback function and inside it i'm going to say console dot log 
and in the backtick operator, I'm going to simply say express server currently running on HTTP localhost and specify the port name. So here I'm going to specify dollar sign and specify the port name like this. Just for that, let me just create here a simple route. So here I'm going to specify the home route. So here I'm going to say home route and say app dot get. So as a first argument, I'm going to specify forward slash. So this will refer to the root route. And as a second argument, I'm going to create arrow function and specify request and response parameter like this. And here I'm going to say response dot end. And in the double quote, I'm going to specify routing app. Open the package.json file. And here let me just create the start command. Here I'm going to say start nodemon, call the nodemon module and specify server.js. So this will just start the npm server and watch this server.js file. Save the changes, open the terminal and here I'm going to say npm start. When I press enter, it will just start the server on port 3000. So when I click on this link, this will just open the browser on localhost 3000 and I'm going to have a message routing app. Close this package.json file. And in the server.js, I'm going to create different routes to explain how routing works. This route is going to create a GET request and send a response to the browser. Now you're not limited to only use GET request. If you want, you can use POST, DELETE, PUT, COPY and so on. There are different HTTP verbs you can use in Express application. In this project, I'm going to use four different HTTP verbs to explain how HTTP requests work. So you can notice here, this is a simple GET request. Instead of creating different routes inside this file, I'm going to create a separate file for routing. So I'm going to create a new file inside this routing folder. So here I'm going to click on this new file icon and say route.js. When I press enter, this will just create a router.js file. And inside it, I'm going to say constant express is equal to require and require the express module. Just start that. I'm going to say here constant route is equal to express dot router so i'm going to call a method of express application now here what i'm going to do is i'm going to create different routes that can handle the data returned from the database we don't know about a database yet so i'm going to just create a simple file that mimic a database so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new file inside this routing so here i'm going to click on this new file icon and name this file database.js and inside this file, I'm going to copy some data and paste it inside this file. You can notice inside this file, I'm going to create a variable let accounts and inside an array, I have this data. Just for that, down here, I'm going to say module.exports and export this variable so I can use it in other files. Now, just close this file and back to the router.js. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my first route. I'm going to create a simple get request. So here, I'm going to say get request so i'm going to create a command get request and here i'm going to create my first request so here i'm going to say route dot get i'm going to call a get request and as a first argument i'm going to specify the path so here i'm going to say forward slash accounts just for that i'm going to specify the callback function with request and response parameter like this and inside it i'm going to just say response dot json and i'm going to just return the response in json format and inside this JSON, I'm going to return my database data. As you know, I have this file database.js. Inside this file, I have all this data. I want to return this data when the user specify accounts in the browser URL. So when, so when the route path is matched, I want to return all this data. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to just say constant accounts is equal to require and I'm going to just require database.js file. So I'm going to specify here database. Just out of that, I'm going to create an object and specify key user data. And to this user data, I'm going to specify value accounts like this. Save the changes. And now when I call these accounts and make a get request, I'm going to have all this data. Let me show you. I'm going to just back to my browser. And here I'm going to say forward slash and specify here accounts. So when we specify this URL in the browser, and make a get request i'm gonna have all this data but before i do it let me just export this route so here i'm gonna say module dot exports is equal to route now once i export this route don't forget to require it so i'm gonna save the changes back to the server.js and 
here I'm going to say constant route is equal to specify the required function and in the double code specify dot forward slash and specify router dot js file like this and just like that you need to use this route so you need to call here the middleware so here I'm going to say app dot use and in the parenthesis I'm going to specify the first argument so here I'm going to specify the path so in the single quote after the forward slash I'm going to say API and as a second argument I'm going to specify route so using this statement I can use this route in my project so let me just save this file save this file as well and here I'm going to say API forward slash accounts and now when I press enter you can notice I'm going to have all the data now you can notice this is very simple to create a get request but what if you want to make a post request working with browser URL to make a request is not a good idea because when you want to make a different request you need to do some extra work so to solve this problem you need to install software tool that helps you to test your API so in this project I'm going to install a simple software tool that can help us to work with different HTTP methods so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a new tab and here I'm going to search for postman and when I press enter, I'm going to have a website www.postman.com. I'm going to open it. And from here, you need to install this Postman tool inside your local system. Postman is a scalable API testing tool. Postman is a popular API client that makes it easy for developers to create, share, and test document APIs. This is done by allowing users to create and save multiple and complex HTTP requests as well as read their response. This is a very useful tool when you work with different APIs in Node. So what you need to do is you just need to sign up on Postman by clicking on this sign up button and download the Postman tool. Once you download it, install it in your local system. I already done that so I'm not going to do it again. So I'm going to just back to my browser and open the Postman. So I'm going to search for here Postman. When I press enter, this will just open the Postman tool to test the API. Once you install the Postman tool, it will look something like this. You have the URL section where you can specify the URL of your request. Then here is the type of request you can make with this Postman and using this send button you can make a request. If you want, you can add multiple tabs here right from here. That's upon you. So to create a new tab, just click on this plus icon and open a new tab. And right here you can specify the URL of the request. So what I'm going to do is, as you know, this request is going to return this data. So I'm going to just copy this request. So I'm going to copy this URL and here I'm going to specify that URL like this. And as you know, this is a type of get request. Just click on this send button. When I click on this send button, you can notice here, I'm going to have the data what I want. We have the well formatted data as a response. On the right side, right here, you can notice a status 200, which is the OK status then you have the response time and the size of data. Now this tool is very useful because using this tool you can make different requests like post, put, patch, delete and so on. There are different HTTP methods you can work with. Using this tool you can make any of these requests. Next I'm going to show you how to add data inside this database variable using post request. Now once you understand how to make a GET request and get all the data from the database. Let me show you how to make a POST request and add data inside this database. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just create here another method. So here I'm going to say POST and I'm going to just make a POST request. Now here I'm going to say route.post. I'm going to call a method POST and in the single argument I'm going to specify forward slash and then specify the path. So here I'm going to say accounts and as a second argument I'm going to specify the arrow function with request and response parameter. Inside this post request, I'm going to get the data from the user and add that data inside this accounts variable. So what I'm going to do is here I'm going to say constant incoming account is equal to request dot body. So I'm going to just get the data from the user using request dot body, store it inside this variable, and just out of that here I'm going to say accounts dot push so using this push method I'm going to push this data inside these accounts so here I'm going to say incoming account so I'm going to just push this data inside this accounts variable I just sort that down here I'm going to say response.json and return the updated accounts 
save the changes back to the postman and here you can notice i have the url but at this time i'm going to make a post request so here i'm going to select post just for that as you know i'm going to just say here request dot body and this is a type of post request so you need to pass some data when you make this request so i'm going to just back to the postman and here in the body i'm going to select the x www form url encoded and i'm going to just pass the formatted data with this request so i'm going to specify here key as you know we have this data so i'm going to just specify the key id and i want to add the id 6 so here i'm going to say id 6 then i'm going to just specify here username is going to be daily tuition then i'm going to specify email email is going to be example at the gmail.com and then specify gender gender is going to be male and status is going to be inactive i'm going to pass this data with this post request without this testing tool you have to create a form with four input html element and using that you need to make a post request on this url but using this tool it's super easy to make a post request i'm going to specify this data to this body variable and then i'm going to get that data and push that data inside this account variable and just return as a response so i'm going to just back to my postman and click on this send button you can notice when i scroll down oops i think i misspelled something yeah right here i just forgot to serialize this data so i'm going to just open my terminal and open a new tab and here i'm going to say npm install and install the body parser module the body parser module is allows us to pass the data inside a body just clear the screen close this terminal and here up here i'm going to say constant body parser is equal to require and inside it i'm going to call the body parser module and just down here i'm going to say app.use to use this middleware so here i'm going to say body parser dot url encoded and in the curly braces i'm going to say extended false open the terminal and here i'm going to say npm start to restart the server back to the postman tool and make a post request so here i'm going to select post and using this account url i'm going to make a post request so when i click on the send as you can notice when i scroll down i have the id 6 with my data so what i did here i'm going to just pass here body parser module and pass all that data inside this body property i'm going to get all that data and push that data inside this account variable and when i make a post request it's going to return all that data with this updated data so as you can see you successfully created a post request in postman now just for that what if you want to get the user data depending on the user id so for example i want to request the data of the second user with the id 2 then how can i do it i want to filter that data and return as a response so using get request i can do that very easily let me show you how to do it so for example i want to get the data of id 2 so here down here i'm going to say route dot get i'm going to make a get request and specify single quote forward slash accounts and just out of that i'm going to specify forward slash colon id as you can notice i just created a variable id so when i make a request i'm going to pass value to this variable just out of that i'm going to specify comma here and create a callback function with request and response parameter and inside these curly braces inside this get request i'm going to just return the requested user data i'm going to say here constant account id i'm going to create a constant variable and specify a class number to convert a string into number just for that i'm going to say here request dot params dot id you can notice here how i access this property the simplest way to grab a parameter is by putting it in your route with a colon in front of it to grab the value you can look inside a param property of request so you can notice here inside this param i have this id when you take a look at this param property then this will just return this id key so i'm going to just access this id key from this param property now just for that down here i'm going to say constant get account is equal to and then i'm going to say accounts and then i'm going to say here find I'm going to call a javascript method find to find a specific object 
and as a first argument I'm going to specify a callback function so here in the parentheses I'm going to specify account then I'm going to specify here arrow and here I'm going to say account dot ID is equal to account ID so if this account ID is equal to this account ID I'm going to just return that data to this get account variable so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the data from this database and compare the ID with this ID so if there is a match it will just going to return that data to this get account variable and just out of that I'm going to get that data and return it so what I'm going to do is down here I'm going to say if in the parenthesis if I don't have that data I'm going to say response dot status status is going to be 500 specified dot here and call another method so here I'm going to say send and specify account not found you can notice here I just call the chain method I just use here chaining I use here a same object to call two methods at the same time just down here just out of this if statement here I'm going to say else and inside this else here I'm going to say response.json and inside this JSON I'm going to specify curly braces to create an object and say user data specify colon and in the array I'm going to say get account just like this I want to create an object so I'm going to just put that inside this array uh, in, inside this object so I'm going to put that inside this and now let me just make a get request but at this time I want to get the data of this third person so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just first uncheck this body and back to the params I'm going to first select the request so here I'm going to select the request get and specify the value to the parameter as I said earlier this is a type of variable or you can say a parameter when you make a request you need to pass value to this parameter here I'm going to specify forward slash and specify 3 I want to get the data of this third person so I'm going to specify here 3 and click on this send button when I click on the send button you can notice I'm going to have the data of the third person so this will just easily filter all the data from your database and return the result what you want as you can notice you created a parameter in routing if you want you can create multiple parameters as well for example if you want to create here a username you can specify here forward slash colon username so when you make a request on this URL you need to pass here two parameters ID and username now once you understand how to work with routing parameters let me show you how to work with put and delete HTTP methods so next we're going to understand how to work with put and delete HTTP method now once you understand how to work with get and post HTTP method let me show you how to work with put and delete HTTP method I'm going to just show you how to update the value of the database using put HTTP method so down here I'm going to create a command put HTTP method I'm going to say route dot put I'm going to call a put method of route and as a first argument I'm going to specify the route path so here I'm going to say accounts forward slash colon ID as you can notice this is the parameter just sort of that as a second argument I'm going to specify request and response parameter and inside this function I'm going to just first get the ID from the requested URL and then I'm going to update that specific URL with a new data so down here I'm going to say constant account ID is equal to then call here a number and then say request dot params dot ID so I'm going to just get this parameter value convert it into number and store it in this variable just down here I'm going to say constant body is equal to request dot body so this statement will return the posted data inside this variable so when I specify value using post body I'm going to just get that data inside this body variable using this put method you can specify parameter value as well as you can pass the body as well to update that data I will explain how this works after a few seconds just down here I'm going to say constant account is equal to then I'm going to say accounts dot find and then I'm going to just find 
the ID. So inside this find, I'm going to call the callback function. So here I'm going to say account, call the arrow. And here I'm going to say account dot ID is equal to account ID. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same technique I used here. I'm going to get the value from the parameter, store it in this variable. Just out of that, I'm going to get the requested user data, find it from this database and store it in this variable. And just out of that, I'm going to update that data with this body variable. So down here, I'm going to say constant index is equal to accounts. I'm going to call the database variable dot index of account. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the index of this of this account variable. So once I have the index of the data, for example, here I have this data on zero index. This is my first index. This is the second and so on. So I'm going to just get this index using this statement. Now once I have that down here, here I'm going to say if if I don't have anything inside this account variable, then I want to execute this if statement. Otherwise, execute this else statement. So inside this if, here I'm going to say response dot status and call the 500 error code. And then call a method send. And inside it, I'm going to specify account not found. If you want, you can specify any error here. That's upon you. And in the else statement, I'm going to create a variable constant updated account is equal to and in the curly braces, I'm going to specify triple dot account, comma, triple dot body. Now, let me explain this statement first. So before I add this statement, let me just comment here. And just after that, here I'm going to say console.log. And inside this console.log, let me first print account variable. And at the end, here I'm going to say response.end and save the changes. Now to explain how this statement work, I'm going to just say here console.log and just print this account variable. Just for that, let me just make a put request. So I'm going to open the postman and here I'm going to first select the put request. So here I'm going to say put, just for that, as you know, this is my request URL. So here I'm going to select API accounts and then pass value to this parameter. I want to update the third user data. So here I'm going to specify three. Just out of that, I'm going to back to the body and I want to update the status. So here I'm going to just uncheck the status like this and just specify here active. You can notice here I have the inactive status right now. I want to update it and make it active. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just return this status using this body variable and update this status property. So once I have my data inside this body, let me just update this account. Down here, just start with this console.log here I'm going to say accounts in the array on index and specify the updated account variable. But for now, let me just specify here a comment like this, save the changes and let me just make a request. So here I'm going to just click on this send button. Oops, I think I misspelled something. Yeah, right here. I just misspelled this account spelling, account ID. Save the changes and let me just make the request again. So I'm going to click on this send button again. And here you can notice I'm not going to have anything here because I just returned the response.end. And you can notice here in the console, I have this result. You can notice this will just return the data of the third person. But what if I put this account inside the curly braces like this? Let me just make a request again. When I click on the send, I'm going to have here account and inside it, I'm going to have that data. So what I'm going to do is I want to update this status message. So as you know, when I make a request, I'm going to pass body to this request. So as you can notice here, I have this body. So I'm going to just update this status with this body. So just after this account, I'm going to specify comma and specify here body like this. Save the changes back to the postman and make a request again to the browser. And here you can notice I have the result something like this. I have the account object and the body object. But now, what I want, I want to merge both this object and update this status property. So instead of using the for loop, I have a simple idea. I can use this triple dot operator. I'm going to just make a combined object using this statement. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify here triple dot like this and save the changes and make request. And here you can notice this will just combine both these object. But at this time, I have this body on a separate property. I want to combine this status and update this status property. So to this body, I'm going to specify triple dot like this. So this will just check this status property inside this object and replace it. So I'm going to save the changes back to the browser, back to the postman and make a request again. Back to the browser and here you can notice I have the updated status. This will just return the status active. So this statement will successfully update your data very easily. You don't have to use any iteration here. This is super easy to iterate over different object and combine two objects. So once you understand how this works, let me just specify here comment and just uncomment this statement like this and uncomment this statement as well. And just start that I'm going to specify here updated account so on index of this account i'm going to pass this data so i'm going to just pass this data to this account on specified index and as a response i'm going to specify updated account so i'm going to specify that right here like this save the changes again back to the browser and make the put request again and i press send oops i think i misspelled something I just specify here response.end instead of response.end just specify response.send to solve this problem just specify here response.send save the changes back to the postman and click on this send button when I click on it as you can notice this will just update this variable with status active if I specify here inactive and when I make a put request this will update the status with inactive and if you want to update the email of this user you can uncheck this body and click on this send button this will update this email as well so this is how you can simply update the user using put request now just out of that let me show you how to delete the data from the database so what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a delete http request to delete the data from the database so let me just close this terminal and down here i'm going to make a delete request so here i'm going to say delete request and just down here i'm going to say route dot delete i'm going to call here a delete method and as a first argument i'm going to specify the route path so here i'm going to specify forward slash accounts specify forward slash colon id as you can notice i'm going to just call here accounts and pass parameter to it id so using this parameter i can access the id which i want to delete so just for that here i'm going to say request and response i'm going to call here a callback function and inside this callback function i'm going to delete that data so here i'm going to say constant account id is equal to call the number and say request dot params dot id so i'm going to get this parameter value inside this account id just down here i'm going to say constant new accounts is equal to i'm going to call this database accounts variable dot filter as you can notice here instead of find i'm going to say here filter and in the parenthesis i'm going to call a callback function so here in the parenthesis i'm going to create another parenthesis to create a callback function and specify here account and inside this function i'm going to say account dot id if it is not equal to account id then just return all that data now let me explain this statement for example let's say you make a request with parameter 3 this will return this third username now what i'm going to do is this statement will filter this database and remove this third parameter and filter this third username and return all the data to this variable to this new accounts variable so once i get the new data i can pass that data to this accounts and update my database so what i'm going to do is i'm going to back to my router and here i'm going to say if i don't have any new accounts i'm going to say here response dot status return the 500 status with a message account 
not found. Just after that, down here I'm going to say else and say accounts is equal to new accounts. So I'm going to specify this updated data to this accounts. At the end, I'm going to say response.send and specify accounts, the updated database. Save the changes. Let me just make a delete request. So here I'm going to select delete and I want to delete this third user data. So here I'm going to specify three. So this will just pass to this parameter and this statement will filter this third username from the database and remove it. Now just for that I'm going to just uncheck this body because we don't need to return any data with this request and back to the params and here I'm going to just click on this send button. When I click on it, whoops, I'm going to get an error message assignment constant variable. Yeah, right here. I just specify here constant. When you specify constant, you can't update the data of the variable. You can notice here I specify here account and update the data with this new accounts. So let me just change this constant to val. Save the changes. And now let me just click on this send button. When I click on it, here you can notice I'm going to have the result something like this. Yeah, right here. I just specify the curly braces here. This is not going to return any data. So instead of curly braces, just specify account ID. If it is not equal to this account ID, this will filter all the data and return to this variable. And instead of this new accounts, here I'm going to say accounts like this. Save the changes, back to the postman and click on this send button. When I click on it, you can notice I'm going to have the result something like this. When I scroll down, you don't have the third ID. Here you can notice I have the ID 2 and ID 4. I successfully deleted the third ID using this delete statement. Now what if I want to delete this fourth ID, this one. I can now specify here, when I click on the send button, this will delete this fourth ID from the database. So this is how you can easily delete the data from your database using delete method. So I hope you understand how to work with different HTTP method in Express application. Next, we're going to understand how to work with MongoDB using Express. Let's take a look at what is MongoDB and how to use it in Express application. I think this is one of the most important topic in Node series. Since now, we have been learning basics and advanced topic of Express, but still something is missing in the application. Till now, we have been storing our data in a variable and when the browser reload, it disappear. In real world applications, we need to store this data somewhere so we can access it later. We can store it in the database. So from this lecture, we're going to understand how to work with MongoDB database with Express application. There is other database as well to work with Express application. Then why MongoDB? MongoDB is a non-relational database. Non-relational database are often called NoSQL database. NoSQL database feels a bit more like JavaScript. Before we understand how to integrate MongoDB with Express application, let's understand what is MongoDB. MongoDB is a database management system designed to rapidly develop a web application. MongoDB stores its information in a document rather than rows. If you're familiar with SQL database, then in SQL, you store your data as rows. MongoDB stores its information in document rather than rows. So what is document? A document is something look like this. Now this is pretty simple document. It's storing a few fields of information about a user. We have the ID, the username, and the email of the user. Consider a case where you would like to store multiple emails for each user. In the relational database like SQL, you might create a separate table of email address and the user which they are associated. So for example, let's say you want to store multiple emails of the user. You can simply edit this document with this. You can notice here, I just created an array and inside it we have two email address of the user. It's just like that you have created an array of email address and solve your problem. MongoDB document format is based on JSON. JSON is an acronym for JavaScript object notation. MongoDB data model is object oriented and it's very useful when working with JavaScript project. Now enough theory, let's take a look at how to work with MongoDB. Let's take a look at how to install MongoDB and how to work with it. So I'm going to just open my browser and here I'm going to search for MongoDB. I'm going to just open a website 
www.mongodb.com and here I'm going to just download the MongoDB from my local system. So I'm going to just click on this try free and right from here I'm going to download the MSI file of MongoDB. So I'm going to click on this on premises and from here I'm going to download the community server. So I'm going to click on this community server and click on this download button to download the MongoDB for my local system. Once I download it, I'm going to open it and start the installation. I already have this file, so I'm not going to download it again. Once you download it, when you open it, it will something look like this. You will get a welcome window of MongoDB. You need to just install the MongoDB server in your local system. To understand how to install the MongoDB server, I already have a dedicated video on it. You can check that video on the top right corner of the screen. I already installed the MongoDB in my local system, so I'm going to just open it. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just head on to my C drive and inside it, I have program files. And inside my program files folder, I have the MongoDB database. Inside this database, I have the server folder. So I'm going to open it, the 4.4 version. And here I have the bean folder. Let me just open it. And these are the important files. I'm going to execute this Mongo file. So I'm going to open here a git bash shell. So here I'm going to right click and say git bash here. When I click on it, you can notice this will open the git bash with the path of this bean file. Inside this git bash, I'm going to say dot forward slash mongo. So this will just execute this mongo file and start the mongodb server. When I press enter, you can notice this will start the mongodb server with unique session ID. Now let me just close the server. So I'm going to press control C and clear the screen. And now let me just get the mongodb version. So here I'm going to say dot forward slash mongo hyphen hyphen version. So this statement will return the mongodb version. When I press enter, you can notice I'm going to have the result something like this. Now you can notice when I execute this command, I need to specify the absolute path of this Mongo file. Whenever I want to work with Mongo, I need to specify this path. So I need to open the bean directory and specify this Mongo path to start the server. I don't want to specify this Mongo path every time when I want to start the server. Instead, I want to automatically specify the Mongo path with Mongo command. So to do that, I'm going to create a new file and create an alias to store this path. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just first clear the screen and here I'm going to say CD and specify tilde operator. This will just open the root path like this. And right here, I'm going to create a new file and store it in this root path. So I can easily execute this Mongo file and this Mongo file. So what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to create a new file. So here I'm going to say touch and specify a file name. So I'm going to create a file dot bash profile. So to create alias, you need to create a file with the prefix dot and specify the file name. So here I'm going to say dot bash profile and press enter. This will create this file on this root directory. Now just out of that, inside this file, I'm going to add alias of this mongo and this mongo file. So here I'm going to say beam to enter into edit mode of this bash profile. So here I'm going to say beam dot bash profile when I press enter. So I'm going to just open this file and now I'm going to press I to enter into insert mode. Here you can notice I have here insert mode of this file and inside this file I'm going to create an alias. So here I'm going to say alias mongo is equal to and specify value inside double quote. So inside this double quote I'm going to specify this path. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here and say git bash here. I'm going to copy this path, copy it, close this terminal and specify that inside this double quote like this. And just out of that, let me just specify here backward slash because we have space here. And just out of that inside this bean folder, I'm going to specify forward slash, then specify mongo.exe. So I'm going to specify the path of this mongo file to this mongo alice. Just after that, I'm going to copy this command like this. And on the second line right here, I'm going to paste this command. And just after that, I'm going to change this mongo to mongod. I'm going to change this mongo to mongod. And this alice became mongod. So I'm going to create two alice, mongo and mongod. Just after that, I'm going to save this file. So to save this file, I'm going to press escape and press colon. When I press colon, 
Here you can notice down here I have this colon and then I'm going to say w w to save this file then specify q this will quit the editor without saving this file so i'm going to say here wq so the w will save this file q will exit from this editor and i'm going to specify here exclamation mark to exit from this editor and back to the git bash shell so here i'm going to specify colon wq and exclamation mark when i press enter this will exit from the beam and back to the git bash shell i'm going to close this gate and let me just open this gate again and now let me just call my mongo alice so here i'm going to say mongo hyphen hyphen version when i press enter as you can notice this will easily call this mongo file with this mongo alice so you can easily call this mongo from any path let me just open this gate on my desktop so let me just open my desktop and here i'm going to say git bash here and here you can notice i have the path of my desktop and right from here i'm going to say mongo hyphen hyphen version when i press enter i'm going to have the same result this will execute this mongo file from any path of your computer now once you understand the basic of mongo and how to install the mongodb in your local system next we're going to understand the basics of mongodb once you understand what is mongodb and how to install it in your local system let's take a look at how to work with it so in this lecture we're going to work with mongodb using mongo shell in this lecture we're going to create a database create a simple document and i'm going to update that document and show you how to delete that document so let's take a look at how to work with mongodb using mongo shell so what i'm going to do is i'm going to open my git bash so here i'm going to just say mongo and press enter this will start this mongodb server with a unique session id just for that here i'm going to create a new database as you probably know mongodb store its information in documents which can be printed out as json you would probably like to store different type of documents like users and orders in separate places this means that mongodb needs a way to group documents grouping a document is what we call a collection mongodb divides collections into separate databases let me show you how many databases we have inside mongodb i'm going to just say a command here show dbs this will just print a database list when i press enter as you can notice i have four databases inside mongodb these are the default database and this is my own database just for that i'm going to just create a new database inside this mongodb so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say here use to create a new database and then specify name to it db user when i press enter this will just create a new database so you will get a message switch to db user as you can notice this is the instance of this db user to access this db user you just need to specify db now once this database is created let me just insert value inside it so right here i'm going to just execute a command db dot users users is a document i'm going to create a document users and call a method insert to insert a record inside this user document so here i'm going to say db dot users dot insert and i want to insert username with value split now just for that i'm going to press enter as you can notice i'm going to have a message write result inserted one so this value is now inserted inside this user document now if the inserted succeed you have just saved your first document in the default mongodb configuration this data is now guaranteed to be inserted even if you kill the shell or suddenly restart your machine i will show you that later but just for now just print this data on this mongo shell so let me just execute a command db dot users dot find this command will print all the data of this user document as you can notice i just have this data inside this user document so when i execute this command this will print this user data you can notice here i have this db as a reference of this db user database here you can notice i'm going to just specify here db dot user the document name and call a method find this will just return all the values of the user document and as you can notice i have the id with this value the id field has been added to the document you can think of the id value as a document primary key to uniquely identify the document so this will just uniquely identify this document that is why we have this id key now what if i exit from this terminal let me show you what happen if i exit from this terminal let me just press ctrl c and clear the screen now what i want i want to get my inserted data so what i'm going to do is here i'm going to say 
Mongo and press enter. This will start this MongoDB server with unique session ID. And now I want to get all the data of DB user database. So what I'm going to do is here I'm going to say DB dot users dot find. If you execute this command, you will get an error message because we don't have anything inside this DB variable. So we need to first initialize this DB variable to get the result. So here I'm going to say use DB user. This will just use the DB user database and initialize the DB variable like this. So this command will initialize this DB variable with DB user database. So down here I'm going to say DB dot users dot find. When I press enter, as you can notice, you have the data what you want. Now just for that, what if you want to count the database value? Here you can execute a command db dot users dot count. This method will count the database value. When I press enter, you will get a one because we only have one record inside this user, user document. Now once you understand how to insert value inside the document, let me show you how to update it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to update this value. So down here, I'm going to say db dot users dot update. I'm going to call a method update and inside this method, I'm going to update this value. So I'm going to first specify which value I want to update. I want to update the username. So here I'm going to say username colon and in the double quote, I'm going to specify Smith because I want to update this value. So I'm going to specify here Smith like this, then specify comma and then I'm going to specify curly braces, call the dollar sign and then specify set colon I'm going to call here a set operator and then in the curly braces I'm going to say country in the double quote specify the country name Canada close the double quote and close both curly braces as well as the closing parenthesis when I press enter this will update this record so you can notice here how I use this set operator which is set a single field to the specific value the first argument of this update will find the record from this user document and update it using this set operator. So once you understand how to update the value, let me just show you. Here I'm going to say db.users.find. When I press enter, you can notice I have the updated data. Now what if I want to get the prettier data? Here I'm going to say db.users.find and then I'm going to call another method called pretty. As you can notice, this will just return a prettier data. Now, once you understand how to display data, how to insert a data in the document and how to update it, let me show you how to delete the data. So here I'm going to say db dot users dot remove. The remove method is going to remove the data from the document. So here I'm going to say remove and in the curly braces, I'm going to specify username colon and in the double quote, I'm going to specify which value I want to delete. I want to delete the Smith data. So here I'm going to say Smith, close the curly braces and the parenthesis. So this will delete the first record from this user document. When I press enter, as you can notice, we have the result. So this will just remove this data from this object. So now when I specify here db.users.find, you will not get anything because you don't have anything inside this database. Now just for that, let me just show you how to get the list of collection of the database. So what I'm going to do is here I'm going to say show collection. When I press enter, whoops, I think I misspelled something. Let me just stop the server. Now I'm going to just say here Mongo to start the server again. Then use the DB user database. And then I'm going to say here show collections. When I press enter, you can notice I'm going to have a result users. And if you want to get more details about database, you can use db dot states like this. When I press enter, you will get all the information of your database with this db stats variable. Now, this is just a basic understanding of MongoDB. From the next lecture, we're going to create a complete crude application with MongoDB database. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Daily Tuition. In this complete tutorial, you will understand how to create the crude operation using Express and MongoDB database. So we're going to create this user management system to manage the user. I'm going to show you how to store and retrieve all this data in the MongoDB cloud database. Now let me show you how this application works. The application is very simple to use. 
when you open the application you will get the list of the user from the database now let me create a new user so i'm going to click on this new user button when you click on it you will have a form to create a new user i'm going to create a new user so i'm going to specify name to this user then i'm going to specify email then i'm going to specify gender female and status inactive i want to create this user so i'm going to click on this save button when i click on it i'm going to have the alert message data inserted successfully when i click on ok button this will reset the form and when you back to the all users here you have your user in case you want to update the user just click on this edit button i want to update this user so i'm going to just click on this edit button when i click on it the form will auto field all the user data inside this form so you just need to specify the updated data inside this form so i want to just update this email so here i'm going to just specify test dot com and i'm going to change this status to active now i want to update this data so i'm going to click on this save button when i click on it here i'm going to have a message data updated successfully when i click ok and back to the all users here i have the updated data now once you understand how to create and update the record let me show you how to delete the record from the database so i want to delete this record i'm going to click on this delete button and when i click on it you will have a message do you really want to delete this record? Yes, I want to delete it. So I'm going to press on this OK button. When I click on it, you will get an alert message, data deleted successfully. When you press OK, the record is now successfully deleted from the database. When you finish this tutorial, you will be able to work with server and client side. You will completely understand how to create an API, how to make the Ajax request, as well as you will understand how to work with Axios library. You will be able to work with EGS template engine and you will understand how to work with different HTTP methods and so on. If you are a beginner, then this is what you need. Follow me and join this amazing journey. Before wasting your too much time, let's get started. So, let's get started and see how to create this beautiful express crude application using Node. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to open the Visual Studio Code Editor and inside it, I have this tutorial folder. Inside this tutorial folder, I'm going to create another folder to create my project. And I'm going to name this folder crude app. If you want, you can specify any name to this folder. That doesn't matter. I'm going to name this project crude app. I'm going to create this folder. And inside this folder, I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to name this file server.js. This file is going to allow us to start the server. So I'm going to create a server.js file. You can name this file anything and just out of that i'm going to just initialize this project as npm package so i'm going to open my terminal and enter into my crude application directory so here i'm going to say cd crude app when i press enter this will enter into my crude application directory and here i'm going to say npm init this command will ask me a few questions about this package.json file so it will just ask me to specify the name for this package. I'm going to specify the default name, crude app. Leave the version as it is. Here I'm going to say crude application with express and MongoDB. I'm going to specify description. Just out of that, I'm going to specify entry point server.js. I'm going to leave this as it is. Test command is going to be as it is. I'm going to leave this git repository. Specify keyword crude and I'm going to say here MongoDB press enter then specify my name here as author i'm going to specify the default license and press enter to create package.json file and initialize this project as npm package as you can notice i'm going to have here a file package.json and here i have my information as you can notice here i have the start command node server.js so when you execute this command it's going to execute this server.js file now just out of that what i want i want to install some external module inside this project so i can use it in this crude application so i'm going to open my terminal clear the screen and here i'm going to say npm i for install and then i'm going to specify my packages so i'm going to install a few packages at the same time using a single command so here i'm going to say express in this project we are using express to rapidly develop the node application so here i'm going to say express then i'm going to install morgan as you know, Morgan helps us to log a message every time when we make a request. Just out of that, I'm going to install Nodemon. 
make sure you specify space between these modules. So I'm going to specify here NodeMon. NodeMon allows us to restart the server automatically when we make changes in the project. Just after that, I'm going to install EJS, which is the template engine I'm using for this project. EJS allows us to create dynamic HTML. And just after that, I'm going to install body parser. Body parser module allows us to serialize the data and access the form data using body property. Just after that, I'm going to install .env. .env module allows you to separate the secret from your source code. This is useful in collaborative environment where you may not want to share your database login credential with other people. Instead, you can share the source code while allowing other people to create their own .env file. So once I have my .env, just after that, we are going to install Mongos. Using this module, we are going to connect this project with MongoDB database. And at the last, I'm going to install Axios library. This library makes it easy to make a request in Express application. So I'm going to say here Axios. I want to install all these libraries as dependencies. So I'm going to press enter. Now, as you can notice, we have these packages inside this node modules folder. If you open the package.json, here you can notice in the dependency section, you have all your packages. Let me just clear the screen and just specify here a start command. So instead of node server.js, here I'm going to say nodemon server.js. Nodemon modules allows us to restart the server whenever we make a changes. So I'm going to say here nodemon. Save the changes back to the server.js. And now let's create the project structure. Now let's take a look at how to create project structure of this crude application. So whenever you make a big project in Node or in Express application, you should have the project structure like this. In your application, you should have the asset folder in the root directory where all the assets of your project is located. So inside this crude application, inside this crude app folder, I'm going to create a new folder and name this folder assets where i'm going to have all the assets of this project inside this asset folder i'm going to create a new folder with the name css i'm going to create a css folder and inside this css i'm going to have my css file just after that inside this asset folder i'm going to create another folder with name js so inside the js folder i'm going to create all the client side javascript files just after that inside this asset i'm going to create another folder with name img. So inside this img folder, I'm going to have all the images which we are using in this project. I'm not using any image here, but this folder is just for understanding. Just for that, once you have this asset folder, once you complete this asset folder structure, minimize this asset folder, and inside this crude app, I'm going to create another folder. So here I'm going to click on this new folder icon and name this folder views. Inside this views folder, I'm going to put all the HTML files. I'm using the embedded JavaScript template engine to create a dynamic HTML. So I'm going to put all the HTML files inside this views folder. This is the default folder of view engine of Express. Just for that, I'm going to create here inside this code application. I'm going to create another folder. I'm going to name this folder server. And inside this server folder, I'm going to have all the server side code. For example, inside this folder, I'm going to create my services, model, MongoDB connection, and so on. Once you have your server folder inside it, I'm going to create few folders. Because we are following the MVC pattern of application, I'm going to create few folders inside this server folder. MVC is an application design pattern that separates the application data and business logic from the presentation. MVC stands for Model, View and Controller. The controller mediates between the model and view. So in the MVC pattern, we have Model, Controller and View. You can notice we already have the view folder here. So I'm not going to create that again. And now let's create the controller and model folder inside this server folder. So here inside this server folder, I'm going to create a new folder and name this folder controller. Just for that, inside this server, I'm going to create another folder with name model. Inside this model folder, we are going to work with MongoDB data. Here we're going to perform the data validation, processing data, creating Mongo scheme, and so on. Just for that, we have controller. Inside the controller, we're going to deal with user request for resources from the server. So here in this controller, we're going to create a different functions that's going to send the resources to the user. So as you can notice, we have this MVC pattern. M for model, V for views, and C for controller. Now, just for that, inside this server, I'm going to create another folder. 
this folder is for database connection so i'm going to create a new folder and say database it is always a best practice to separate your code so you can maintain it very easily so once i have this database folder just out of that i'm going to create another folder inside the server and i'm going to name this folder routes inside this routes i'm going to create my different routes just out of that i'm going to create another folder inside this server and name this folder services so as you can notice your project structure is now completely ready inside your project you should have your asset folder the server folder and the views folder now once you have the project structure something like this let's create the http server so let me just minimize these folders and in the server.js i'm going to create my http server now to create the http server i'm going to just back to my server.js file and inside it i'm going to first require the express module so here i'm going to say constant express and call the required function so using this function we can use the express module so using this statement we can use the express module just for that i'm going to create my app so here i'm going to say constant app is equal to express like this i'm going to initialize this app variable as express application just for that here i'm going to just create my default route so here i'm going to say app dot get and here in the single code i'm going to specify root route so when the url match to the root route i'm going to execute the callback function so here i'm going to say request and response i'm going to call the arrow function of es6 and here i'm going to say response dot send and i'm going to send the response crude application just out of that i'm going to just listen the server on port 3000 i'm going to say here app dot listen i'm going to listen this port on 3000 so here i'm going to say 3000 and just out of that as a callback function as a second argument to this listen method here i'm going to call a callback function like this and say console.log and using the backtick operator i'm going to say server is running on http localhost and then specify colon dollar sign and then specify my port name here i'm going to specify 3000 like this save this file open the terminal and as you know we have the start command inside this package.json file here i'm going to execute this command and execute this server.js file so here i'm going to say npm start so this command will execute this node mon server.js and start the http server when i press enter you're going to get a message server is running on http localhost 3000 let me just click on this link and open my application in the browser oops i think i misspelled the l here i misspelled the spelling localhost save the changes let me just click on this link and as you can notice we're going to have crude application as a response now once your server is successfully started let me just make some changes inside this http request what i'm going to do is just after this app i'm going to create here a variable constant port is equal to and i'm going to just store my all details inside the dot env file so here i'm going to say process dot env dot port and if the variable of this dot env file is not available i'm going to just pass the default value 8080 and instead of this hard coded 300 value i'm going to pass this variable like this save the changes open the terminal as you can notice the server is now started on port 8080 because as you know we don't have this port variable inside dot env file so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create dot env file and create a variable inside it and specify value to it right now it's going to specify the default value to this port variable which is 8080 so now your server is running on this 8080 port i'm going to just create a new file inside this crude application and name this file config.env and inside this file i'm going to create my port variable creating a variable inside env file is super easy you just need to specify the variable name and its value using equal to sign so here i'm going to say port equal to sign and then specify the value 3000 so i'm going to specify 3000 value to this port variable let me just save the changes back to the server.js and now let me just save this file as well but as you can notice it's still getting the default port name so what you need to do is you need to specify the path of this config file 
and you need to inform the express server to use the variable of this env file so just out of this constant express i'm going to say constant dot env is equal to require and i'm going to just call dot env module like this and just before this board variable here i'm going to say dot env dot config i'm going to call a method config and inside this parenthesis i'm going to specify the path of this config file so we can use the port variable so here i'm going to say path and then specify in the single code config dot env as you know we have this config dot env file inside the root directory so i don't need to specify any relative path here save the changes so as you can notice this will just start the server on port 3000 dot env module allows you to separate your secret from your source code this is very useful when you work with collaborative environment when you want to share your code with other people so instead of sharing your credential you can share the source code while allowing other people to create their own dot env file now once you understand how to create dot env let's move on so just after that just after this dot env down here i'm going to just add the morgan module so up here i'm going to say constant morgan and call the require statement and require the morgan module just down here just after this dot env i'm going to create here a command log request so as you know morgan module allows us to log a request on the console whenever we make a request so here i'm going to say app dot use and specify the morgan module and inside it i'm going to call the tiny token so let me just reload the browser back to the editor and as you can notice this will just print the type of request the path and the response millisecond now once you understand how to print a log message using morgan let me show you how to add body parser inside this project so let's see how to do it so let me first stop the server because we don't need it and now let me add body parser module now let me just add the body parser module so down here i'm going to say constant body parser is equal to require and require the body parser module and just out of this morgan down here here i'm going to create a command and say pass request to body parser so down here i'm going to say app dot use and inside this parenthesis i'm going to call the body parser module dot url encoded method and in the parenthesis i'm going to specify object with property extended true so this will just pass the request of the content type from url encoded so once you link the body parser module just down here i'm going to just set the view engine so here i'm going to say set view engine and as you know in this project i'm using embedded javascript so here i'm going to say app dot set and in the parenthesis i'm going to first specify the view engine parameter so we can specify the view engine to this express application and then we need to specify the type of view engine i'm using so in the double code i'm going to specify the extension of view engine i'm using ejs view engine so i'm going to specify here ejs if you're using pug or html you can specify here html or pug that's upon you i'm using the ejs template engine so i'm going to specify the template name ejs just so that if you create all your ejs file inside this views folder then you don't have to specify the folder name to this ejs template engine but if you change this views folder for example you create another folder inside this views folder and put all your ejs files inside that folder then you need to inform express to set that folder as a default view engine folder so to do that you need to call a statement app dot set and in the parenthesis you need to specify views as a first argument and then specify the path of that folder so what you need to do is you need to call the path module of node application so here i'm going to say constant path is equal to require and require the inbuilt path module as you know i did not install this path module using npm because the path module is inbuilt in node application you just need to require it so once i require the path module just down here and the second argument i'm going to say path dot resolve i'm going to call a method of path resolve 
and then I'm going to specify here direct root name. So this will just return the project direct root name to this result method. Just out of that, I'm going to specify comma here. And in the double code, you need to specify the folder name where you put all your EJS files. So for example, if you put all your EJS files inside EJS folder, then you need to specify here views forward slash EJS. I'm not going to create any dedicated folder for this EGS file. So I'm not going to add this statement here. So I'm going to comment it. This is just for reference. Now, just after that, once I specify the view engine for this application, just down here, I'm going to just load my asset. So here I'm going to say load assets. I'm going to load my asset using middleware method use. So I'm going to call here use method. And I'm going to first specify the virtual path for these assets. So as you know, we have assets inside this asset folder. So I'm going to specify single code and specify path for this CSS folder. So here I'm going to say CSS, then specify comma, and then say express dot static. I'm going to call the static method of express. I'm going to say path dot resolve and call the directory name. So this will return the current project directory name, specify comma, and in the double code, I'm going to say assets. I'm going to specify this this asset folder name forward slash CSS. So now if you create this style.css file inside this CSS folder, you need to just specify CSS forward slash style.css. Now, for example, let's say you have style.css file inside this CSS folder. Here inside this CSS, I'm going to create a file style.css. And now you want to access this file. So what you want to do is you just need to specify a path like this CSS forward slash style.css. That's it. You don't need to specify the project name, the asset folder, and so on. You need to just specify the virtual path and the file name. That's it. Now, once you understand how to add this CSS styling, let me just load the images and JavaScript files. So I'm going to just duplicate this statement. So I'm going to press Shift Alt Down key two times. And here I'm going to just change this CSS to IMG. This CSS became IMG and this became js like this now as you can notice we successfully load the asset inside this http server next we're going to create views for this express application now let's take a look at how to create html templates for this crude application as you know i already set up the view engine ejs to this crude application so let's create dot ejs files to create html template so what I'm going to do is inside this views folder, I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to name that file index.ejs. As you can notice, I'm going to specify the extension ejs. This is not the HTML file. If you want to learn more about ejs, you can head on to ejs website right here, ejs.co. ejs stands for embedded JavaScript templating. From ejs.co, you can get started with EJS and understand how to work with EJS template. Let me just close this tab, back to my project, and inside this index.ejs, I'm going to create a simple HTML5 snippet. So I'm going to press exclamation mark and press tab. This will simply create the simple HTML5 snippet. And here to this document, I'm going to specify title crude application. Just out of that, inside this body, down here, I'm going to create the header. So I'm going to first create here HTML command and say here header. Let me just close this command to indicate this is the closing header like this. And inside this header, I'm going to create a header tag with ID. So I'm going to specify here hash, specify ID name header. When I press tab, I'm going to have header tag with ID header. Inside this header, I'm going to create a now tag. And inside this now, I'm going to create a division tag with the class container. So here I'm going to say dot container. When I press tab, I'm going to have a division tag with a class container. Just out of that, inside this container, I'm going to create a div with a class text center. I'm going to create all these classes in the style.css file. So don't worry about that. So when I press tab, I'm going to have this text center class to this division tag. Inside this div, I'm going to add anchor tag. I'm going to specify forward slash. This refers to the root route of this application. Just out of that, here I'm going to specify class, now brand, and text dar. I'm going to create these classes in the style.css file. Here I'm going to say user management system. Save the changes. So let me just open my terminal. 
Here I'm going to say npm start and press enter. My server is turning on HTTP localhost 3000. This will return the response crude application. Now what I want, I want to return the response of this HTML file instead of this response. So instead of this response, I want to render this index.ejs file. So what I'm going to do is here I'm going to call a method of response object. Here I'm going to say response dot Render. This method allows us to render an HTML file. So I'm going to say here render. In the single code, I'm going to specify the file name. Here I'm going to say index.ejs. You don't have to specify extension for this file name because we already initialized this view engine with ejs extension. And just for that, don't forget to specify semicolon, back to the browser and reload it. As you can notice, I'm going to have the user management system text. So this will just load the index file on the root route. Let me just change few things inside this index.ejs. I'm going to just get this header and put that header in the separate dedicated header file and bring this footer and put it inside a separate footer file so we can manage it more easily. What we are going to do is inside these views, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to name this include. If you want, you can name this folder anything. Inside this folder, I'm going to create a new file with underscore to indicate this is the partial file of index.ejs. So here I'm going to say underscore header.ejs. To indicate this is the partial file, I'm going to start this file name with underscore. In this header, I'm going to just grab this header right from here, from this closing header, cut it from this index.ejs and paste it inside this header.ejs. Save the changes back to the index.ejs and grab this closing body and this HTML, cut it right from here, create a new file inside this include and name that file underscore footer.ejs and put this closing body and HTML inside this file. Back to the index.ejs and here I'm going to include both these files. So I'm going to just first add a command, an HTML command and here I'm going to say include header. Don't forget to close this command to indicate this is the closing header section of this template. Now inside this command, I'm going to add my ejs syntax to include both these files. So here I'm going to call ejs syntax like this and inside this ejs syntax, I'm going to say include in the parentheses, I'm going to specify the path of my partial files. So in the single quote, I'm going to specify include forward slash then specify the header file like this. And as you know, we have the prefix underscore. So I'm going to specify underscore as a prefix for this file. Just out of that, I'm going to copy this statement and paste it down here. Change this header to footer like this and change this header file to footer like this. Save the changes. And if you open your terminal, then you can notice to make the changes inside your ejs files but the server is not restarted because the node mon is only restart when you make changes in the js files so we need to inform node mon to restart the server whenever we make changes inside these ejs files but instead of informing node mon to restart the server every time when we make the changes inside this file i'm going to create a demo html file and use a live server extension of visual studio code editor I'm going to create .html file and create a complete design inside that file and use the live server extension of VJ Studio Code Editor so we can easily save the changes and restart the server. So instead of restarting the server and reloading the browser, I'm going to stop this server like this, close this terminal and inside this views, I'm going to create a new file just for design and here I'm going to say index.html. Just out of that, inside this file, I'm going to put all this index.ejs code. So here I'm going to call this header like this and this footer. Save the changes and now let me just start the live server. So I'm going to just open my extension of the Visual Studio Code Editor. And here you can notice I have the live server extension in installed in this Visual Studio Code Editor. If you don't have this extension, just search for it in this search extension text box. Just search for live server and open it. I already have this live server, so I'm not going to install it again. Using this live server, 
this will launch a development a local server with live reload feature so whenever you make any changes inside html file this will automatically reflect on the live server you don't have to restart the server every time when you make changes so once i install this live server extension let me just open this file in the live server so i'm going to just right click here and say open with live server as you can notice i'm going to have the same result this is my node application server and this is my live server extension now we are going to work on this live server so let me just close this node application server now just after that once i have this live server let me just start designing this beautiful body section of this website so what we are going to do is once i have the header of this website let me just create the main section of this website i'm going to create html command and say main site let me just copy this command paste it down here and close it inside this main section i'm going to say main and create id to this main tag so here i'm going to say site main i'm going to create a main tag with id site main just after that i'm going to create a container with div and inside this container i'm going to create a box nav class so here i'm going to say dot box nav with this box nav i'm going to add another class dflex and i'm going to add justify between class you can notice here how i specify different classes in the visual studio code editor when i press tab you can notice i have all these classes to this division tag inside this div i'm going to create an anchor tag and specify the path add user so when you click on this anchor tag this will navigate us to this add user url and just for that i'm going to specify here class border shadow inside this anchor tag i'm going to create a span tag with class text gradient just for that here i'm going to create text new user and here i'm going to add an icon as you know i did not included any library inside this project so i'm going to just add a simple library so i can import icons inside this project so i will just back to my browser and open a new tab and here i'm going to search for font awesome cdn so i'm going to link this font using content delivery network so i'm going to just click on this cdnjs.com open this in a new tab and in this tab i'm going to open the font awesome icons this one and i'm going to just back to the cdnjs.com copy this first link all mean.css right from here and paste it in the header section of this website so just out of this title here i'm going to paste this link like this back to the browser and back to the icons fonts and right from here i'm going to first select the user icon so here i'm going to say user and i'm going to select this icon this one user i'm going to right click here and say open in a new tab as you can notice here you can access this icon using this code this one just copy it and paste it wherever you want to add that icon here i'm going to paste that code like this back to the website and as you can notice you have your icon here so this is how you can add different icons inside this project so once you understand how to add these icons inside your project let me just back to my project and just sort of this division tag right down here i'm going to create a simple html command and say form handling and here i'm going to say form i'm going to create an html form and specify the root route to this form so when we click on this form i want to redirect the user to the root route just out of that don't forget to specify method which is post and inside this form i'm going to create my table here i'm going to say table to this table i'm going to specify class which is table inside this table here i'm going to create t head the head of the table with the class t head dark i want to specify dark color to this head section so, so i'm going to specify class t dark inside this head i'm going to create table row in th i'm going to specify id then i'm going to duplicate this th like this change this id and here i'm going to say name this became email i'm going to specify here add the red sign email then i'm going to specify here gender this became status and at the last i'm going to specify here action just down here just after this t head after this closing t head i'm going to create t body i'm going to create a tag t body 
and inside this t body i'm going to create the body of this table so let me just save the changes first back to the project and here you can notice i have my table and now inside this body i'm going to specify data to this table so here inside this body i'm going to create table row and table data i'm going to first specify id so i'm going to specify here one duplicate this statement like this change this second text to username or you can specify name here and here i'm going to specify example at the rate gmail.com then i'm going to specify gender which is male status is going to be active and inside this td i'm going to add delete and edit button so here i'm going to get rid of this one and inside this td i'm going to add delete and update button so here i'm going to create two anchor tags that help us to edit and delete these records so here i'm going to add anchor tag and i'm not going to specify here anything right now so i'm going to specify here hash then specify class btn border shadow and then to access this anchor tag i'm going to add a class update so this will just indicate this is the button for update inside this anchor tag i'm going to create a spawn tag and to this spawn tag i'm going to specify class text gradient then inside this spawn i'm going to add my icon so here inside this spawn i'm going to add i tag with the class pass fa pencil alt so this will import the pencil icon inside this anchor tag let me just save the changes back to the project and here you can notice oops where is my icon oops i think i misspelled here pencil back to the project and here you can notice i have my icon here inside my project let me just close these unwanted tabs back to my project copy this anchor tag completely and paste it down here instead of update i'm going to say here delete i'm not going to specify here any href attribute here so i'm going to get rid of this href attribute because i don't want to redirect the user anywhere just out of that i'm going to just specify icon to this delete so here i'm going to say pass fa times save the changes and here you can notice i have my icon now once i have my design of this html let me just link my style.css file to this index file and style this html page so to style this index file i'm going to just add my style.css file here so i'm going to say here link specify the path of the style.css file so inside this asset i have css folder and this style.css save the changes and back to the style.css and let me just style this index file so very first i'm going to add the font family inside this project i'm going to open a new tab and say google fonts and from this google fonts website i'm going to import some fonts inside this project and use it so in the search box i'm going to search for barlow this font i'm going to select the normal style the regular 400 style i'm going to select this style then back to the main page and i'm going to select pt sans this one i'm going to select this font and i'm going to select this regular 400 so i'm going to click on this select this style and as you can notice i have here two options to import this font inside my project here i have the link tag and the import tag i'm going to use this import tag copy this import statement and paste it at the top of this standard css file like this once i imported these fonts inside my project let me just create some variables so here i'm going to add colon root and inside this root i'm going to create some variables so here i'm going to say double dash dark and specify color to this dark variable and then i'm going to specify the hex value of the color like this so i can use this dark color using this dark variable name so i'm going to create few variables here inside this root directory and just start with that down here I'm going to select all the elements of the HTML and remove padding. I'm going to specify padding 0, margin is going to be 0 and box sizing is going to be border box. Just out of that, I'm going to select all the anchor tags, then specify text decoration, none. This will remove the bottom border from the anchor tags. Then I'm going to specify the font family, so I'm going to back to the Google font and here you can notice I have this PT Sans. I'm going to copy this font family, paste it here, 
save the changes this will just apply this pt sans font family to this text just down here i'm going to create my container so i'm going to create a container class container inside it i'm going to say max width is going to be 10 24 pixel then i'm going to say margin auto this will just center all the content of this container as you can notice this will center this content just down here i'm going to say now brand then specify font size is going to be 1.5 em and font width is going to be bold this will update this title just down here i'm going to say deflex i'm going to create a deflex class and specify display flex then specify flex wrap wrap save the changes you can find this class right here we have this deflex and this justify between oops i think i specify here dash just remove it and separate both these classes back to the style and just down here i'm gonna say justify between then specify justify content space between just down here i'm gonna create a class text center and here i'm gonna say text align center then i'm gonna say border shadow and then specify border one pixel solid and call my variable so here i'm gonna say var double dash and call the variable name border btn just out of that here i'm gonna say box shadow and here i'm gonna say one pixel three pixel and ten pixel as well as i'm gonna specify here hex color to this shadow like this down here i'm gonna create a class text dark this will specify dark color to the text so here i'm going to say color dark just down here i'm going to say inline and specify display inline block so whenever you want to specify inline block display property to the element you can specify this inline class i'm going to say here text light color is going to be light save the changes just down here i'm going to say text gradient and to this text gradient class i'm going to specify text gradient to this text so i need to add some useful css properties to specify gradient color to the text so inside this class i'm going to specify background property to specify liner gradient so here i'm going to say liner gradient and inside this liner gradient i'm going to specify two gradient color so here i'm going to say to write specify comma and then i'm going to specify two gradient colors here just out of that here I'm going to specify WebKit background clip property. This CSS property is not actually supported to the Chrome browser. So I'm going to specify here WebKit as an extension to this background clip property. And here I'm going to specify text. Then I'm going to specify here background clip text. Just down here, I'm going to specify hyphen WebKit text fill color. And I'm going to specify text fill color transparent save the changes as you can notice this will just add gradient color to these icons because we have text gradient class to this html element just down here just out of this class i'm going to create my header section so i'm going to first select the header and then select the nav class inside this nav i'm going to specify background color and i'm going to specify here hex color this one and inside this nav, I'm going to add some padding to it. 1 em to the top and bottom and 0 for the left and right. Then add width, which is 100%. Save the changes. This will just add background color and add some width to this nav tag. Just down here, I'm going to select the side main. Then select the margin top 6 em. So this will add the top margin to this table. And just out of that, I'm going to copy this font family. And paste it here save the changes this will add some margin to this table and add this font family now just for that i'm going to add some styling to this button so i'm going to select first site main then select the container class then select the box now and inside it i have the anchor tag i'm going to select it specify font size 1 em 
and fairing is going to be 0.5 em to the top and bottom and 1 em to the left and right save the changes this will just add padding to this button just out of that i'm going to select the form so i'm going to select this container and this site main selector like this then select the form and i'm going to add some margin to this form so here i'm going to say margin 2 em to the top and bottom and 0 for the left and right just after that just after that i'm going to select this table then specify border spacing 0 pixel and width is going to be 100 just start that here i'm going to select dot table td select all the td element then select the table again and select all the th element and specify padding 0.75 em and then i'm going to specify vertical align top just start that i'm going to specify text align center and border top is going to be one pixel solid and then specify my border color this one like this just out of that i'm going to select the button these ones so here i'm going to say table then select the td class inside it i have anchor tag with the class btn i'm going to select it specify padding 0.3 em to the top and bottom and 1 em to the left and right then add font size 1.1 em and margin is going to be 0 for the top and bottom and 0.2 em to the left and right save the changes this will add some padding to these buttons just down here i'm going to add hover effect on this table so here i'm going to say dot table on tr i'm going to add hover effect here i'm going to say background color and then i'm going to add this background color this one like this save the changes when i hover on this row i'm going to have this background effect just for that as you can notice when i hover on this row i want to remove this background shadow from these buttons so i'm going to select first table then select table row and when i hover on it i want to remove the shadow from the buttons so here i'm going to select table data inside it i have anchor tag i'm going to select that anchor tag and say here box shadow none save the changes when i hover on this row i will not get any box shadow to these buttons just down here i'm going to just make this table dark so here i'm going to select table t head dark i already have this class to the table head section just for that i'm going to select th element and specify color white so here i'm going to specify hex color then specify background color background color is going to be dark so i'm going to call here my dark background variable like this just down here i'm going to specify border color and this is going to be a light color so i'm going to select the hex value and specify that like this save the changes as you can notice i have the dark color to this table head now as you can notice we successfully specify a beautiful style to this html page next i'm going to show you how to make this table responsive now we're going to understand how to make this table responsive so let me first open the inspect tool of chrome click on this toggle device toolbar and specify here viewport then 24. if the viewport is less than that i want to make this table responsive so I'm going to just back to my style.css file and down here I'm going to say add the rate media only screen and say here add max width if it is 1024 pixel then I want to change few properties of this table. So here I'm going to first select table then select T head then select T body then select T H element T D and tr and specify display block save the changes just down here i'm going to say t head table row and to this table row i'm going to specify position absolute top is going to be minus 99999 just out of that i'm going to specify left minus 49 pixel so this will just remove the top section of this table when the viewport is less than 
then 24 pixel just down here i'm going to specify table row then specify border one pixel solid and then i'm going to add my border variable just down here i'm going to say table data then specify border none and border bottom is going to be one pixel solid and then specify my border variable just out of that down here i'm going to say position relative let me just remove this border that's better and save the changes okay notice the table is now responsive if you want you can add the table head as well but i don't want to add that that is why i'll remove that header from this application so now your table is now responsive now once you understand how to make this table responsive let me show you how to create a new user form in this project so when you click on this new user button i want to navigate user to the new form where the client can specify their username email gender and status so i'm going to create a new form where the user can specify their information so i'm going to just back to my editor and inside this editor here i'm going to create a new file so inside this views i'm going to create a new file and name this file add user dot html just start that inside this file i'm going to just copy all the code from this index.html and paste it inside this add user file like this and instead of this table i'm going to add form here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get rid of this action attribute from this form and here i'm going to specify id which is update user like this save the changes and open this file in the live server so here i'm going to specify add user dot html so as you can notice this will just open this file and just out of that i'm going to make some changes inside this box now so i'm going to get rid of this anchor tag here i'm going to create filter class and specify here an anchor tag with a root href attribute then specify text on users save the changes back to the project and here you can notice you have the all user text here let me add here an icon so let me just back to my project and i'm going to specify here pass f a angle double left save the changes this will add this icon to this text just out of that just out of this box now down here i'm going to create another div with form title class as well as i'm going to specify text center class and here i'm going to create a two heading tag with text new user and specify class to it which is text dark and after this h2 heading tag i'm going to add here a span tag with a class text light and specify text here use the below form to create a new account save the changes back to the project and you will see the result something like this now just out of that down here inside this form i'm going to add a division tag with a class new user and inside this new user i'm going to create a division tag so here i'm going to say form group and inside this form group i'm going to create a label for name and specify class text light then specify text name then create input of the type hidden then specify name to it id and specify value and just out of that i'm going to specify here input type text specify name attribute which is name and value is going to be empty and then specify placeholder which is mark stoinis save the changes back to the project and here you can notice i have my form input element if you want you can specify any placeholder here just out of that i'm going to create another input element so i'm going to copy this form group paste it down here and instead of name here i'm going to say email this for became email then i'm going to get rid of this input hidden and change this placeholder here i'm going to say example at the red gmail.com and name attribute is going to be email just for that copy this form group again paste it down here and this time i'm going to specify for 
gender don't forget to change this email to gender and here i'm going to create a division tag with class radio button so here i'm going to create a class radio with inline class so here i'm going to say dot inline as you know we already have this class inside style.css file this will specify display inline to this division tag inside this div i'm going to grab this input and paste it and i'm going to change this type and specify type radio then name is going to be gender and value is going to be male i'm going to get rid of this placeholder and then specify this label copy this label paste it down here like this just specify here male back to the browser and here you can notice you have the radio button male just out of that i'm going to copy this radio like this paste it down here change this value to female and this became female save the changes here you can notice you have two radio buttons i'm going to do the same for the status as well so i'm going to just copy this form group right from here like this and paste it down here and instead of this gender i'm going to specify here status this became status like this value became active and inactive i'm going to change it to active and this became inactive so here i have a status active and inactive now let me just add a button to submit this form so just out of this form group right down here i'm going to add form group class and inside it i'm going to add a button and this is the type of submit button then specify class to it btn text dark update and then i'm going to specify save as a text save the changes and back to the browser here you can notice i have the button save now let me just add styling to this form once you understand how to create this beautiful add user form let me specify some styling to it let me just back to my editor and open the style.css file and just toggle this window on the right side of the screen down here i'm going to create a comment add user and update user template because i'm going to use the same styling for update and add user form so i'm going to first select the form title class then specify margin top is going to be 2 em just after that i'm going to specify here dot form title and then select the h2 heading tag padding is going to be 0.5 em to the top and bottom just down here i'm going to select the new user class and then specify max width 786 pixel and margin is going to be auto save the changes just down here i'm going to select the update user id and then select form group class then i'm going to specify margin 0.4 em to the top and bottom and zero for the left and right save the changes this will add some margin between these elements as you know i'm using the same form for the add user as well so i'm going to copy this selector paste it down here and change this update user to add user like this just out of that down here i'm going to say update user and then i'm going to select form group and then i'm going to select input of the type text and to this input tags i'm going to specify with 100 percent then specify padding which is 0.6 em to the top and bottom and 1 em to the left and right then i'm going to specify margin which is 0.5 em to the top and bottom and zero for the left and right then i'm going to specify border which is one pixel solid and specify border to it like this save the changes this will change the border of this text box just down here i'm going to specify font family to this text boxes so i'm going to copy this this borlo font family and specify that to this text box just down here i'm going to specify font size 1 em and border radius is going to be 0.2 em save the changes and this will something look like this 
just out of that as you know i'm going to specify the same styling to the add user as well so i'm going to copy the selector specify comma here and paste the selector again and instead of update user i'm going to say here add user save the changes down here i'm going to specify styling to this radio buttons so i'm going to paste the selector again and instead of input type text here i'm going to select radio and i'm going to specify margin 1 em to the top and bottom and 2 em to the left and right save the changes so this will add some margin to this radio buttons just after that i'm going to apply the styling to the add user as well add user save the changes and now if we just take a look at this form then this radio buttons is very ordinary i want to specify some styling to it to make this form more attractive so i'm going to just back to my style.css and down here i'm going to apply some styling to this radio buttons so here i'm going to create css command and specify adding style to radio buttons so here i'm going to first select radio then select input and it is a type of radio so in the single code i'm going to say radio just for that i'm going to specify position absolute and opacity is going to be zero save the changes this will remove the radio buttons right from here just down here i'm going to select this selector and just add a before content to it so here i'm going to say radio label and add before pseudo selector so here i'm going to say content specify empty string then specify background which is border btn i'm going to specify this color border btn then i'm going to specify border radius 100 percent border is going to be one pixel solid border i'm going to call my variable border just for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to add this class to the label first so i can see the result here so i'm going to just back to the add user and as you can notice i have here a radio button with label so i'm going to specify here a class so instead of this text light i'm going to specify here radio label like this don't forget to specify to this gender as well like this save the changes as you can notice i have the results something like this back to the style.css and down here i'm going to add styling to this radio buttons so just out of this border i'm going to specify display inline block width is going to be 1 em and height is going to be 1 em then i'm going to add position which is relative and top is going to be minus 0 em just for that i'm going to specify margin right 0.5 em and vertical alignment is going to be top save the changes just after that cursor is going to be pointer text alignment center and then i'm going to add a transition to this radio button so here i'm going to add webkit transition and select the css property so i'm going to select here all 250 millisecond and specify function is then specify the transition property and specify here all 250 millisecond is just down here i'm going to first select this selector and paste it down here like this and when i click on this radio button so i'm going to call here an event check so when i click on this radio button I want to select this radio label before pseudo selector and specify background color and i'm going to specify background color to this radio button and then specify box shadow in set 0 0 0 4 pixel and then specify a simple light gray color to it save the changes just out of that i'm going to copy this selector paste it down here when i focus on this radio button I want to select this before pseudo selector and then specify outline none and border color is going to be this one just after that i want to disable the check property so here i'm going to select this selector like this paste it down here and if the radio button is disabled i want to select this before pseudo selector and then specify box shadow inset 0 0 0 4 pixel and then i'm going to specify this color so i'm going to copy this property and specify that 
here. Just for that, I'm going to specify border color and specify the hex value here, as well as I'm going to specify background color and specify the same hex value. Save the changes. And now let me just check my radio buttons. When I click on the radio buttons, whoops, nothing is happening. This is because if you back to your R user, here you can notice this input type radio and this label is not connected. So how do I connect both this element? I can connect them using ID. So I'm going to specify here ID radio 2. If you want, you can specify any ID to this radio button. But keep in mind this ID and this for need to be equal. So I'm going to specify radio 2 to this label and to this input type radio. I'm going to do the same. But this time, I'm going to specify ID here, radio 3, and 4 is going to be radio 3. Do the same for this gender as well. So here I'm going to specify ID, radio 4, 4 is going to be radio 4. Then this radio button is going to be ID, radio 5, and this became radio 5. Save the changes, and let me just click on this radio buttons. As you can notice, this is now working. Just after that, let me just style this button. So I'm going to just back to my style.css and down here, I'm going to style this button. Down here, I'm going to select first update user, then select the form group class and then select BDN class. At the same time, I'm going to select the add user as well, like this, add user. And here I'm going to specify with 100% then specify padding 0.9 em 9 em to the top and bottom and 1 em to the left and right then specify background color and i'm going to select this background color specify that here then i'm going to select border which is none font family and i'm going to specify this font family this pt sans like this just down here i'm going to specify font size 1 em cursor is going to be pointer and border radius 0.2 em and margin is going to be 0.5 em to the top and bottom and zero for the left and right save the changes and as you can notice the button is now successfully ready let me just add some hover effect on this button so let me just copy this selector paste it down here and add hover effect on it hover and then i'm going to specify background color i want to add dark color when i hover on this button and then color is going to be border now, as you can notice, the styling of this template is now completely ready. Next, I'm going to show you how to convert this HTML into EJS template engine. Now, let's understand how to convert this .html template into EJS template engine. So, I'm going to just expand this editor and open the index.ejs. Here, you can notice, I have the footer and this header. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to open the index.html and here is the main section of this website. So I'm going to copy this main section and paste it between this footer and this header. Right here, like this. And just after that, I'm going to grab all the content of this table data and put it in a separate partial file. So I can manage it very easily. I'm going to grab this table row like this, right from here. Save the changes. Open the Explorer tab. And here I'm going to create a new file inside this include folder. I'm going to create a new file with name show.ejs. And inside this file, I'm going to paste all this content like this. Save the changes. And let me just back to my index.ejs. Copy this ejs syntax and paste it here like this. And instead of footer, I'm going to say here show. Save the changes. Open the terminal and I'm going to start the server npm start this will just start the server on localhost 3000 let me just open it as you can notice the styling is not actually applied to this template because if you back to the header i don't have the style here so just out this title down here i'm going to add styling so here i'm going to say link and specify here style.css so here i'm going to say css forward slash style.css CSS is a prefix of this style.css. As you can notice here, if we open the server.js, we specify here CSS. This is the prefix of this asset CSS folder. Just for that, don't forget to link this font awesome website. So I'm going to copy this font awesome website link. This CDN 
and paste it before this link tag like this save the changes back to the website and reload it as you can notice the style is now successfully applied to this project just for that what i want when i click on this new user i want to navigate user to the add user form so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new file inside this views folder and name this file add user.ejs and here inside this add user i'm going to put all the code of this add user.html file this one so i'm going to first copy this heading section and the footer section of this website so i'm going to just copy this heading paste it inside add user like this copy the footer paste it inside the add user like this so once i have the header and footer of this website let me just put the main section of this website so i'm going to open the add user copy this main section and paste it inside this add user.ejs and now i'm going to grab this form and put it in a separate partial file so i'm going to grab this form like this inside this include i'm going to create a partial file with the name form.ejs and here i'm going to paste this form save the changes back to the add user i'm going to copy this ejs syntax and here i'm going to add that ejs syntax so here i'm going to first add html command and say add user form i'm going to paste the ejs syntax and call form.ejs file save the changes back to the index.ejs so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a route a new route and render this add user file so i'm going to just back to my server.js copy this get request paste it down here and for the add user i'm going to render this add user template so here i'm going to say add user make sure the file name is exactly same so i'm going to specify this name and render it back to the project and when you click on this new user this will navigate you to the add user now just for that let me just back to my root route so i'm going to click on this all user this will just navigate us to the root route of this website so when i click on this edit button i want to navigate user to the update page of this website as you can notice here in this website i don't have the update page let me create it in the views i'm going to create a new file with name update user.ejs and i'm going to put all the code of this add user inside this update user file so i'm going to copy all this code like this and paste it inside this update user file and i'm going to change this text to update user and i'm going to change this as well use the below form to update an account just start that i'm not going to use this add user form inside this update user so i'm going to copy all this code and paste it right here save the changes back to the form.ejs and as you can notice inside this update.user i have the id update user inside this form.ejs i have the same id update user i'm going to change it to add user so once i specify add user you can notice in the style.css i specify the same styling to both these forms to the update and to this add user form now just out of that as i said earlier when i click on this button i want to navigate user to the update page so let me first close the unwanted files from here let me just back to the show.ejs and here i specify the hash inside this update button let me just specify here forward slash and specify update user save the changes back to the server.ejs and create a new route for update copy this get request paste it down here and specify here update user and instead of add user here i'm going to specify update user so i'm going to specify this file name update user save the changes and reload the browser and when you click on this edit button as you can notice this will navigate you to the update page let me just back to the root route and when you click on this new user here you can add a new user and from this edit button you can edit the user 
or you can say you can update the user information. Now once we complete the styling and convert all the HTML into EJS, let me just delete these index files. So I'm going to delete this, add user.html and index.html. Let me just minimize these folders. Now, once you understand how to work with the client side of this project, next, we're going to start working on the server side of this project. So in the next lecture, we're going to create a different route and connect the MongoDB database to this project. Once we understand how to work with client side of this application, let's take a look at how to work with server side. So I'm going to open my editor and I'm going to just create the server side of this application. So as you can notice here in this server.js file, I have these routers. I'm going to separate this router from this server.js file and create a dedicated router file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new router file inside this router folder. You can notice here I have this router folder inside this server folder. So I'm going to just click on this router and here I'm going to create a new file. So I'm going to click on this new file icon and name this file router.js. And in this file, I'm going to create my routers. So I'm going to grab all this router like this, cut it from the server.js and paste it right here like this. And just out of that, as you know, I don't have this app variable. So inside this router, I'm going to say constant express is equal to and require the express module like this and just sort of that i'm not going to create here constant app and then specify the express application because this statement will create a new app so what i want instead of creating a new app here i'm going to call a method of express so here instead of this constant app i'm going to say constant route is equal to express dot router this method allows us to create different router in a separate file so instead of app i'm going to use this route variable like this so now you can import this file inside server.js and use these routes let me just save the changes save this file back to the server.js and down here i'm going to create a command and say load routers and here i'm going to say app dot use and specify a root path and to this root path i'm going to require this file so here i'm going to say require in the single code specify dot forward slash server inside this server i have routes and inside this route i have router just out of that save this file as well and back to the router.js you can notice here i just created three routes here but i didn't export it so let me first export this route so i can use it in this server.js so down here, I'm going to say module dot exports is equal to route. So now I can use this route variable in server.js. Save the changes. Back to the server.js. Save this file as well and reload the application. As you can notice, the application is working fine. Now let me just back to my server and back to the router.js file. You can notice here, I have these callback functions inside this router.js. Instead of creating these callback functions, inside this parenthesis of this get method i'm going to separate this callback function so i can maintain it so inside these services i'm going to create a new service for this router so inside these services i'm going to create a new file and name this file render.js this file is going to allow us to render different files using router so what i'm going to do is i'm going to back to the router.js and as you can notice the first route is going to render the index file so inside this render.js, here I'm going to say exports dot home route and I'm going to specify a callback function. So here I'm going to say request and response parameter and call an arrow function like this. Now this export keyword is going to export this function so I can use it in other files. So inside this function, I'm going to just grab this response dot render and paste it here like this. So I'm going to say here response dot render and render the index file save the changes back to the router.js and here instead of this callback function i'm going to call this home route function so i'm going to just first require this file so i'm going to say constant services is equal to require and here i'm going to just pass services render.js this file just out of that 
I'm going to use these services instead of this callback function. So I'm going to get rid of this callback function right from here like this. Specify comma to specify the second argument to this method. And then I'm going to say services dot home routes. That's it. Save the changes. And now when you reload the browser, it will completely work fine. So now you can notice here, this route is now very easy to understand. This is the route path. And I'm going to call this function when the route is match. Let me just add here a description for this route. So here I'm going to just add some documentation for this route. Add the date description, root route, or you can specify here home route as well. And the method is going to be get. Just out of that, I'm going to do the same for this route as well and for this route as well. So I'm going to back to my render.js file and down here I'm going to say exports dot add user. And I'm going to just specify a callback function request and response parameter and inside it I'm going to render a file as you know here I'm going to just render this add user so I'm going to copy it paste it here just out of that here I'm going to say exports dot update user is equal to call the request and response parameter with arrow and then I'm going to just render this update file save the changes back to the router.js and instead of these callback functions, I'm going to just specify here services dot add user. And this became services dot update user. That's it. Save the changes. Save this file as well. Back to the browser and reload it. And let me just check my other pages as well. And I click on this new user. This will open the add user route. And if I click on this edit button, this will open the update user route. Now, just for that, let me just back to router.js, copy this documentation, paste it here, and this route is for add users. And this is the type of get request on add user. Do the same for this last route. And to the description, I'm going to specify for update user. And this is going to be the get request. And route is going to be update user. Now, once you understand how to create routing in this application, let's take a look at how to connect the MongoDB to this application and create the RESTful API. Now, let's understand how to connect the MongoDB to the project. So, I'm going to open a new tab in my browser and here I'm going to say MongoDB. I'm going to search for MongoDB and here I have the result www.mongodb.com. I'm going to head on to this website and from here i'm going to connect my application to mongodb in the previous lecture i already explained how to work with mongodb locally i created different documents and collection using mongo shell now because we are working on a big project i'm not going to store all the data in the local host because if accidentally my hard disk crash i could lose all my data so instead of storing all this data inside my hard disk i'm going to store it on cloud when you open the mongodb.com, you have the mongodb atlas where you can store all your data. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to click on this start free. And here you can notice you have mongodb atlas. From here, you can store your data on cloud database. mongodb atlas is a fully managed cloud database developed by the same people that build mongodb. Atlas handles all the complexity of deploying, managing and handling your deployments on a cloud service provider of your choice. So instead of working on localhost, we're going to work on cloud database. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to specify my information and create a new account on MongoDB. So I'm going to click on this sign up button of Google and sign in with my Gmail account. Once I sign in with MongoDB Atlas, you would have the result something like this. If you're creating an account for the first time, MongoDB Atlas will ask you to specify name of your organization. You can specify your individual name here and proceed. Once you proceed, you will have the result something like this. Here you can create a new project and create a new cluster. Cluster is going to manage all your cloud data. So what I'm going to do is, here I'm going to click on this new project button to create a new project. I'm going to click on it and specify name for this project. I'm going to choose name crude. I'm going to specify name to this project crude and click on this next button. And then I'm going to add member and set permissions. I'm not going to specify any member or add any permission here. Instead, I am the owner of this database, so I'm going to just click on this create project. So this will just take few seconds to create a new project. So here you can notice the project is now created with the name crude. And now let's create a new cluster. 
So I'm going to just click on this build a cluster and here you can notice we have different cluster. I'm going to use the free one. So I'm going to click on this create a free cluster. Now here you need to specify the cloud provider. I'm going to use AWS and I'm going to choose my nearest server. I'm in Asia so I'm going to choose Mumbai. Then I'm going to leave everything as it is and click on create cluster. Now this will just take few minutes to create a new cluster. Once your cluster is successfully created, click on this database access from the security right here and create a database user so we can access the database. So I'm going to click on this add new database user. So I'm going to create a new user with authentication. So here I'm going to specify admin and specify password admin 123 and click on this add user button. This will create the admin user with admin 123 password. And here you can notice we have resources, all resources. So this will just allows us to access all the resources of the database. You can edit the user as well from these buttons. Or if you want, you can create and delete the database from these buttons as well. Now, just for that, I'm going to click on this network access. And add my IP address so I can access this database. So I'm going to click on this add IP address. And here, I'm going to click on this allow access from anywhere. I don't want to show my IP address, so I'm not going to click on this add current IP address. I'm going to click on this allow from anywhere, just like this and click on this confirm. So this will just allows me to access this database from any local host. Just wait a minute. So once you have the status active, you will only be able to connect your cluster from this list. Once you specify the database access and network access, let's back to the cluster. And from this cluster, I'm going to click on this connect button to connect this cluster to my web application. So I'm going to click on this connect and click on this connect your application. Here you can notice you have the connection string. Using this connection string, I'm going to connect this application to my project. So I'm going to copy this connection string by clicking on this copy button and close this window. Back to my project and open the config.env file. And here I'm going to create a new variable with name mongo uri and specify this mongodb url like this and don't forget to specify password and database name so i'm going to get rid of this password field right from here and i'm going to specify my password admin123 so this is my password of this admin user just out of that i'm going to specify the database name so i'm going to get rid of this angle brackets and this db name and specify the database name i'm going to specify name users so this is my database name. If you want, you can specify any name to this database. That doesn't matter. Now, once I import this connection string in this application, let me connect the MongoDB database to the application. I'm going to save this file and close it. Just for that, inside this server, inside this database folder, I'm going to create a new file and name this file connection.js. And inside this file, I'm going to make the MongoDB connection. So I'm going to first say here, constant mongoose is equal to and require the mongoose module. Using mongoose module, we can connect the MongoDB database to the application. So here I'm going to say constant connect db. I'm going to create here a function connect db and call sync and await function. So here I'm going to say a sync specify the parenthesis and call the arrow function. So I'm going to just create a synchronous function using a sync and await. Just for that, here I'm going to call try and catch. Inside this try, I'm going to make MongoDB connection. So here I'm going to create a command and say MongoDB connection string. Just down here, I'm going to say constant connection is equal to call the await function like this and say mongoose dot connect. I'm going to call a method of mongoose which is mongoose connect. Just for that, in the parenthesis, I'm going to say process.env dot and then I'm going to call this variable mongo uri. This one right here, just like this. So now, as you can notice, I'm going to just pass this variable name. Just for that, I'm going to specify here comma to specify second argument and in the curly braces. I'm going to just stop warnings in the console when I use MongoDB connection. So here I'm going to say use new URL parser true. Then I'm going to call a new property called use unified topology and I'm going to just make this property true. 
just out of that i'm gonna say use find and modify false and use create index true so these properties will stop unwanted warnings in the console now just out of that down here just after this connection here i'm gonna say console.log and using the backtick operator i'm gonna say mongodb connected and specify the connection string so i'm going to call dollar in the curly braces i'm going to say con dot connection dot host and just out of that if there is any problem while connection i'm going to say console dot log and print the error message and exit from this process so here i'm going to say process dot exit and specify one which is true and don't forget to export this function so down here i'm going to say module dot exports is equal to connect db just out of that back to the server dot js and let me just call this connection here i'm going to just require the mongodb file so here i'm going to say constant connect db is equal to and require the connection file so here i'm going to say server database and then i'm going to select the connection file this one and using this connect db i'm going to call this function connect db so just down here just after this morgan right down here i'm going to add a command and say mongodb connection and just add here connect db and specify parenthesis so i'm going to just call this function inside this server.js file let me just open my terminal and save this file when i save this file you can notice i have the console message mongodb connected and this is the cluster host name so using this message this is confirmed that the mongodb is successfully connected to this application so once you understand how to create the mongodb connection let me show you how to create api and make crude operations now once you understand how to create the successful connection of a mongodb let me just show you how to create a scheme in mongodb but let me first close these unwanted files right from here and now let me just open the model folder and inside it i'm going to create the mongodb scheme so i'm going to create a new file and name this file model.js and inside this model i'm going to create a mongodb scheme so here i'm going to say constant mongoose is equal to and require the mongoose module just like that here i'm going to say var scheme is equal to and create a new instance of mongoose scheme so i'm going to say here new mongoose scheme mongoose scheme allows you to define a shape and content of the document so here we have mongoose scheme and in the parenthesis in the curly braces i'm going to specify shape of the document so here i'm going to first specify name and specify curly braces and inside it i'm going to specify type which is string then i'm going to specify required true just out of that specify comma here email email is going to be of the type string then required is going to be true and unique is going to be true the email should be unique of all the users then I'm going to say here gender. Gender is going to be string and status is going to be string. So this is a very simple scheme of MongoDB. Or you can say this is a very simple MongoDB model. Just have that down here. I'm going to say constant user DB is equal to mongoose.model. I'm going to call a method of mongoose model and inside this model i'm going to specify the document name so here i'm going to say user db so you can specify any name to this document i'm going to specify document name user db and then specify shape of the document so as you know i have this scheme variable and this is the shape of my document so i'm going to pass here scheme just out of that don't forget to export this module so here i'm going to say module dot exports is equal to user db so once the model is successfully created let me just create the controller of this website 
Using controller, I'm going to just make select, update, delete and create records. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this controller folder and create a new file inside it. And I'm going to name this file controller.js. If you want, you can name this file anything. Inside this controller, I'm going to first require this module. So I can use it in this controller file. So I'm going to say here var user db is equal to and say required and in the single code I'm going to specify model and then specify model.js file so I'm going to just require this scheme inside this controller file so I can use it inside this controller just after that here I'm going to create my first API create request so here I'm going to create a command create and save new user so I'm going to just create here a function so here I'm going to say exports dot create is equal to specify request and response parameter and specify arrow function to it and here inside this create function I'm going to save a new user so I'm going to first back to my router.js and inside it I'm going to first require this controller so here I'm going to say constant controller is equal to and using require I'm going to require the controller file controller.js just out of that just down here I'm going to create my API route so here I'm going to create a command API so here I'm going to first create this create request so in the route I'm going to say route dot post to create and add new user I'm going to use post method so I'm going to call post method in the single quote I'm going to specify forward slash API specify forward slash and say here users so this is the route path of post request just out of that I'm going to specify comma and say controller dot create so I'm going to call this method when the route is match with this post method save the changes back to the controller and inside this function I'm going to save and create a new user now let me just do the same for update delete and find so down here I'm going to create a command and say retrieve and return all users or I'm going to use the same method to retrieve and return a single user so here I'm going to create a function so I'm going to say here exports dot find and specify request and response parameter so I'm going to use this function to retrieve all the user as well as I'm going to use the same function to retrieve only a single user I'm going to show you that later in this tutorial just down here I'm going to create a new command and say update a new identified user by user ID I'm going to update the user so I'm going to create here a function exports dot update is equal to call the request and response parameter just like this so I'm going to use this method to update the user and just down here I'm going to create a new command and here I'm going to say delete a user with specified user ID in the request so here I'm going to say exports dot delete is equal to and call the request and response parameter with arrow function save the changes back to the router dot js file and here let me just duplicate this statement like this and instead of this post request this time I'm gonna make get request so here I'm gonna say get and I'm gonna make this get request on this route and I'm gonna change this callback function so here I'm gonna say controller dot find so when I make a get request on this route I want to execute this find method just after that I'm gonna just say here route dot put I'm going to just call a put method of HTTP on this path and then I'm going to just pass a parameter to this path so here I'm going to specify forward slash colon ID so when I call this put method I need to specify value to this ID variable and now instead of this controller dot create I'm going to say here controller dot update so I'm going to call this update method when the route is match at the end I'm going to say route dot delete I'm going to call the HTTP delete method and I'm going to pass ID with this delete route. So here I'm going to say photo slash colon ID. 
just after that i'm going to specify callback function controller dot delete so this is how we can simply create an api for this application save the changes save the controller file as well and next i'm going to show you how to create these functions and get all the information from the database now let's understand how to make crude operation using mongodb database i'm going to first create a new user using this create callback function so inside this create function i'm going to first validate the request so here i'm going to create a command and say validate request so how can i validate the request so here i'm going to say if exclamation mark request dot body if when the request make a post request with empty body i want to just send a response with a status 400 and then send a message so i'm going to say here curly braces and here i'm going to say message content cannot be empty and just return from this function so here i'm going to say return so if the user make post request with empty body i'm going to just return from this callback function so whenever the user make a post request we need to specify body of that post request as you know when you make a post request using a form all the data of the form is stored in the body of the request object and using this body we can access all the form data so down here i'm going to just create a new user so we need to create a new instance of the user td scheme so here i'm going to create a command and say new user so here i'm going to create constant user is equal to new user db and in the parentheses inside the curly braces i'm going to specify value to this document so i'm going to specify value to this name email gender and status so inside this controller inside this curly braces i'm going to first specify name and then here i'm going to say request dot body dot name so when the user make post request i can access this name property from the body just out of that i'm going to say here email request dot body dot email just down here i'm going to say gender gender is going to be request dot body dot gender and just after that i'm going to say status is going to be request dot body dot status so as you can notice here the data is going to match to this model so inside this controller i'm going to just store this data and create a new instance of user db model and store it in this variable just after that just down here i'm going to save this data in the database so i'm going to just create a comment here and here i'm going to say save user in the database so i'm going to call here user and here i'm going to call different methods so i'm going to use chaining system to call different methods so here i'm going to say dot save this method is going to save this data in the mongodb database and then here to this save method you need to pass your object so here i'm going to pass this user i want to save this user data in the mongodb database so i'm going to pass this user data here just for that specify dot and call the promise then method and inside it i'm going to specify data and inside this callback function i'm going to say response dot send and i'm going to send this data and if this promise return error i'm going to just catch it using this catch method with error so i'm going to call here a callback function and say response dot status and then i'm going to specify the error status score 500 and then send it using curly braces and inside it i'm going to say message and here i'm going to say error dot message if this variable return nothing i'm going to just specify default value some error occurred while creating a create operation don't forget to specify semicolons here that's it save the changes and now here you have your create callback function now let me explain this code and show you how to execute it so i'm going to first check so if the user make post request without body i'm going to just exit from this method and if we have body of the post i'm going to just get all the content and create an instance of this model so once i have the instance of this user db model i'm going to just save it 
inside the database using this save method. Just after that, I'm going to call a promise then and then return this save data to the user. And if there is any error inside this statement, I'm going to call this catch method. Now, let me just test this API. So, I'm going to open the Postman API tool to test this API. It is always the best practice to test your API before working with it. So, I'm going to open the Postman. Postman is a free tool for testing APIs. If you don't know about what is Postman, then you can check my dedicated video on it. Postman is an API testing tool that helps us to test the APIs. If you don't have Postman in your local system, just open your browser and just head on to Postman. Just search for Postman and head on www.postman.com. And from this website, you can download the Postman for your local system. I already have the Postman installed in my local system, so I'm not going to install it again. So I'm going to close my tab and open the Postman again. And now I'm going to just create a new tab here. And then here you can notice I have the request type. So we have different request type here, the requested URL and the send button. So as you know, if you just back to your router.js, we are going to make a post request on this URL. And this is going to call this create callback function. So I'm going to open my postman and first select the post request. Then specify the URL. So as you know, if you back to your browser, this is your URL of your application. Just copy it and back to the postman and specify that URL right here. And just out of that, specify this API path, this one, and paste it right here, like this. And just after that, as you know, we need to specify body to this post method. If you just make this send request, then you will get an error message. Because as you can notice here in the controller, I just added if we don't have body to this post request, I just wanted to exit from this post request. So let me just add body of this post request. So I'm going to click on this body. And here I'm going to select the x www form URL encoded. This is the URL encoded data I want to send with this post request. And then here I'm going to pass body to this method. So in the key, I'm going to first specify name, specify value here. So I'm going to just specify name to the user, which is Ashok Talwar. Then I'm going to specify email. Just out of that, I'm going to specify gender. Gender is going to be male. And status status is going to be inactive so what i want i want to store this data inside my mongodb database so i'm going to pass this data to this body and just click on this send button to add this data in the mongodb database but before i click on this send button you can notice here if i open the controller here i have the mongodb scheme inside this scheme i have name email gender and status when i make this post request i'm going to pass this data to these variables so i can store it in this mongodb database so let me just click on this send button and store this data inside this database when i click on it you can notice i'm going to have the results something like this here i have the unique id then we have the name email gender and status so as you can notice we have the successful 200 message from this response so as you can notice we successfully inserted the data inside the mongodb database so let me just back to my mongodb database so let me first open my cluster and click on these collections. Here you can notice inside this collection, I have my data. In the collection, you can find the database name users and the document name user dbs. So you can notice we successfully make the create request. Now, once you understand how to create a user and save the data in MongoDB, let's understand how to find or you can say how to get the user using get method. Let's take a look at how to read the data from the MongoDB database. As you can notice, I'm using this find method to read the data from the database. So I'm going to use this find method of this controller file. So I'm going to open the controller.js and here I have this find method. Inside it, I'm going to read the data from the database. So I'm going to first get the data from the database and return as a response. Here I'm going to first say userdb.find. I'm going to call a find method of user db object and then I'm going to call a then method of promise. So here I'm going to say dot then and then I'm going to pass parameter user and in the callback function I'm going to say response dot send user just like this and then I'm going to call the catch method to return the error message if there is any error inside this statement. So here I'm going to say response dot status and status score is going to be 500 which is the error code and then send 
the message object like this. So here I'm going to say error dot message. And if this variable is not available, let me just send the default value, which is error occurred while retrieving user information. Save the changes. Open the postman. And now I'm going to make get request on this user route. So as you can notice, I have this get request and I'm going to specify this URL. So I'm going to open my postman and here I'm going to select the get request. And this get request is posted on API users. And then I'm going to just back to my patterns and just click on this send button. When I click on it, as you can notice, I'm going to have the data of my database. Because we have only one data inside this database, I'm only going to have one record as a response. So this find method will return all the records of the database as a response. Just for that, let me show you how to update the value of the user using this update callback function. So here inside this update method, I'm going to just first say if, if the request dot body is not available, then I'm going to just return a response with a status code 400. And then I'm going to return a send method with message object. And then I'm going to specify here data, data to update cannot be empty. And just for that down here, if the body of the put request, this put request is empty, I will return from this callback function. Just for that down here, I'm going to say constant ID is equal to request dot params dot ID. So I'm going to just get this ID value from this request using this param object. Now in express, there are two type of route parameters, the URL parameters and query parameters. This is the type of URL parameters. We created a variable in the URL. So this is what we call the URL parameter. When we make put request, I need to specify value to this ID parameter. So when I specify value to this ID parameter, so this value is going to specify to this ID variable using this statement. So when I make a request with ID value, the value is going to pass to this parameter object and to this ID variable. So I can get that value and store it in this ID variable. The second type of parameter is query parameters. I will show you how to work with query parameters after a few minutes. But just for now, once I have the URL parameter inside this ID, just down here, I'm going to say user db dot find by id and update. I'm going to call this method find by id and update. And inside this method, I'm going to first specify the id which I want to update. So I'm going to specify here id. I'm going to pass this variable. Then specify here comma. And then I'm going to pass request dot body. I'm going to pass the data which I want to update. And then here I'm going to pass curly braces and say use find and modify false. Just for that, down here, I'm going to call promises. So here I'm going to say then. And inside this then, I'm going to pass parameter data. And I'm going to say here, if we don't have data, then I'm going to just return a response dot status 404. And then I'm going to send a response. So here I'm going to say send in the curly braces. I'm going to call a message key. And in the backtick operator, I'm going to say cannot update user with then specify the id and then i'm going to say dot maybe user not found just after that just out of this if statement i'm going to say here else if we have this data parameter i'm going to say here response dot send and send this data i'm going to just send this updated data with this statement just down here if there is any error in this then method i'm going to just catch it so down here i'm going to say catch error call the function and here I'm going to say response dot status status is going to be 500 and then I'm going to call send method with message key and here I'm going to say error update user information save the changes so once I have my update callback function let me just check it so as you can notice here in the router I have this put request, so I want to make this put request on this route. When I make this put request, I need to specify value to this ID parameter. So I can get it inside this ID variable and pass to this 
object. So I'm going to just open the postman and here I'm going to first get this ID. So I'm going to copy this ID and I'm going to select put request, this one. Just out of that, I'm going to make a request on API users and as you know, in the router I have this ID parameter. So I need to pass value to it. So here I'm going to specify forward slash and paste this ID. Just out of that, I'm going to back to the body of this request. And now I want to update this status of this user. So I'm going to uncheck gender, email and name. And I'm going to just say here inactive and I'm going to make this active. Now once I specify body, once I specify the parameter value, let me just make this put request. So I'm going to just select the ID using this ID parameter and update the status of the ID and make it active. Right now, the status of the user is inactive. I'm going to make it active and update the value of this status property. So I'm going to just click on this send button to update this status property. When I click on the send button, as you can notice, I'm going to have the status active. So the postman will make put request on this route with this ID and update the status property to active. So this is how you can update the value in the MongoDB database. Now just out of that, let me show you how to delete the record from the database. Now deleting records from the user database is super easy. Inside this delete callback function, I'm going to first get the user ID. So here I'm going to say constant ID is equal to request.params.id. So I'm going to get the user ID using this variable. So when I make a delete request, I need to specify ID of the user. Just out of that, here I'm going to say userdb dot find by ID and delete. I'm going to call this method and pass ID as a parameter to this method. This method is going to return promise. So I'm going to get that promise using dot then method and specify here parameter data and say here if we don't have data then I'm going to say response dot status and say 404 and then I'm going to say here send and in the curly braces I'm going to return the error message so I'm going to say here message and say cannot delete with ID and then I'm going to pass here ID variable and say here maybe ID is wrong just out of that if we have valid data then I'm going to say here else statement and inside this else, I'm going to say response.send and then I'm going to send a message. So here I'm going to say message and say user was deleted successfully. At the end, just after that, just down here, if this then method return any error, I'm going to catch that using this catch method and say here error. And here I'm going to say response.status and specify 500 as a status code and send error message. In the curly braces, I'm going to say message could not delete user with ID is equal to and then I'm going to concatenate the ID variable like this. If you want, you can use here backtick operator as well to print this value. That doesn't matter. Just out of that, I'm going to specify here semicolons like this and save the changes. Save this file as well. And now if you want to delete the data from the MongoDB database, you need to call the delete HTTP method with this URL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first open the postman and let me first add a new value inside a database. So I'm going to make a post request and just specify here API users. And then in the body, I'm going to pass name, email and gender. Inside name, I'm going to specify user1 and in the email, I'm going to specify user at the rate gmail.com here i'm going to specify gender which is female and status is going to be active so now i'm going to just pass this data to the post request and create a new record inside my mongodb database i'm going to click on this send button to create a new record so this will just create this record inside mongodb database so let me first back to my mongodb database and refresh it when i refresh my collections here i have two database records this is my first record and this is the second one. I'm going to delete this second record. So I'm going to open the postman and now I'm going to copy this ID. And just out of that, I'm going to just click on this post 
and select the delete method. And here inside this URL, I'm going to pass value to the ID variable. So I'm going to specify forward slash, then specify ID, this one, in the URL, and then back to the params. And now I'm going to click on this send button to delete this record from the MongoDB database. As you know, when I make a request, this ID is going to pass to this variable and pass to this object. And then this statement will delete this record from MongoDB database. Now let me just make this request. So I'm going to click on this send button. When I click on it, I'm going to have a message user was deleted. Now let me just check my database. So let me refresh it. As you can notice, the second record is now deleted from my database. So you can see how easy it is to delete the record from your MongoDB database. Now once you understand how to work with create, update and delete and how to find all the users from the database, let me just show you how to get and retrieve a single user from the database. When you make a get request on this route, this will return all the users. But what I want, I want to retrieve a specific user from the database. Instead of returning all the users, I want to return only a single user from the database. Now, to retrieve the single user from the database, I'm going to use this same find method. If you want, you can create a new function to retrieve the single user from the database. When you create a new function, you need to create a new route for that. So instead of creating a new route, I'm going to just use this same route to get the single user and multiple users. So inside this find method, I'm going to just get the query parameters and get a single user from the database. So let me first add a few users inside my database. As you know, I only have a single record inside my database. You can notice here. So let me first add a few record inside this database using post method. So I'm going to just make some post request and add some users inside this database. So let me first refresh my database. As you can notice, I have a few records inside this database. Let me show you all my database records. So here I'm going to say get and I'm going to just make get request to this API users. And I'm going to just make a request. You can notice here, this will just return all the records. Of my database but what I want I want to just get a specific record from this database so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just back to my find method and here I'm going to just pass query parameter when I make a get request to this route so when I make a get request to this route I'm going to just return a query parameter and then I'm going to get that query parameter and pass inside this callback function and get a specific user so up here I'm going to say if request dot query dot id if i have this id parameter of the query then i'm going to return the specific user otherwise i'm going to return all the users so in the else statement i'm going to put this code like this inside this if statement if i have query parameter to this request i'm going to just get that query parameter so here i'm going to say constant id is equal to request dot query dot id and store it in the id variable and here i'm going to say user db dot find by id and pass this id variable here just out of that i'm going to call promise then method pass data variable and here i'm going to say if i don't have any data then return a response with status 404 and i'm going to just send a response so i'm going to say here send in the curly braces, I'm going to say message and in the double quote, I'm going to say not found user with ID and then specify the ID variable. Just down here in the else statement, I'm going to simply say response.send and send this data. And if this statement return an error message, I'm going to just catch it. So here I'm going to say catch error and say here response.status return the 500 status code dot send and in the curly braces i'm going to say message and return the error message so here i'm going to say error retrieving user with id and then i'm going to concatenate my id like this save the changes and now open the postman as you know when you make a get request to this url this will return all the users i want to get a specific user from these records so for example if i want to get this record I'm going to just copy this ID and in the params, I'm going to create a key 
and pass this value here like this so you can notice here how this URL look like now I'm gonna just create here key and value pair so this is the key ID and this is the value of this ID key I'm gonna access this ID using this query ID statement and I'm gonna store the value of this ID inside this ID variable and then I'm gonna pass this value to this find by ID method so when I click on this send button I'm gonna have the specific record as you can notice here this will just send me a specific record from my database and now if I remove this ID from this URL you can get all your records this is how you can retrieve all the users and retrieve a single statement from the MongoDB database now you can see we successfully created the API of this application and we also tested this API on Postman testing tool so once the API is ready let me show you how to use it and display all the record of the MongoDB database in the browser so next I'm going to show you how to use this API and display all the record of the MongoDB database in the browser now once you understand how to create API using Express let me show you how to work with it so as you can notice in the crude application we only have one record inside this table so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the records from my database and display them inside this table so I'm going to just back to my project and open the render.js file and inside this file as you know we have this render method to render this index file but here instead of rendering just an index file I'm going to just pass data with this render method so I can access it in the index file so I'm going to specify here comma and in the curly braces I'm going to say users and specify data so here I'm going to say new data I'm going to pass value to this user key save the changes and now I can access this variable inside my index file so I'm going to just open my views and here in this index.ejs I can just access this variable this variable users so I'm going to just back to the index.ejs and just out of this form I'm going to add ejs syntax and get rid of this statement right from here specify equal to sign and say users save the changes reload the browser and as you can notice I'm going to have my data here so now what we are going to do is I'm going to get all the data from the MongoDB database and pass that to this user so I can access it and display all the records of my MongoDB database in the index file so inside this home route I'm going to make the get request so up here I'm going to just say constant axios I'm going to just require axios module and this module is going to allow us to make a request just out of that inside this home route right here I'm going to just make a get request to the API users right so here I'm going to say axios dot get I'm going to call get request of axios library just out of that in the single code I'm going to pass the URL of the API users so I'm going to just copy this URL paste it here and then I'm going to specify API users so I'm going to make a get request and call this get route this get request is going to return promise so I'm going to get that promise using then method and here I'm going to say function response so I'm going to just send a response here so I'm going to just grab this statement paste it here and instead of this user new data I'm going to pass here response dot data so inside this response I have a data property and inside this data property I have all the records of my MongoDB database let me show you if I say here console.log and specify here response save the changes don't forget to call the catch method I'm going to say here catch then I'm going to call the callback function like this and here I'm going to say response.send and then send the error save the changes reload the browser and as you can notice I'm going to have object as a response and when you open your terminal you have your response in the console so this object this response object will going to return the result something like this inside this object you have different properties you can access all these properties from this object this is a type of get request so you can access this method property as well and you can access this data property as well 
inside this data property you have all the response so i'm going to just access this data property so here i'm going to say response dot data save the changes and reload the browser as you can notice i'm going to have my data as a response so once i have my response let me just get rid of this console from here and iterate over this object inside this index.ejs file so what i'm going to do is i'm going to close this terminal back to the index.ejs and instead of display these users here i'm going to iterate over these users so as you know i have all the user data inside this show partial file so i'm going to get rid of this statement like this save this file and open the show.ejs file from this include folder this one and then here before this table row i'm going to add ej syntax like this and here i'm going to say for where i is equal to zero i'm going to start the iteration from zero and say here if i is less than users dot length if the i variable is less than user dot length i'm going to just increase the value of i variable using incremental operator just out of that i'm going to start this iteration so i'm going to specify opening curly braces and don't forget to close these curly braces down here so i'm going to just add here ej syntax like this and close this for loop and instead of these hard-coded values I'm going to get rid of these hard coded values and print variables. So I'm going to call ejs syntax with equal to sign to print value. And then I'm going to first specify id. So here I'm going to say i. Right now this i has value 0. But I don't want to start my id from 0. So I'm going to say here i plus 1. Just out of that, I'm going to copy this syntax, paste it here. And instead of i plus 1, I'm going to specify users of i. And then I'm going to specify dot name. I'm going to just get the records and call the name property from the records. Then I'm going to copy this statement, paste it right here. And this time I'm going to get emails. Then I'm going to just get gender. And this will return status. Save the changes. Back to the project and reload it. As you can notice, when I reload the project, I'm going to have all the values of my mongodb database so this will just return all the mongodb database value as a response now once you understand how to get all the records from the mongodb database let me show you how to create a new user from this add user form now we all know how to add a user using api now let's take a look at how to add the user using new user form so I'm going to just pass values to these input text boxes and create a new user and store a data in the MongoDB database. So let me show you how to do it. So I'm going to open my editor and then I'm going to open the addUser.ejs file. Let me just close these files. As you know, using this method, using this addUser, I'm going to just redirect the user to the services addUser. And as you know, when the route is matched to addUser, I'm going to render this addUser.ejs file. And in this file, I have the add user form. Let me just open this form. So I have this form in the partial file of form.ejs. I'm going to open it. And here you can notice I have this add user form. So let me just pass action attribute to this form. So to this form, I'm going to say action. And in the action attribute, I'm going to pass this post request URL, this one. So I'm going to copy this route and pass right here like this save the changes so what it does when we click on the submit button it's going to pass this post request to this route so when the post route is matched it's going to store all the data of this form in the mongodb database so what i want when i click on the submit button of this form i want to redirect the user to this url and as you know on this url i have this post route so I'm going to just execute this post route and create and store this data in the MongoDB database. And then I'm going to redirect the user back to the add users. So if you just open the controller.js file, you can notice inside this create, I'm going to return the data as a response. But now let me just redirect the user 
to the specific page. So let me show you how to do it. Here I'm going to say response dot redirect. And using this method, I'm going to redirect the user to different URL. So inside this single code, I'm going to specify the path forward slash add user. Back to my browser and you can notice here, I'm going to just specify this path to this redirect method. So when I click on the submit button, I'm going to store all this data in the MongoDB database and redirect the user to this form again. If you want, you can redirect the user to other pages as well. That's upon you. Now once I've done that, let me just add a simple message that the data is successfully inserted. So I'm going to open a new tab and add a jQuery inside this project. So I'm going to say here jQuery CDNJS. I'm going to open cdnjs.com and from this website, I'm going to copy the jQuery CDN right from here. And then I'm going to just paste it before the closing body tag. So down here, we have this footer partial file. I'm going to open it. And before this closing body up here, I'm going to paste this jQuery like this. And then I'm going to create my custom JavaScript file and link that here. So let me just minimize this server. Inside this asset, inside this JS folder, I'm going to create index.js file. This is my custom JavaScript file. I'm going to first link this. So inside this folder, I'm going to say script. Then here I'm going to specify forward slash JS index.js. I don't have to specify the relative path of this file because in the server.js, I have the virtual path JS to add a JS file inside this project. So I don't need to specify any relative path inside this source attribute. Let me just save the changes. Back to the index.js, which is my custom JavaScript file. When I click on the submit button, I want to alert a message. So here I'm going to just say dollar and in the parenthesis, I'm going to just specify hash add user. So I'm going to just specify this ID add user of this form inside this index.js. When I click on the submit button, so I'm going to call here submit event. When I click on the submit button of the form, I want to call this function. So here I'm going to say function event and inside this function, I'm going to say alert and in the double quote, I'm going to say data inserted successfully. Save the changes and back to the browser. Let me close this tab, back to the crude application and reload it. Now let me create a new user. So here I'm going to just specify name of the user and the email of the user. Then I'm going to specify gender, female and status inactive. Now when I click on this save button, this data will save in the MongoDB database and you will get a message data successfully inserted. When I click on this save button, you can notice you will have a message data inserted successfully. When I press OK, this will reload the browser and when you back to your root route, you will have your data. You have six records in your database. So now once you understand how to successfully add a user inside your database, let me show you how to update the user. Now once you understand how to add a new user inside MongoDB database using new user form, let me show you how to update the record of the MongoDB database. So as you know, I already have update form in this project. So when I click on this edit button, this will open the update user form. Here, using this form, I'm going to update the user. But when I click on this edit button, I want to get all this information of the current user and display them inside these text boxes as well as inside these radio buttons. So how can I do it? Let me show you how to get the user data inside these text boxes and update it. So I'm going to just back to my editor and I'm going to open the render.js file. To this update user, I'm going to just render this update user template. But instead of just returning the update user, I'm going to return the data as well with this render method. I'm going to just make a request. So here I'm going to say exios.get and I'm going to make a get request and here I'm going to call this URL, paste it inside this parenthesis in the single code and then specify curly braces and inside it, I'm going to say params colon in the curly braces, I'm going to say id and say here request dot query dot id. Now I'm going to pass this option because I want to get a specific user from the database. Here you can notice when I make this request, this request will return all the data from the database. But at this time, I just wanted to get the specific user 
from the database instead of returning all the user. So I'm going to pass here params with a query ID. Just out of this query down here, I'm going to call then method. Inside it, I'm going to call a function with a data parameter. And here I'm going to say response dot render. And I'm going to render this update user EJS template. But this time, I'm going to pass the user data as well. So here I'm going to say user data dot data. Let me just change this name to user data. I'm going to say here user data. Let me just change this as well user data. So I'm going to get the specific user data and pass it to this user object. So once I have the user, I'm going to just specify that data inside input text boxes. So let me just get it out the statement and call the catch method. So here I'm going to say catch error and just say response dot send error. Save the changes. And now what you need to do is when you open this URL in the browser, you need to pass value to this ID variable. So as you know, when you open this update user, you don't have this ID variable here. So what I'm going to do is when I click on this user, I'm going to pass ID with the URL. If you just inspect this window, then you can notice right here, I just have the href attribute update user. I want to add ID with value because I just requested the query with ID variable. So when I make a request on this URL, I need to pass ID as a key and value pair. So I'm going to just back to the show.ejs file. And here you can notice, I just have here update user. So instead of just update user, I'm going to pass ID with this URL. So here I'm going to just specify question mark and then call ID is equal to and then pass the ID of the user. So here I'm going to just call this syntax. And instead of user status, I'm going to call ID. Save the changes. When I reload the browser, you will see the href attribute is updated with the user ID. I have the user ID in the URL. If I hover over to this user, I have the ID of this user as well. So in the URL, I'm going to pass the user ID. So when I click on this update, I'm going to have all the data of the user on the update page. But right now, I did not specify the user data inside this user form right here. I have the empty value inside this, this value attribute. So what we are going to do is, so when I click on this edit button, I'm going to just open this current user with ID variable. I'm going to pass that ID variable to this parameter. So this parameter will make a request to this URL and get a specific record from the database. Then I'm going to get that specific record and pass that with this user variable. So I can access it in this update user file. So let me just access this variable. So let me just open the update user. So at the first input text box inside this value, I'm going to simply call EJ syntax like this with equal sign to print a value and then say here user dot name. I'm going to just get the user name inside this input text box. I'm going to just access this user from this user variable and just get the name ID. Just after that, I'm going to copy this syntax, paste it up here to get the user ID. Here I'm going to specify underscore ID. Just after that, I need to specify email. So I'm going to paste the EJS syntax again. Here I'm going to say email. I'm not going to do the same with this radio buttons because the radio button don't have value attribute because the radio button has check event. So right here, I'm going to paste my EJS syntax like this. And here I'm going to call the if ternary operator. So I'm going to say here user dot gender. If it is equal to male, then I'm going to return checked. Otherwise, return nothing. That's it. Let me just copy this EJS syntax, paste it here. And here I'm going to do the same. But this time, I'm going to change this value with female. I'm going to copy the statement, paste it to this status radio button as well. And this time I'm going to change this user dot status. And I'm going to change the value to active. Copy the syntax, paste it down here. Change this active to inactive. Save the changes and reload it.
Now let me click on this edit button and show you the magic. Let me click on this third user. When I click on it, as you can notice, I have all the data of the user inside these text boxes as well as you will get this checked radio buttons. That's super easy, right? When I click on this save button, I want to submit this form and update all these values. If we just open the update user.ejs, then you can notice here, I don't have any action attribute to this form. I'm not going to specify here any action attribute because I don't want to redirect the user anywhere else. So I'm going to save this file as it is, close it. I'm going to back to my index.js and here I'm going to just access my update form. So I'm going to say here dollar in the parentheses, I'm going to call hash update user. You can notice here in the update user, I have this ID update user. I'm going to access this form using this ID. So I'm going to say here update user dot submit. So when I click on the submit button of this form, I want to execute this function with event parameter. Just after that, I'm going to say here event dot prevent default. I'm going to change the default behavior of this form. As you know, the default behavior of the form is to render the browser when you click on the submit button. But this statement will stop that default behavior. Just after that, here I'm going to get all the data from the submitted form where unindexed add it. And then I'm going to call dollar in the double quote. I'm going to specify update user. Or you can pass here this. Both are identical. Just after that, I'm going to say here dot and call a method serialize array. This method is going to return a serialized array of the data. So when you click on the submit button, I'm going to get all the submitted data inside this variable. Let me show you. So down here, I'm going to say console.log and say unindexed array. Let me just save the changes back to the browser and reload it. Now, let me click on this submit button. But before I click on the submit button, let me open the inspect tool and open the console. Now, when I click on the submit button, you will have the result something like this. This will return the name ID and value of this ID variable. What I want, I want to make this ID as a key of this value. So I can pass this array to the put request and update the current user. Let me show you what I want to say. So just out of this statement right here, I'm going to call the map method. So here I'm going to call dollar $map and as a first argument, I'm going to pass my array, an index array and then call a function. Here I'm going to say n, n and i. So the first argument will return all the data from this array. And this i will return the index from this array. Inside this map, I'm going to create my new array. So up here, I'm going to say where data is equal to and then pass here object. So inside this map, I'm going to say data. I'm going to call this variable data. And in the square bracket, I'm going to say n specify square bracket in the single quote I'm going to say name then just after that I'm going to specify here equal to sign and say n in the square bracket I'm going to say value so let me just print this data on the console save the changes and reload the browser let me click on this save button as you can notice I'm going to have the result what I want then I have email and its value so now I can pass this data to the put request and update this record just after this console.log, down here, I'm going to create a variable request. You can specify any name to this variable, that doesn't matter. And here I'm going to pass an object. Inside this object, I'm going to pass value to the Ajax. I'm going to use Ajax to make a request to the server and get the response from the server. So I'm going to specify here key URL. And in the backtick operator, I'm going to pass URL. Let's copy this URL right from here and paste it inside this URL section. So here I'm going to say HTTP localhost 3000 update and I'm going to get rid of this update user and call my route which is API users. And here I'm going to say API slash users. I'm going to just make put request with ID. So I need to specify value to this ID variable when I make a request. So here I'm going to pass forward slash dollar and in the curly braces, I'm going to say data dot ID. So as you can notice here inside this data, I have this ID variable, this one. 
So I can access this ID using this ID key and I'm going to just pass this value with this URL. Just for that, I'm going to specify comma here, then specify the type of method. Method is a type of put. And then I'm going to pass a data with this request. And as you know, I have data inside this data variable. I'm going to pass this updated data just for that. Let me just make this request. So here I'm going to call dollar dot ajax using jquery ajax. I'm going to make this request and I'm going to pass here request variable. And then if we have the successful request, I'm going to just execute this done method. And this will just call this callback function with response. I'm not going to print any response here. Instead, I'm going to just say here alert with a message data updated successfully. Save the changes and reload it. And now let me update this data. So I'm going to just update this gender and the status of this user. I'm going to change it to male and I'm going to specify status inactive. When I click on the save button, I'm going to have the alert message and this form will update this current user data. When I click on the save button, as you can notice, I'm going to have here data updated successfully message. And when I reload the browser, you can notice this data is now updated. Let me change this email. I'm going to just change this email and here I'm going to say test.com. I want to update this email. So I'm going to say here test.com and click on this save button. When I click on it, I'm going to have a message data updated successfully. When I press OK, and reload the browser, you can notice the data is now updated. And when I back to my root route, here you can notice I have this updated data, test.com. Now, we know that how to create a new user, how to get all the records from the MongoDB database, and we also know how to update the user using this edit button. The last thing we need is to understand how to delete the user from the database. So next, I'm going to show you how to delete the data from the MongoDB database using this delete button. Now, let's understand how to delete a specific record from this database. So, as you notice, I have this delete button to delete a specific record. So, what I want, when I click on this button, I want to delete this specific record from this database. And I want to display a message as well that the data is successfully deleted. So, let me show you how to do it. I'm going to back to my editor and open the show.ejs file. And here I have this button. I'm going to use this button to delete this data. To this button, I'm going to pass a data attribute and get the user ID. So to this anchor tag up here, I'm going to say data ID is equal to and right here, I'm going to pass this user ID like this. So to this data ID, I have this user ID. I'm going to get this user ID when I click on this button and make a delete request and delete the specific user. So I'm going to save the changes back to the index.js and here I'm going to make a delete request. So here I'm going to create the if statement. So down here I'm going to say if window.location.pathName. If it is equal to the root path, then I'm going to execute this if statement. Because as you know, I don't have any href attribute to this anchor tag. So when I click on this anchor tag, I'm not going to navigate the user anywhere else. Let me just back to the index.js and inside this if statement, here I'm going to say dollar on delete. I'm going to create a variable dollar on delete and I'm going to just select my delete button. Here I'm going to call dollar in the parenthesis. I'm going to say dot table. I'm going to select the table, then select table body, table data element, and select anchor tag with delete class. As you can notice, I have this delete class to this anchor tag. I'm going to select it. So when I click on this button, so here I'm going to say on delete dot click. When I click on this button, I'm going to execute this function and I'm going to get the data ID of this anchor tag. So here I'm going to say var ID is equal to dollar this dot attribute. I'm going to call a method attribute and in the double quote, I'm going to say data ID. So using this statement, I'm going to get the current user ID from this 
data attribute. Now, just after that, once I have this ID, inside this ID variable, I can make a request. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just copy this request variable, paste it down here, and inside this request, I'm going to make a request to this delete route. As you know, I'm going to just call this API user and pass ID to it. So, here I'm going to say API user and pass ID. I don't have this data variable here, so I'm going to get it out of this data variable and just specify this ID variable. Just for that, this is a type of delete request. So, I'm going to get rid of this put and say here delete. And then, I'm not going to specify any data with this request, so I'm going to get rid of this data from here. Down here, I'm going to get the user permission to delete the record. So, here I'm going to say if and in the if statement, I'm going to call the confirm method. This is the inbuilt method in JavaScript. This will just get the permission from the user. Here I'm going to say confirm and in the double quote, I'm going to say, do you really want to delete this record? Then I'm going to specify here curly braces and inside this if statement, I'm going to say if the user specify yes, I'm going to execute this if statement. So here I'm going to call the Ajax request, this one. Copy this request and paste it inside this if statement. In this alert, I'm going to say data deleted successfully. And then I'm going to reload the browser. So here I'm going to say location dot reload. Back to the browser and reload it. So let me just add a new user. Here I'm going to say user1 example user at the rate test dot com specify gender male inactive. When I click on the save button, it will insert this record inside the MongoDB database. Back to the all users. And here you can notice I have this record. Let me just delete it. So I'm going to click on this delete button. When I click on it, this will just ask me, do you really want to delete this record? Yes, I want. I'm going to click on this OK button. When I click on it, you can notice I have the alert message data deleted successfully. When I press OK, as you can notice, this will delete this record from the database. At the end, let me show you how this application works. I'm going to add a new user using this new user button. I'm going to click on it and add a new user. Here I'm going to specify username, daily tuition. And inside this email, I'm going to say daily tuition at the rate gmail.com. Specify gender, male and specify status active. Let me click on the save button to save this record in the database. When I click on it, the data is now successfully inserted in the MongoDB database. Press OK and back to the all users. So here you have your data. But you can notice I misspelled this spelling of this daily tuition. Let me just update it. So I'm going to click on this update icon. And right from here, I'm going to just update this spelling. So here I'm going to say T. So now we have the daily tuition inside this text box. You can notice all the data of the record is automatically filled inside this form. Just after that, I'm going to click on the save button to update this record. When I click on it, I'm going to have alert message data updated successfully. Click on the save and back to the all users. As you can notice, the data is now successfully updated. Just after that, I want to delete this record from this table. So I'm going to click on this delete button. When I click on this delete button, the application will ask you, do you really want to delete this data? Yes, I want to delete it. So I'm going to click on this OK. When I click on this OK, you will get an alert message, data deleted successfully. And when you click OK, the data is successfully deleted from your database. Now, I hope you understand how to create crude application using Express and MongoDB database. If you find anything useful, don't forget to click on the like button of this video. Make sure you click on the subscribe button to get all the latest videos. If you want to download the source code, the link is in the description. That is all for now. I will see you in the next one.